Chapter 32 Bonadin. Over the past few weeks, Finn Olive, former first officer of the Star Hauler Trivagant, had come to the inescapable conclusion that the universe hated his guts. He suspected that for a long time, especially during his year long tenure aboard Phelan Whalox's ship, the gig on Trivagant had looked decent enough at first, well paying, and low stress, but he'd quickly grown sick of his boss. Willox paid a good wage, but in exchange, his employees had to put up with constant criticism, micromanagement, and stern orders that got reversed on a whim. And in the end, the fat idiot had gotten himself killed thinking he could outbluff an Imperial stormtrooper, which Olive might have found satisfying if not for the fact that losing his boss meant losing his job too. As it turned out, Phalox Shipping Incorporated was heavily in debt to several CSA subsidiary companies, and with its owner deceased, all assets including the ship and his cargo, went to repaying that debt. As a result, Finn Olive had found himself unemployed and derelict on Bonda's biggest spaceport town. The one advantage to this was that he had spare credits in his account and plenty of drinking establishments to waste them in. When he was on the fifth or sixth stop of his cantina crawl, he found himself sitting at the bar counter talking to a small, young, black-haired female wearing a scarlet dress that was high on the bottom, low on the top and probably didn't leave much room for respiration. He was Eddie and she was human, but that was close enough. Finn Olive was not an ugly being, but he was not a looker either, so he figured out pretty quickly what this human girl wanted from him. When he'd mentioned that he was out of work, he'd expected her to slink away and find somebody with a fatter wallet, but instead she stayed and pressed him as to how he'd ended up in this sorry state. He didn't understand that. But he'd been a long time without female company, so he kept answering her questions. Wasn't it awful, seeing your boss killed? She said, visibly wincing. Oh yes, Light Olive, absolutely terrible. You poor man. The girl put a hand on his arm. Why did they break into your ship? Were they pirates? No, not pirates. They wouldn't be interested in us anyway. We were just carrying agro droids and industrial farming supplies. Then why did they do that? He took a long gulp from his cup of surprisingly good local brew. I shouldn't say. But why not? I've, uh, got a feeling my story shouldn't get around. I know how to keep a secret. She leaned in a little closer and lowered her voice. People tell me all kinds of secrets. I'm sure they do, he smirked. If she really wanted a piece of his limited savings, he was feeling inclined to give them to her. Why do you think you should keep it quiet? Did somebody threaten you? It's just that when the Epa showed up, they didn't seem interested in asking questions. In fact, I tried to tell them what had happened, but they didn't even take notes. Of course, I guess it makes sense. But what happened? He had no idea why she was so curious, but he found he couldn't help himself. All right. I'll tell you, but you have to promise not to tell anyone else. I promise, she whispered. Okay. He put a hand on her shoulder, drawing her a little closer. Back on Corson, we picked up a couple stowaways, a man and a woman. Really? What did they look like? He blinked. A man and a woman. Human. The man had dark skin and the woman. Ah, she was pregnant. Willox, my boss, he thought they were running away from family on Corson or something, but I wasn't sure. The man. When he trailed off, she pressed. What is it? The man had two blasters on him, and in his pocket, he had this identification card with an ISB logo on it. You know, the Imperial Security Bureau. She covered her hand and gasped. The Empire? And when his friends came after us, they were stormtroopers. Stormtroopers boarded our ship. Waylox, he thought he could bluff his way past, the idiot, so they shot him. They took the woman and the man and ran for it. He grabbed his glass and emptied it. A CSA patrol corvette caught them trying to run. Shot them down. They fell right into the planet. Oh, she breathed, they're dead. Of course. I mean, I assume, I don't know. But don't you get it? They were Imperial agents, probably really important ones, and the Epi shot them down. 
Now they're trying to cover it up so the Empire doesn't get any more mad than they already are. He waved a hand at the ceiling, indicating the warships that had been sitting right over the spaceport for days, blocking all transmissions and halting all traffic. Oh, you poor man. The girl leaned in close and ran a hand through his hair. He turned his head and planted a kiss on her bare shoulder. She didn't move away. Her breath tickled his ear as she asked, what kind of ship did they have? Their ship? He'd been expecting the next question to be about something else entirely. The ones who shot you down. Um, it was Mandalorian. One of those L-shaped enforcer ships, the kind mercs and bounty hunters use. But that was probably their cover or something. Oh, I know those. Those are tough ships. You know ships. She hadn't seen the type. Where do you think it crashed? Um, we were over the Northwest Hemisphere, I think. But they chased that ship around a lot before they knocked it down. He picked his head off her shoulder. Why are you asking? It doesn't matter. Then she pulled her hand from his hair, leaned back, and hopped off her bar stool. Thank you so much, she said. I've got all I need. What do you mean? Olive frowned as she turned for the exit. Hey, wait. She waved a hand and sauntered out the door. He watched her go but she didn't even look back. When she was gone Olive heaved a very long sigh and called for another drink. Clearly, the universe really did hate his guts. At this point, Leonia Tavira was pretty much convinced that the Force, Luck, or some abstract universal deity loved her. She needed a way to guarantee that she could take over Invidious once she got aboard, and then Grand Admiral Octavian Grant had called her out of nowhere and offered a deal that would let her off Bonadin and even get her that Star Destroyer for sure. She decided quickly that being sultry or coquettish wouldn't work with Grant and had decided to act standoffish and reluctant instead. The old man probably thought he'd had to force her into it. Then he'd given her a second way to help herself, whines the Starflare. At first she doubted the odds of finding the ship she'd coming on, but Billy Bango had been able to slice into CSA security files and found the incident report from Oron 3. Those espos really had skimped on their investigation, implying it had all been some pirate raid, but they'd at least named Trivagon's late owner and former first officer. Bulabango had sliced into the port registry next and learned that Finn Olive had disembarked from a passenger liner just eight hours before Grand Admiral Makati showed up and put everyone on lockdown. Actually finding Olive in the spaceport's massive urban sprawl had been the hardest part. But between Tyrak's force powers and Tavira's own tools of persuasion, they found him and got in what they needed in the end. It was still possible that Wines' star flare had died in a horrible fireball slamming into the endless grain fields of Oron 3, but Tavira didn't believe it. Luck, the force, or the abstract universal deity wouldn't have taken her this far for nothing. So she went back to the landing pad and climbed cheerily back inside Cortison. Tyrick must have sensed her coming with his force powers, because he intercepted her when she was halfway to her cabin. Mission successful, he asked. They crash landed on Oron 3 Northwest Hemisphere. They survived. They had a tough Mandalorian ship, and I bet a good pilot behind it. They made it. Well, that's great, because we might get our chance to run. What do you mean? Come on, let's go the bridge, Tyrick turned a corner and waved her to follow. As they rode up the short lift tube to the command deck. The bridge was the busiest she'd seen a since before the lockdown. She went straight to the side display screen, where Bilibango was playing lift feed from four of the port security holo cameras. What's happening? She asked, is Makati on the move? No, but something's going on. What jabbed the claw at the top left image? Crews were moving around the DX-9 transports that had brought Makati's extra staff down. Anyone around the Grand Admiral's shuttle? She asked. Bilibango shook his small round head. Not yet. Comms are still mucked too. This is the most activity we've seen since they arrived, Tyrick said beside her. I know. What about the rebel agents? Are they moving? Not yet, said Bilibango. I think they're wait. I see them. 
The Zexto tapped at his keyboard and filled the screen with the full image from the security camera watching the YT-2000 transport they tracked the rebels to. Two dark, furry bothans slipped out of the landing deck. They must be seeing the same thing we are, said Tyrock. They might even know more if they found a way inside the CSA complex. The imps must be pulling out, what grunted. And the rebels think they can get another chance. Tavira put her hands on her hips. All right, Wuck, run pre-flight diagnostics, but don't start the engines until we're sure Makati's leaving. Rosk, Leverin, go shadow those Bothans. Bulabango, stay on those cams and track them as far as you can. And Van. Yes. Head for their ship. I want one of them captured and brought back here. Sure thing, Captain. Tirik grabbed the gun belt he'd left on a nearby console and strapped it to his hip. He gave Tavira an up-down look and added, Nice dress, by the way. Van, shut up. Just remember that these agents are probably trained to resist interrogation. That means we'll have to use alternative methods. Be ready for it. He nodded seriously, then turned and followed the others off the bridge. By the time Isert had contacted him directly, Grand Admiral Makati had well and truly given up on ever finding the supposed rebel leaders hidden anywhere on Bonadin. By then it was abundantly clear that they were somewhere else, but he still hadn't pinned it down. He'd watched as Exo Leon had personally commented Lanchenzor on Lithos, ostensibly to ask about CSA finances. They'd also gotten a security vice Prex Lick Varn to contact Malordican and ask for an update on weapons manufacturing. Makati had also tasked the ISB to look into com traffic on Gothel's homeworld of Zeheth, hoping to tell whether the Prex was or was not on the planet, though he hadn't heard anything conclusive. He knew that if he poked and prodded any more he'd stir the rebels from their hiding place and send them running. But then Isert called him on a secure line, tight beam from Coruscant to Steadfast and from Steadfast down to the CSA headquarters complex. She'd explained that, based on new intel, she now believed that the rebels were meeting with Vice Prex Lanchenzor on her estate grounds on Eddie IV, and that she'd already dispatched Grand Admiral Grant with vengeance to assist in their capture. For Makati, it felt like relief and anticipation at once. First, he told his ground troops to begin loading the DX 9 transports in a standard evac procage. Then, he ordered F 4GR to go down to the bunker and fetch his personal belongings then commanded four of his stormtroopers to seize the nearest small shuttlecraft in the main civilian docking area. They were to communicate with internal helmet comms only and give the local security personnel no warning. When they sprung into action, Exo Leon had been furious, saying that Imperial troops had no legal right to seize property on a CSA planet and that he'd file a very, very strenuous complaint with Director Isert. Makati had clarified, saying that, one, he was only borrowing it and would send it back to Bonadin on autopilot once he was done, and two, he didn't trust Leon's espos not to shoot him in the back or sabotage the shuttle he'd come down on. Makati had decided soon after the assassination, an attempt that the best way to have potential enemies learn your plans was to not have plans until they were absolutely necessary. As a result, the process of four stormtroopers commandeering an unstaffed Trianii RX-4 light patrol ship had taken all of ten standard minutes. It took another five for two more troopers to drive Makati, an F-4GR and a shielded land speeder to the port complex and escort them into the belly of the Trianii ship. Five minutes after that, with two stormtroopers at the helm, they lifted off and soared skyward. The other stormtroopers would retrieve the Grand Admiral's personal shuttle, and the two DX-9 transports on their way out, but Makati had no problem waiting. He was glad to leave Bonadin behind, when he saw Steadfast Pale, which grow ahead of them. It felt like a homecoming. When he arrived on his safe, familiar decks of his star destroyer, Captain Vivon was there to meet him in the landing bay. As they made their way to the bridge, with two guards and F-4GR shuffling along, Vivon gave Makati a thorough update on the ship's status. As the road the lift up to the bridge tower, Vivant lowered his voice and said, there was also a signal like the kind you you mentioned. Before going down to Bonadin, Makati had warned Vivant that they might be receiving a heavily encrypted transmission from an unidentifiable source. 
When did it come through? Just an hour ago, actually. I couldn't transfer it down to the planet. And when I tried to calm you, they said you were occupied. It's all right, Captain. I'll go straight to my personal cabin and return the call. Very good, sir. I'll make sure your comm system is prepped. Thank you. When the lift doors opened, Vivant went straight for the bridge. Makati walked for his cabin. Beside him, F4GR said, I have to admit, sir, I'm quite glad to be off that world. So am I, Forger. I see. So you did not enjoy your return to Bonadin. Why would I? I see your point, sir. It's just that I've been told organics often feel a sense of nostalgia when visiting places where they've spent many days. What do you know about nostalgia, Forger? His mind was on the call waiting for him, but he found himself curious. Nothing firsthand, sir. At least, I don't think so, though I do sometimes access memory files created on Cartel when you were young. As they reached the door, Makati stopped and looked at his droid. And, do they feel different from yesterday's memory files? I'm not sure what you mean, sir. Memory files are memory files. My cortical systems suffer no degradation, so the files from Kartal are just as detailed as the ones from yesterday. Makati gave no reply. Unsettled, he opened the door and went through. F4GR followed him into the cabin while his guards waited outside. He wondered what it would be like to remember his childhood as vividly as F4GR did. He'd be able to recreate in his mind his family, or Kartal before the Clone Wars ravaged them both. The thought made him shudder. No, he didn't envy the droid. Not a bit. He didn't want his life to be more ghost-haunted than it already was. He shoved all that aside and went over to his comm system. As Vivant had promised, it was ready to return the call. He sent a signal and waited less than a minute before a holo image sprung up in front of him. Grand Admiral Thrawn, Makati nodded. I apologize for the delay. I returned your message as soon as I could. There's no need to apologize. I know you were busy with important tasks on Bonadin. I was wasting my time. I've just been contacted by Isert. It seems the rebels have been on Eddie IV all the while. I just hope I'm not too late to catch them. I see. Then you should be advised, Admiral, that they're not alone. According to my sources, the rebels have amassed a battle group at Kermia. It seems to consist of one Star Destroyer and three Mon Cal cruisers, plus support vessels. Cormia was a short jump from the corporate sector via a transit route that led easily to Eddie. Bitterly, he said, they're still laying traps. It appears so. Thank you, Admiral. I'll take that under advisement. Do you intend to spring that trap? I have no choice. If I don't, the rebels will escape. Grant is coming with reinforcements. I only need to hold over any IV and prevent them from escaping until he arrives. Thrones bright eyes stared at him, alien and incomprehensible through the holo. Makati added, I fought off their tricks before. I can't do it again. He didn't know if he believed it, but he had to tell it to himself. Thrawn didn't see like he believed it either. He said, I do not doubt your combat skill, Admiral, but you seem to be heavily outnumbered. I will hold any IV and wait for Grant to come. Then we can capture their leaders and destroy their fleet. I only have to hold. Thrawn stared for another long moment, then said, There are more wars to be fought than just this one. I'll be returning to what you call the Unknown Region shortly. I have allies there beings I can trust, and together we are forging order and stability from chaos and war. Makati didn't believe what he was hearing. Admiral Thrawn, are you offering me a job? Many good servants of the Empire have joined me already. As I said, there are more wars to fight than this one. It sounded preposterous, running off with an alien warlord he barely knew to fight with a bunch other aliens and Imperial renegades against unfathomable threats in uncharted space. Then he thought again, and laying down a siege while holding off a whole rebel fleet with just two star destroyers seemed just as absurd. Of the two, it sounded even more likely to get him killed. But running was running, and he'd never done that in his life. I'm sorry, but I already have my fight against the rebels and the warlords. I can't abandon the empire to them. The center must be held. 
Thrawn's alien face betrayed nothing. Very well. Perhaps we'll speak again on the subject later. Perhaps. But for now, I must go to Eddie IV, Makati said, then added. Thank you for the warning. And the offer. Goodbye, Admiral. Goodbye. Then the holo shut off. Makati drew a deep breath, then turned to face F4GR's motionless metal face. We are committed, he said. When that Trianiad patrol ship had roared off from the landing pad and soared skyward, Rhea and Darylin had instantly known that they failed. They spent days gathering snippets of conversation passing through the CSA headquarters complex and planning ways to sneak back to the Grand Admiral's landing pad and make sure they nailed him before he got into his shuttle, all the time overlooking the obvious fact that Grand Admiral could have gotten off bonded in any way he damn well wanted. Disappointment was fierce, but Darylin shoved it back down where it belonged. It just meant they had to fall back on Plan B. As Carr and Ekerheen threw on their stormtrooper armor, cask, and Darylin dashed out of the ship and began retracing the route they'd taken into the executive wing of the landing complex days earlier. Devon Tor, still in civilian garb, followed behind them, just far enough away to avoid attracting attention. Given the lockdown the port had been in for days, there wasn't much foot traffic, any by staying in underused corridors they avoided notice entirely. Because of the low crowds and limited time, they decided to skip the waste extraction tunnels and utilize a service stairway leading up to the walkways that connected the main civilian landing complex to the executive wing. Darylin had already sliced through those controls once and got through it faster a second time. Tor waved them ahead, then slipped back into the main complex. Cask and Darylin hurried across the catwalks and into the executive complex, this time taking an only slightly different route to get to the pads where the DX-9 stormy transports were being loaded. They scrambled through the shadowed overhead catwalks and quickly scoped the scene. It looked like most of the Stormies had yet to arrive. Darylin turned on his comlink and said, We're in position. Report. I'm in place too, said Tor. Jack. Show death. Coming your way, the Emily I grunted. Suited up. Asked Darylin. Dressed up for the dance, Carr said. You see an opening? If we get a distraction. Tor, any more Stormies heading your way? Not yet but it can't be long. Okay. Then we hold tight and wait for them to move. Darylin shut off the comlink and looked at Cask. Get ready? The other Bothan nodded and looked over the edge of the catwalk. It would be a good jump down to the landing deck, but Bothans were agile and could manage heights. Darylin just hoped Tor's distraction would be enough to get two Bothans and two guys in white armor onto those transports. Carr and Ekrahim could disable two Stormies and take their place easily enough, two Bothan stowaways would be a lot tricker. Darylin and Cask both knew the awful risk they were taking, the strong likelihood that the ship up to Steadfast was a one-way ride. Darylin never claimed he wasn't afraid of dying. Right now, though, pure adrenaline wiped out any existential angst. Deep down, he needed to get aboard that ship, just as he needed to take Grand Admiral Makati down. After all he'd done to get this far, he couldn't walk away. His comlink buzzed, and Tor said, Incoming Stormies. Full dozen, coming through the main promenade. We'll take the back too, said Ekrahim. Darylin took a deep breath and waited, paws wrapped around the edge of the catwalk, ready to swing down. He exhaled, inhaled again, then the explosion went off. Rather than the sharp taint of exploding bomb or grenade that sounded like an awful metal tearing, followed by the howl of ejected gas, which was exactly what it was. Tor had placed a small charge right onto a fuel conduit running along the ceiling over the promenade. Right now, all those stormies were getting doused with potentially explosive fusel thrust vapor. The landing facility had droids and automated safety systems to deal with such emergencies. But the noise was enough to bring every able-bodied stormtrooper running out toward the sound of the explosion. Darylin and Cask dropped down behind the closest DX-9, landing on the pads of their feet. Back slow, the two Bothans kept in the shadows as they raced up to the rear cargo loading hatch. Cask drew out two of his poison-tipped throwing needles and stuck his head in the hatch, 
but it was empty except for a few metal lockers, each one meter long by two wide. It seemed they had some luck after all. As they crawled between those crates and the bulkhead, thoroughly concealing themselves from view, Daryl turned on his comlink and whispered, We're in. Report. Just got splashed with anti-combustant by a cleanup droid, said Carr. This stuff smells awful. At least you'll fit in with the others. Show death. Ready to, boss? Swapped out helmets so we're on the same com freak as the rest of the squad. With all that gas blowing around, nobody noticed the exchange. What about the originals? I took care of the bodies. Tor spoke up. Good job. Find a place to hide until we're all in the air, Devin. Then get back to the freighter. Tell Drayson to jump to Eddie IV right away, and warn Philia too. You sure that's where they're going? No point in taking chances. Not anymore. Daryl and heard heavy footsteps on the landing pad. The Stormies, after a slight but messy delay, were getting on their transports. Carr asked, which boat are you on, boss? Furthest from the entrance, after cargo hold. Great. We're on the same one. Hold tight where you are. That was the plan. Daryl and heard heavy boots walk around to the rear of the transport. He didn't dark stick his head out to look but he knew some stormy must have been given the aft cargo hold one last look over. He didn't breathe, didn't do anything until the door slammed shut, sealing him and cask in utter darkness. We're locked and tight, he said into his comm. In the main cabin now, Carr reported. Everything's go. Sorry I'll have to miss the dance, said Tor, as jauntily as he could. He knew as well as they did how bad the odds were that they'd ever see each other again. Just let Drayson and Philia know, Daryl said. Will do, boss. His voice went serious. Good luck up there. His comlink clicked off. The shuttle began to whine and rattle around them as his engines warmed up. Daryl and her cast shift in the darkness. I just wish we could have smuggled some guns aboard, the other Bothan muttered. Daryl smacked the crate in front of him. I'm not. If we can't get some now, there's plenty more waiting for us on Steadfast. More guns that we could ever need. I don't mean guns pointed at me. Well, now you're being picky. After a moment of hesitation, Devin Tor decided to leave the bodies of the two Stormies in the maintenance closet he'd helped Ekrahin stuff them into. It wouldn't be too long before somebody discovered them, but he fully intended to lift off the moment Steadfast jumped out of the system. Granted, a lot of other ships in the port probably had the same idea, but that just meant the staff would be too busy to check maintenance classes for a while. As he hurried back to the YT-2000 as fast as he could without full-on running, Tor's only regret about it was that he'd forgotten to raid the Stormy's kits for useful material. Granted, they'd been in a rush, and the weapons detectors in the port complex would have started screaming if he tried to nab a gun. But Tor had been an Imperial once, and he knew stormtroopers carry tools and gadgets for just about any occasion. It was a minor regret, though. A part of him also wished he was going with the rest of his team to Steadfast. He knew somebody had to stay behind and warn Drayson, but that gnawing part of him felt like a coward for not going with him. They all knew that going up to Steadfast probably probably meant they'd never coming back, but nobody had complained. Nobody had even mentioned it. As they trotted back to the land and pad with their freighter, Devon Tor discovered he was humbled to have worked with all those brave beings. He didn't know how he was going to live with it. He had to fire up the comm and warn Drayson first. He'd run halfway up the landing ramp when he realized he shouldn't have been on the landing ramp at all. Ekrahin and Kar should have closed the landing ramp when they left the ship unmanned. Maybe they'd forgotten because they were in a such a rush but people in their line of work didn't last long for getting to locked doors. Tor didn't have any blaster on him, but at least he had a knife, and Cask had taught him some pretty good throwing tricks. That wouldn't stop a pistol, but it was all he had. He drew his knife from his hip sheath and carefully held it by the swelled tip of his pommel. He took another slow, careful, silent step up the landing ramp, then another. He peeked his head inside and looked to his right, then his left. The freighter's main corridor curved in either direction, empty. Then he heard footsteps behind him and spun around. 
A man was standing at the base of the ramp, a horizontal scar beneath what I gave him a fierce look. Tar raised one hand to throw the knife, and a stun blast caught him in the side. The knife fell harmlessly from his numbing fingers and clattered down the landing pad. Gracelessly, helplessly, he pitched forward and tumbled after it. Chapter 33 84 Leia Organa's sense of disquiet had been slowly growing ever since the sudden departure of Philia's aid. Philia had explained to the CSA representatives that Darylin had had to return to Bothan space after less than two days at the conference because of a family emergency. He'd repeated the same to Leia in private, but Winter had confirmed Darylin had been an intelligence operative for Admiral Drayson. Winter said she didn't know why Darylin had left or where he'd gone, and Leia chose to accept that. Still, nothing had unusual happened the first day after his disappearance, nor the second, nor the third. Better still, the negotiations were going better than Leia had hoped. Vice Prex Dreit's initial shows of skepticism had gradually eroded and he'd started to suggest potential reforms for the security division, once they got Vice Prex Lick Varn replaced with someone more pliable. Vice Prex Malordican seemed enticed by the idea of contracts and collaboration with New Republic industrial engineers who would be much more innovative than the state-old ones working for the Empire. Prex Gothel had even agreed to chart a draft reform of the CSA's territorial management system that would make planetary governments more accountable to a century authority, while at the same time increasing local say in central government. Still, despite all the good progress, she'd never been able to shake her unease. The conference at Eddie IV had been planned according to a specific schedule that would allow the CSA representatives to return to Bonanin with Exo Leon and Imp Advisor Malak none the wiser. And while the deadline had added focus to the negotiations, it also meant that we're running out of their allotted time and had a lot of plans left to either finalize or set aside for another conference at a yet-to-be-determined time. Everyone wanted to finish as much business while the momentum was strong, and that meant the conference's last day was jam-packed with important decisions to be made. When she woke up that final morning in her still so luxurious room, Leia knew her thoughts should still have been swarming with final questions to ask, offers to propose, and deals she might have to accept. She went down to the dining hall to discuss them with Philia, but even as they started talking she couldn't stop thinking about Rhea and Darylin. Abruptly, she stopped Philia in mid-sentence and said, I'm sorry, Borsk, can I ask an unrelated question? Philia's right ear twitched in irritation. If you insist. When your aide left two days into the conference, what exactly was his explanation? His father had come down sick with nalragic fever. It's a very nasty disease. We've been able to stamp it out on Batho, but Dayrelin comes from a colony world, and the health conditions on them can be less than optimal. I see. Did you speak with his family to confirm this? The fur on his face bristles slightly. Is there a reason you're asking this, princess? I've been curious. He left so abruptly, and I was surprised someone new to the diplomatic corps was appointed to such an important mission. Philia sat back and just looked at her, like he was deciding how much to say. Before he could open his mouth, though, they heard a knock on the door and both turned to see Winter walk into the dining room. Her white hair spilled unbraided over her shoulders and she wore a plain gray tunic instead of the formal gown she'd previously used for the talks. That was Leia's first sign something was wrong. Leia shifted to face her. Winter, what is it? We just received a message from Admiral Burke with the Third Fleet. What did he say? Asked Philia. He said that he's been monitoring ship movements in the corporate sector, and apparently to Imperial Star Destroyers and an interdictor just left Bonadin. Bonadin. Philia rose to his feet. Why were they at Bonadin in the first place? Winter clasped her hands tightly in front of her the only sign of nervousness. Sir, according to Admiral Burke, those ships belong to Grand Admiral Makati. Makati. Now it was Leia's turn to jump up. Where did he go? Burke doesn't know. But he warns they might be coming to any IV. Might be, Philia echoed bitterly. If we scrap these negotiations now we'll lose everything. We're so close. If Makati's on his way we need to run, Leia insisted. And if he's not, then we've thrown away everything for nothing. 
Philae hissed and looked at Winter. Is Burke still at Cormia? That's right. He wanted to know your response before bringing in his forces. If he brings a whole fleet to Eddie IV, the CSA will declare it a violation of their territory. They might even send a fleet of their own to respond. That will kill the negotiations too. Leia began, if Makati is coming for us. Then Burke will probably be too late anyway, Philae waved to Paul. Our only options are to stay and finish these talks or run and throw away everything on the chance Makati knows we're here. Leia had no answer, neither did Philae. Both stood in angry indecision while Winter watched the counselors impassively, waiting for someone to make the call. Finally, Leia said, we can tell Burke to move his ships over the border and sit outside the Eddy system. He has more than enough ships to take Makati's three, assuming Makati even comes here. And if the Grand Admiral decides to blast this estate from orbit the second he leaves hyperspace, asked Philia. Maybe we can truncate the negotiations. The schedule is too packed already. Then we cut something and be ready to leave the second talks are over. Philia's for bristled. You want to find a middle ground, a compromise. I am a diplomat, Leia said with a nervous laugh. She wasn't even sure she'd been joking. The Bothan gave a feral growl and flexed his retractable claws in the air. Don't the Corellians have some saying? You can't own your nerf and eat it too. Rishkit, Leia correct. She'd heard Han say it often enough. It's a kind of cape. In my experience, they're right. Then what do you want, Borsk? Stay and risk it. I'll run and give up everything. She really wanted to know. She had no answer herself. Philia growled again, then fixed his piercing violet eyes on hers. Let's see if we can shrink that schedule and tell Burke to cross the border and attract as little attention as possible. Then we'll pray the Corellians are as foolish as I always thought they were. Cortisan was currently plunging through hyperspace en route to his promised rendezvous with Teradox Star Destroyer Invidious on the edge of the corporate sector, but in his forward cargo hold you could only tell it from the faintest vibration in his deck in the distant, home of his power generator. Despite the Marauder Corvette's age and checkered history, Tavira's crew kept it in prime condition, far better than most of the CSA picket ships which it frequently imitated. Still, their captive must have been attuned to hyperspace travel, because as he sat bound in his chair he asked, where are we going? Nothing that concerns you, Tavira said honestly. She didn't intend for him to be alive when they met Invidious. His captors had given him a minor thrashing after taking him prisoner, and a few dark bruises were still swelling on his face, but the captive's eyes were alert as he scanned the other beings in the room with him. Rosk and Leverin stood on either side of the door, while Tavira and Van Tarek stood two meters dead ahead of him. What is your name? Asked Tavira. Darth Vader. Be serious. Afshimakati. Tavira took two steps closer. You think you're being clever? I guess that's expected for a rebel agent. He flinched, just a little, then looked at Tyrock. You've got an interesting crew here. A Trandishan, a Yaka, and a Tart. This is my ship, Tavira said. Really? He looked her over. Nice dress. She slapped him hard. He winced and licked blood from his lip. Okay. Nice arm strength, too. You were shadowing Makati. What happened to the rest of your team? Who are you, anyway? You're not imps. Pirates. Mercs. Bounty hunters. What can you tell me about Eddie IV? Eddie what? He asked, after a tiny second's hesitation. She knew she had him. She looked over her shirt and gave Tarek a sweet smile. Van, I think we require your talents. Gladly. The scarred man walked over to the prisoner and knelt at the side. He reached out and placed the tips of two fingers on the man's forehead just below a bruise. The prisoner winced and said, What is this, some weird kind of torture? Poke the bruise until it bleeds. I was expecting you to start chopping off fingers. We know rebel agents are trained to resist torture, said Tavira. However, I'm sure you weren't trained for this. Let's start at the beginning. Your name? Grand Moff Tarkin. Tarek tapped his forehead again and closed his eyes. The prisoner's eyes fluttered 
as though trying to blink away unwelcome thoughts. Tavira asked once more, your name. His mouth opened slowly, and his lips trembled. Stuttering, he said, Devantor. I still closed in concentration, Tarek nodded. What happened to the other members of your team? Two Bothans and two dressed as stormtroopers. His lips squeezed shut, like he was trying to keep words from pouring out. Tavira leaned a little closer. Did they get aboard those shuttles? Are they on Makati's ship right now? His lips didn't move, but his head bobbed up and down in an affirmative nod. I thought as much. Now tell me about Eddie IV. You know about the Rebel Conference there, don't you? He nodded again, though his whole neck strained and his face went red, as though he was trying to keep his body from betraying him. You set a trap for Makati. You tried to lure him to Bonadin with false intel. We know your Bothans tried to kill him when he arrived. But you failed. Now Makati is on his way to Eddie IV, and he'll capture the rebel leaders. Tyrak's eyes were still closed, but he muttered, there's more. Is there now? What else is at Eddie IV? She reached out and cupped Tor's trembling chin in her hand. More rebel assassins. No, Tyrak muttered. Something else? What else? A fleet, maybe. Is there a fleet waiting for Makati at Eddie IV? Tor's shaken lips opened again. He rasped. Go, Kark, yourself. Tavira slapped him hard again, knocking Tyrak's hand away. Tor's eyes popped open and he gasped for breath. Blood trickled unnoticed down the broken bruise on his cheek. How, how did you that? As you indicated before, Tavira said, I have a diverse crew with special talents. Tor turned his fluttering gaze on Tyrak. You, Jedi. Not quite. I was raised by a group called the Gensere. Never heard of them. They began as a small splinter sect. The Empire pressed them, like usual. But I got away. You don't. Seem, jetty like Tarek shrugged. I'm not much of a Gensere anymore either. Then found a much more profitable use for his skills here in the corporate sector, Tavira said. I'll bet. Tor shook with laugh that turned into a hacking cough. He's still hiding things said Tyrock. I'm sure he has plenty of secrets in there. If only we had time to plunder them all. Tavira crossed her arms under her breasts. Is there anything recent, anything else we might be able to give Grant? I sense something about the fleet. Tyrick closed his eyes and tapped the prisoner on the fort again. Go kark yourself, Ta repeated. This time Tavira ignored it. She crouched low, putting herself on eye level with the prisoner. Can you tell how many ships are with the fleet? Tor's lips sealed tight again, but Tyrick muttered, Looks pretty big, I sense, a Star Destroyer. Makati has two of those, and Grant Moore on the way. Tavira said thoughtfully, Is it somebody with the fleet? Tor made a growling sound seed in his throat. Tyrick nodded just a little, urging her on. She asked, Who is leading this fleet? Who is the Admiral? Tor's stuttering lip said, Burke, Admiral Burke. The third fleet, Tavira thought, mildly disappointed. She'd been hoping for Admiral Akbar himself. Who else? Tor's incisors sunk into his lower lip in an attempt to keep more words from being churned out. More blood ran down to his chin, but it wasn't enough. Stuttering, he said, Drayson, and Rogues. Rogue Squadron. Tavira scowled. You mean Antilles, Fell, all of them. They're all with the fleet. Tor tried to bite down on both lips to keep from talking, but Tyrick shook his head and whispered, not all of them. Then who? Is Baron Fell with him? Will Baron Fell be at Eddie IV? The prisoner's head shook in another affirmative nod. And Wedge Antilles, is he there too? The prisoner nodded again. Tavira remembered the battered face of the man who'd been her prisoner on Axilla, the one who'd escaped and called down the rest of his rogues and wrecked Cavill's Corsairs so badly she'd barely made it out in one piece. What about Tycho Selchu? Is he with them? Tor trembled but didn't speak. Tarek shook his head, a negative. Tavira felt honest disappointment. The thought of Grant and Makati wiping out the troublesome rogues for her at Eddie IV was so enticing she felt tempted to go there and herself, and watch it firsthand. What a great shame. 
What happened to Selchu? Please tell me he'd already dead. Tyrak's brows pressed together in concentration as he tried to draw one last bit of information out of Tor. His lips parted, bearing angry blood-streaked teeth. They chattered as he said, C.C. Karuskin. What? Tavera's eyes went wide. Selchu is on Imperial Center. Right now. SS spy, ship, tie, fighter. Suddenly he started choking. His eyes popped open and his head jerked back. Tyrik withdrew his hand, but it was too late. Tor's body jerked once, twice, then went still. His mouth hung open and his lifeless eyes stared up at the ceiling. I pressed too far. Tyrik shook his head. I'm sorry. No. No, Van, you gave me just what I needed. Tavira felt a wide, vicious smile on her face. If you'll excuse me, I have a call to make. When she left the cargo hold, she ran to her cabin as fast as her dress would let her. When she got there, she turned on the communications console and patched in the direct line to Grand Admiral Grant. She hesitated for a moment, then grabbed her old moth's uniform from his hook on the wall and threw it on. Maybe he'd be a little less sneering if she had it on. She made the call, but had to wait nearly two full minutes before the old man answered. Grant's head and epaulette top shoulders appeared in front of her. Well, the Grand Admiral sniffed, if you're calling me, I guess it means you're off Bonadin. My ship is currently en route to meet the Star Destroyer Invidious, my little gift from High Admiral Teradoc. And you're going to make sure I get what he promised me. Have you found Wines Starflare? I have. Tell me where she is. Not until I have Invidious. I'm not giving you something for nothing, girl. She decided to try an innocent smile. Admiral, I just want to make sure I can trust you, especially when there's so much else I think we can share. Grant's brows drew together. Such as, I may not have any official standing in the Empire, and more, Admiral, but that doesn't mean I want to see the Rebels win on any IV. Makati and I are both on the way there now. You have nothing to worry about. I hope so. I just wanted to make sure you knew there was a rebel fleet waiting for you. His eyes widened. How did you learn this? We captured a rebel agent stalking Makati on Bonadin. We may even have saved the Grand Admiral's life, but you don't need to thank me. An agent. Do you have him now? Unfortunately, no. She sighed regretfully. You know interrogations can be rough. He did give up some valuable information before he died. So it seems. But that's not all, Admiral. He knew that Rogue Squadron will also be there, including Baron Fell. Hmm. Grant frowned. If he dies before we recover his wife, then our little bargain will be null. I agree, though I'm sure Fell wouldn't be easy to kill. Still, I thought you should be aware. I appreciate your information, Grant said thoughtfully. There's something else I learned from. It seems another rogue squadron flyer, Tycho Selchu, is currently on a spy mission on Imperial Center. You're sure of this? Yes. He's apparently flying a captured TIE fighter. She'd normally have been loath to give Icer a free tip, but for Selchu she made an exception. Tavira firmly believed that people who down-talked revenge clearly hadn't done it right. Grant snorted again. You must be very good at interrogations if you got all that out of him. One of my lieutenants is uniquely skilled. I hope all of this shows my good faith. It had better, she told him everything except the part about those rebel assassins on Makati's ship. She'd been tempted to tell him that too, since she had no ill will for the Grand Admiral, but Grant had let slip that he'd be joining Makati on Eddie IV, at least for a start. If Makati were killed, command of the fight would fall on Grant making it harder for him to extricate himself. Tavira still hoped to get to Oron 3 and snatch Wines the Starflare out from under him. She could only imagine what prizes a second auction would get her. Grant looked away, thinking, I suppose we can reach some? Compromise? I'm open to one. She hoped it would be enough. They were due to meet up with Invidious in under an hour. All right, girl. I don't suppose you know whether your new ship is Imperial I or Imperial to class. Tavira opened her mouth, then found herself without reply or rebuttal. She smiled to cover her embarrassment. I'm afraid not. Such a pity. 
Still, I can give you basic advice. Before you lock the captain and crew out of the ship's main computer cores, you'll need to have your own people at key locations in order to make sure they can't manually override weapons, drive, or navigation systems. Can your people do that? They're quite capable. Good. First you're going to need a crash course in Star Destroyer design. Are you ready to listen carefully, girl? She nodded attentively like a student at an lecture hall. Go ahead, sir. Octavian Grant's long outbound ride from Imperial Center to the corporate sector had proven more interesting than expected. After meeting up with Captain Sisko's vengeance, Grant had quickly transferred his flag to the Super Star Destroyer, and, together with Captain Bremel on Oriflam and Captain Trigid on Implacable, continued cutting through Warlord Singe's territory toward their target. He'd hoped Tavira would come him after Makati left Bonadin with Starflare's location in hand, but he'd expected attempts to barter favors instead of a straight answer. He certainly hadn't expected this news of rebel fleets at Eddie IV and rebel agents spying on Imperial Center. He'd gone straight to Isard with the news, once again withholding the source. The director seemed quite pleased and promised she'd ferret out the Rouge Squadron spy in the capital at once. After that he had to make a trickier call to Grand Admiral Makati. As he stood in a Spartan private chamber that must have belonged to the late and unlamented Jarek, Grant summoned an encrypted connection with Makati steadfast and brought up a hollow image so both Grand Admirals could speak face to face. Thank you for contacting me, Makati said. I'm inbound to Eddie IV now. Director Isard informed me you are too. With vengeance, yes, Grant nodded. You should reach the planet first. I thought so. You should know that the rebels have laid a trap. They've arranged a fleet to meet you at Eddie IV. I already know, he said, which took Grant by surprise. He'd only waited a few minutes after calling Icer to contact Makati, and it was possible she passed on that information to him that fast, but not probable. It made Grant wonder what Grand Admiral Thrawn was up to. Given the size of my task force, Makati was saying, I intend to lower my destroyers into the atmosphere and launch an attack on Vice Prex Lanchenzor's estate. Tenacious and Constrainer will remain in outer orbit and hopefully be able to pull the Rebel fleet out of hyperspace far enough away from the planet to give me time to capture Philia and Organa. That told Grant two more surprising things. One, Makati had to know which direction the Rebels would be coming from to pull them out of hyperspace away from the planet. Since neither Grant nor Icer knew, that almost surely meant he was still getting secret help from Thrawn. Two, he was willing to sacrifice both Tenacious and Constrainer to complete his mission. Makati was not a man who threw away his men's lives for no reason. Admiral, Grant asked, do you have an estimated time for your arrival on Eddie IV? Approximately six hours. At our rate, we'll be there in ten. If you can hold out for four, I can make an end of it with vengeance. Makati nodded grimly. I'll let the crews know relief is coming. Thank you for telling me. It sounded like he wasn't expecting any relief from Thrawn. Grant pondered pressing about the third Grand Admiral's whereabouts but decided against it, showing his own ignorance would gain him nothing. Is there anything else? Asked Makati. Not for the moment. I look forward to seeing you at Eddie IV. Likewise. Goodbye, Admiral Grant. The holo shut off leaving Grant alone in the quiet darkness of Jarek's old chambers. Once he'd found pleasure in claiming dead enemies' homes, but now it felt ghoulish. He didn't like superstar destroyers in general, and he didn't like this one in particular. He considered not going to Eddie IV at all, and instead taking vengeance off to wherever Starflare was, just to make sure Tavira or Thrawn didn't scoop her up instead. Then came the news about the rebel fleet waiting to spring his ambush. Enough of Grant still believed in what the Empire supposedly stood for to win at the thought of abandoning a loyal Grand Admiral to a larger rebel fleet, but he wasn't ready to give up Starflare either, not to a teenage trollop and certainly not to an alien interloper. Once he arrived at Eddie IV he planned to transfer his flag back to Oriflam and trust Captain Sisko to ride to Makati's rescue. With vengeance, he should have an easy time of it. So Grant hoped, anyway. On Corellia they had a saying about how you couldn't have your slice of rishkate and eat it too. Grant had never been sure if it was true, but
But since he couldn't bring himself to chose one over the other right now, it looked like he was going to find out. The procession that stepped off Courtesan and into NVIDIA's main hangar bay was surely the most motley assemblage that had ever set foot on that Star Destroyer. First came Rosk and Leverin, hulking muscle aliens, with jagged knives strapped to their belts and T-21 heavy assault rifles slung casually off their shoulders. Then there was Van Tyrock, looking almost swashbuckling with a rakish scar on his face and a long blade vibra knife and DL-44 blaster pistol on either hip. Then, for good measure, came four battered old Nemoidian battle droids from the Clone Wars, rifles formerly held against their metal chests. And finally, with a rifle toting Nikto Guard on either shoulder, was Leonia Tavira. She was more than a head shorter than anyone else in the line, but she thought she made up for it with the imperious old moth's jacket she'd thrown over her short red dress and the blaster holstered at either hip. The expression on the face of the lieutenant in charge of the greeting party was priceless. As her guards fanned out on the deck, Tavira stepped right up to him he couldn't have been five years older than her and said hello. We'd like to speak to your captain. The lieutenant licked his lips nervously. Captain Morox is on the bridge. Then please, take me to him. Ah, miss, ah. Call me Captain Tavira. Yes, Captain. Ah, uh, Captain Morox instructed me to make sure your personnel were disarmed before coming board, Captain. And why would he do that? Tavira put on an innocent, confused look. We're supposed to be partners, aren't we? That's what Truton promised. Truton? Ah, uh, High Admiral Teradoc. I'm afraid I'm not privy to your dealings with the High Admiral, Captain. Well, he promised a partnership. She crossed her arms and pouted. If Captain Morux isn't going to comply, or if Truton ordered him to go back on his deal, then we'll take our information right to Grand Admiral Singe. The Lieutenant Grimace. Whoever had thought they could send this boy down to handle her had been sorely mistaken. I'm sure there will be no problem at all if my people come aboard, Lieutenant, Tavira said, and glanced sideways at Tyrock. He said that, even without touching, he could still give subtle suggestive nudges with the force. The lieutenant said, you're right. I'm sure I misheard. My apologies, Captain. I'll escort your party to the bridge. Thank you for being accommodating, Tavira smiled sweetly and signaled for her people to start moving. As the lieutenant moved them down the Star Destroyer's halls, Tavira let Tarek go ahead and began engaging the young man in conversation. She dropped in between two rows of battle droids, far enough away from her stormtrooper escorts that they didn't notice when she subtly brushed one cheek and tapped the audio transmitter in her right ear that was veiled from sight by the black hair framing her face. So softly only the droid guards could hear, she whispered, Willabango, report. I've made a connection between Cortisan's primary cortex and their landing base computer, the Zexto Slicer's tinny voice replied. From here I should be able to access the rest of their systems. Make sure they don't catch you. Don't worry, Captain. I'm the best. Billy Bingo sounded eager for the challenge. Good. Keep working. She tapped off the earpiece with another casual motion as the lieutenant led them into a large lift carriage that shot them toward the destroyer's stern and finally took them up to the command torque. When the blast door slid open, Every last crewman turned to stare at Tavira and her entourage. One broad middle-aged man with captain's bars started stuttering objections, as well-armed Nictus and a hulking transition swaggered onto his bridge, but Tavira barely noticed. Her eyes swept over the entire scene, the broad command deck, the twin pits packed with uniformed officers, and the broad aisle down the middle, leading straight toward the transparent steel viewports that looked out on a panorama of twinkling stars. All her life, Leonia Tavira wanted to stand on the bridge of an Imperial Star Destroyer. She dreamed of it, imagined it in vivid detail, lusted for it in a way most beings reserved for beautiful mates. Ignoring everything else, she walked down the bridge's center aisle until she could see the glorious Malone stretch of off-white Durasteel and bristling gunports that was invidious. For the first time in years, the expression of childlike joy on her face was totally honest. A sharp voice pierced the haze, insisting, this is outrageous, absolutely outrageous.
Tavira took a deep breath and turned around. The captain was glowering at Rosk and saying, this is the bridge of an Imperial Star Destroyer. We do not allow subhuman trash to parade around with weapons, and If you have complaints, you may direct them to me, Tavira said. The man spun on her. I am Captain Hollis Morux, and this is my vessel. I cannot allow your Yerzu to parade around with. I heard you the first time, Captain, Tavira said. I came to an agreement with Truton. This ship was to be my payment for giving you Borsk Philia and Leo Organa. Has Truton decided to renege on that deal without telling me? Not to my knowledge, Morox grumbled. He winced every time she used Teradoc's first name. Until Truton does, you need me and my crew. Now please, plot a course for Oron 3. Oron 3. Are the rebels hiding there? Of course. Why else would we go there? Oron 3 is an agro world run by droids. There are barely any sentience on it. What better place to hold a secret meeting? Morix's face colored red and twisted in interesting shapes as he tried and failed to come up with the rebuttal. Finally, he turned and called, Helm, plot a course to Oron 3. Jump when ready, maximum speed. As the helmsman gave an affirmative, Morix looked back at Tavira. I suppose you know exactly where on the planet they'll be hiding. Naturally. I'll tell you when you need to know. Until then, I hope my men can make themselves comfortable on your ship. Morris passed a baleful look around the bridge, pausing to scowl at each of Tavira's crew individually, even the old droids. None of them seemed impressed. Finally, he said, very well. But they'll be accompanied by guards at all times. Fair enough. Now, I've never been on the bridge of an Imperial Star Destroyer, Captain. She gave Morox a wide-eyed look and said in an innocent voice, I'm sure I won't understand half of it, but while we're on the way to Oren 3, can you please give me a tour? Leia and Philia were experienced diplomats with plenty of experience keeping their sabbat faces during tricky negotiations. The CSA representatives weren't fools either, and halfway through the hastily reorganized final talks, Lankerdrite finally decided to ask, counselors, is there something you want to tell us? It took Leia and Philia back. Maka Philanthus covered for them, responding, We've already apologized for the truncated schedule. However, as we've explained, situations have changed and the counselors have other matters to attend to a forward. You've shrunk in the negations by five hours, Lanchens or said. She'd also been chafing at the hurried pace of the talks. If can't imagine five hours will really make a critical difference. More than you can possibly know, Leia wanted to say. If this is some kind of negotiating tactic to get more concessions, said Dried, I can almost respect it. But I don't like being lied to either. Philia cleared his throat and said, Talk like this will only delay us further. It serves no purpose. Malordican and Lanchensor glanced at Gothel. The Prex had accommodated the schedule change without complaint and even now he seemed hesitant to force a confrontation about it. Counselor Philia is quite right, interjected Emnel. Now, if we can just calm down and stick to the new schedule, I believe we can. Gothel's comlink buzzed rudely in his pocket. The Zahedra fished it out and, without bothering to excuse himself from the table, turned it on. This is the Prex speaking. Report. Leia couldn't hear what was being said, but the Prex's long face drooped and the black and white striped fur on his head starting bristling in a way she'd only ever seen Philias do. Gothel spun his head to Lanchenzor and said, Raise the estate shields. Now. The old woman gaped. What are you talking? Do it. Gothel snapped. As Lanchenzor got out her own comlink, the Prex rose to his full height and turned angry eyes on the Republic delegates. You fools. You should have warned us. Now we're all dead. Please, explain what's going on, said Leia. The Imperials have entered the system. Lanchens or used the word like a curse as she put her comlink in her pocket. Two star destroyers and an interdictor. Dright shot to his feet. You knew it was coming, didn't you? Didn't you? There's no time for this, Winter said. So loud and firm it took everyone save Leia by surprise. We have to get out of this tower and get to our ships. 
They have an interdictor. Dright flailed a hand skyward. Where can we run? We only have to hold out and be ready, Winter insisted. Help is on the way. The CSA officials didn't look assured. Leia didn't feel it either. Before she could fumble out something, the entire tower started shaking. Her chest clenched and for a second she thought they'd already been hit. Then she saw the motion in the sky above. Everyone ran for the window. They should have all been running the opposite direction, cramming into the lift and riding it down to safer ground, but they couldn't tear their eyes away. Even Leia, in all the adventures and dairy doing of her lifelong fight against the Empire, had never watched with her own eyes as a mile, long Imperial Star Destroyer, still trailing flame from atmospheric entry, tore apart the clouds and fell over the landscape like fist of an angry god. Chapter 34 Emancipator When the division of the New Republic 3rd Fleet Station at Quermia jumped to hyperspace, all crew were put on yellow alert but received no information as to where they were headed or when they were expected to arrive. It was possibly the worst situation a crew could be put in, but to actually announce they were writing to the Eddy system would be to admit that they were, in effect, invading the corporate sector authority's sovereign space, even though they were not, as yet, certain they'd even be fighting anyone because there was no way to be sure Makati was inbound toward Eddy Ivy. So, as often happened, all the crewmen and soldiers in the battle group were stuck with need to know. For Sunter fell, it wasn't good enough. The suspicion he'd had since coming to Cormia had been mounting steadily, and he needed real answers. It was hard to ask sensitive but casual-seeming questions when everybody on the ship knew who you were. He tried for the first few hours of yellow alert anyway before surrendering to his own helplessness. Then, finally, red alert came. Admiral Burke's own voice suddenly blared over every last speaker system in the battle group, saying, All crews to battle stations. All fighters prep for combat. This is not a drill. Repeat this is not a drill. Seven minutes to target. Repeat seven minutes. That set everyone scrambling. Fell had wandered restlessly toward the upper decks when he heard the call, and he got to the ready room later than everyone else. When he was throwing open the door to his locker, and pulling out his black flight suit, Evan and Jansen were just sealing up theirs. Wedge and Hobby were dashing out of the room, and he'd already seen Zark's Felis and Nrin running down the hall for the flight deck. As he grabbed his helmet, Jansen called, See you in space, and then he and Evan were gone. Phil hurriedly jumped out of his boots and slid into his flight suit, then sat down again to put his boots back on. Something glistened on the floor between his feet. He reached down and picked it up, a small metal data card, lying right in front of his locker. He thought back a minute and might have remembered hearing the clatter of something falling when he pulled out his suit. Devin Tor couldn't have left another present in his locker. Tor was elsewhere, apparently in the corporate sector, maybe involved with hunting Makati, there was no way to know. Maybe Tor still had a contact on this ship who relayed a message for him. It could have been Admiral Drayson himself, or it could have fallen from someone else's locker. A voice cracked over the headsets again, declaring that they'd revert to real space in four minutes. Fell made a fist around the data card, grabbed his helmet with his free hand, and ran for the hangar. All the other rogues were already in their cockpits, and he clambered up the ladder into his own. He dropped into his seat, buckled his crash webbing, threw on his helmet, and turned on his comm. This is Rouge 8, standing by. As the other's rogues checked in and his cockpit roof lowered over him, he looked again at the data card in his hand. He slid it into his forward console's small input port. His heads-up display immediately lit up. The picture color was faded and the resolution low but the contents were clear, three stormtroopers with their helmets on, another with his off. And standing next to the bare-faced troopers was a woman with short crop dyed brown hair, an expression that looked tired and dazed at once, and a pregnant swell at her stomach. He recognized his wife instantly. The two-dimensional video started to play, and the bare-faced trooper said, Admiral, this is the Hand of Judgment reporting. As you can see, we have the package in good condition. He placed a hand on Sile's shoulder. Fell wanted to reach out and seize him by the throat. We've lost our transit of world. 
We're secure for now, but request pickup as soon as possible. Coordinates are attached to this data package. The video froze. The image of Sial surrounded by Imperial soldiers hung before him for a second. Then the hut cleared. Fell immediately checked the data card for an attachment. It was there, astrographical coordinates. He plugged the attachment into his ship's navigational computer. The result was Oron 3 in the corporate sector. Then Sile's brother said, Al Rouge, ready engines. Phil's hands ran over his control panel mechanically. As his thrust engines roared to life, he clutched his joystick like he clutched the sticks of a dozen other snub fighters. The flight deck shuddered slightly as they reverted to real space. Phil saw stars through the mouth of the hangar, and a squadron of A-wings were first out the gate. Then Wedge called, Our turn, rogues. All ships away. Fell did as he was told. His fighter jumped ahead, the eight and last in a perfect line. They dove out of the hangar and into space. A blue and green planet lay far ahead. Closer to them lay an Imperial-class star destroyer and a senior interdictor cruiser. Groups of two, Wedge called. As foils in attack position. TIE fighters were starting to spill out of the star destroyer, but they were minutes away. Fell checked his scanners. They were barely inside the interdictor's gravity well. Then he checked his nav computer to see which planet lay ahead. The answer came up immediately. Eddie IV? The corporate sector, where Princess Leia and Borsk Filio were supposed to be meeting secretly with CSA officials. But the secret had come out, just like he'd been afraid of. It was only when he checked for IDs on the enemy ships that he understood. The destroyer was tenacious and the interdictor was constrainer. But his computer also pointed out another Imperial-class warship far ahead, halfway sunken into Eddie IV's atmosphere and invisible to his naked eye. It was steadfast, flagship of Grand Admiral Makati. Then he understood. He understood and he wanted to scream. He knew what Tor's mission had been, to lure Admiral Makati into a trap at Eddie IV, where his three warships were pinned down by a much larger force. He switched his comlink to Wedge's personal channel, and barked, Commander, are the counselors down on that planet? Afraid so, eight. The drag ship pulled us out too far from Eddie IV. We need to punch through. Fell swore and pounded his console so hard it hurt his fist. Urgently, Wedge said, eight, what is it? Eight, respond. They were bait. He snapped. The counselors, they were set up. They were pawns and so were we. All to catch Makati. Listen, eight, you're not making sense. The first wave of ties was approaching fast. Targets lit up on Fell's hut, and he didn't know why he should bother. He believed, truly believed the Republic was different. But now it was Brintal, all over again. Good people used as bait, good soldiers used as pawns, all to be thrown away for somebody else's elaborate scheme. And somewhere else his wife was in danger, and he couldn't help her. He felt like he'd come full circle. But that wasn't true. His wife was close by, and this time he could save her. Suter fell cut acceleration and closed his S foils, then spun his nose toward the edge of the artificial gravity well and gunned his engines, leaving everything else behind. Seven just ran. Nrin reported. Damn it. Wet snapped. He looked at the scanner and saw the green marker for fell ship jetting away in the opposite direction as the first wave of TIE fighters rushed to meet them. There was no time to do anything but fight. He switched to torpedoes, got a fast lock on an approaching TIE interceptor, and fired. As the missile jumped ahead he pulled into a tight turn, dodging sprays of green laser blast. Evan popped off his own torp and stayed right on his wing through the tricky maneuver, while two TIEs burst into flames behind them. Wedge found fell on his scanner and jumped in pursuit. He called to fall back to Three's wing. Stay with Zarks. I'm going after Fell. Avin clicked a wordless affirmative and his fighter peeled off. Wedge switched his comm back to a private link with Rouge 8 and said, Suntir, this is desertion. Explain yourself. I know where Sial is. Wedge couldn't believe it. A squad of A-wings raced past him toward the fight and he kept running after Fell. Rouge 8, explain. Now. I just found a message. A data chip in my locker. It's Sayol. 
She's on Oron 3, and she's been captured. What? I know it's her. I'm sending it to you, right now. Wedge's console lit up, showing he'd received a data package. Fell, I don't have time for this. There's a fight back there. It's a setup. They used the counselors as bait for Makati. What? How do you know that? There's no time to explain. I'm not being someone's pawn again. Not like that. Wedge swore and looked at his scanner. Fell was less than a minute from the edge of the artificial gravity well, and he'd undoubtedly jumped the second he was clear. That data package has the coordinates. Come with me, Wedge. We have to save her. How do you? It's her. I know my wife, damn it. How do you know it's not a trap? Where did you even get this message? It doesn't matter. I'm going for her, Wedge. And if it's a trap, then only you can help me. Wedge swore and pounded his console. The battle was light in the back there. His pilots were fighting for their lives. Wedge, I need you. Fell's voice cracked as he pleaded. Your sister needs you. We have to go now. Wedge was catching up to his brother-in-law. The green reticules of his heads up display rested on four flares of Fell's engines. Soon, Tear, this is desertion. I know. They'll never let you fly for them again. I don't want to. I want my wife. Damn it. I should shoot you down. Fell gave no reply. Wedge rested his thumb on the trigger and watched, watched, watched Fell's engines until they gave one last burst. Then he vanished into hyperspace, leaving dead space ahead. Wedge floated in nothing. The battle raged behind him, but he didn't turn around. He keyed up Fell's transmission and put it on his HUD. He watched. He listened to the short message read off by the stormtrooper without a helmet, but he only looked at the tired, sad pregnant woman held captive by four Imperial soldiers. Without Fell to tell him he'd have never known that was his sister, and he felt ashamed. For Fell to have gotten it in the first place, it had to have been a trap, but that didn't change anything. Fell was leaping into it, and Sayal was already caught. He plugged the attached coordinates into his nav computer. All it would take was the pull of a lever to turn his back on the cause he'd fought for his entire life. Then he'd be a deserter too, just like Fell. He knew it, and in the same instant knew he could never live with himself if he deserted his family. His hand shook and he switched his comm to the rogue's group channel. He wasn't sure if his signal would carry this far, but he said, Attention Rouge Squadron, this is Wedge and Tilly's. Hobby Clivian is now Rouge leader. Repeat, Hobby's in charge. I have to go, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Words caught in his throat. He heard a voice try and speak to him, but it was too marred by static to make sense of. Wedge turned off his comm link and closed his S-foils. His hand found the lever and pulled. The infinity of hyperspace swept him away. Chapter 35 Karuskit As he clambered up the old ladder to the docking hooks from which his TIE fighter hung, Tycho Selchu couldn't help but feel a little ashamed of leaving Maria and Shone behind. They were on the flight deck beneath, looking down at him with weary and affectionate smiles, like they were an old couple watching their grandson go out into the world. When he was gone, they'd have this oversized safe house all to themselves. It seemed a sad fate, but the alternative, that they'd fall prey to Icer's hunters just like all the other NRI agents in Imperial City, was even worse. Tycho forced himself to turn his attention away from them and clambered up into his TIE fighter. He dropped himself inside and buckled his crash webbing but refrained from putting the uncomfortable, airtight helmet on for as long as possible while he ran his pre-flight checks. As the craft's repulsors warmed up, he pulled a single data key out of the front pocket of his flight suit, looked it over as though it were a treasure talisman, then put it away once more. As Maria and Shom had predicted, it had taken time for them to process all of the data Tycho had recorded during his flights over Karuskin. Most it had, in fact, been related to the defenses Isert had put up around Imperial City since taking over, and while that was a great prize for Kraken, Akbar, and the others planning the inevitable taking of the core, it wasn't the main reason Tycho had come. Thankfully, that information had come through too. According to the isotopic tracker Tycho sensors had picked up, 
Someone had left the safe house where Sal and Tilly's had been held and, after some wandering and detours, eventually determined that the being carrying that tracker had boarded a transport on a landing pad, rented out by SARS Transit Limited. Shown, a surprisingly good slicer for an old guy, was able to access the internal systems for that landing complex and, subsequently, the corporate records of SARS Transit which appear to regularly run large commercial flights up the Hydean Way, though its route had been greatly truncated by the ongoing war. Shom had also pulled out copies of the passenger repositories that ISB required all registered commercial transport companies to keep. For once, Tycho was almost thankful for ICER's iron-handed security measures. Shom had placed a copy of all that information, along with all the airborne scans of Coruscant's defenses, and loaded them onto Tycho's data key to carry back to home on. At the same time, he and Mario would make more copies of the information and start distributing it to other NRI operatives scattered on other parts of the planet. One way or another, it was all sure to get back to Kraken and Akbar. Tycho should have felt accomplished as he stuck on his helmet and sealed his breathing tubes to the respiratory apparatus on his suit. Instead, he felt claustrophobic, edgy and not yet convinced that all his trouble had been worth it. That information on Cyrus Transit was several weeks old, and in that time Sayol could have gone to Bakura for all anyone knew. Still, it was a start. It was all he'd really expected to find. He hoped it would help Wedge somehow. Tycho fired up his twin ion engines and checked his comm line. He patched a link down to the flight deck and said, Shom, Maria, anyone there? We hear you, Tycho, the old woman replied, loud and clear. How's my right out of here looking? We just got a ping from the freighter. They've entered orbit over Imperial City and are ready to pick you up. It was the best news he'd heard in weeks. Tell them I'm on my way. And tell them I'm looking forward to getting out of here, no offense. None taken. Maria's laugh was soft, easy. And I'm sure they know. We're going to release the docking clamps now, Shom interjected. Are you ready, Tycho? As I'll ever be. Thanks for the help, both of you. You have no idea how much this means. Releasing clamps now, Shom said. Tycho kicked his repel soil of sawn, so his tie dipped only slightly as the metal braces around his twin solar pylons retracted. As his tie hovered in the middle of the hangar, he craned forward and looked down through his octagonal viewport. Shom and Maria must have retreated from the hangar bay, and he felt some vague regret that he didn't get one last look at them. Take care of yourselves, both of you, he said into his comp. Take care of yourself, young man, Shom said. Have a safe flight home, Maria added. She really did sound like a grandmother. Dragging it out any longer would leave his contact angling in orbit over a hostile world, so he kicked in his ion engines and began the long climb out. The tangled industrial tunnel once again reminded him of the second Death Star, and when he finally emerged into Coruscant skies he found it was night in the works. He pointed himself skyward and kicked away from the ugly mechanized landscape toward stars that gradually became visible as the planet's endless light sunk further and further away. As the clouds peeled Tycho checked his long-range scanners, he spotted the signature of the same freighter that had dropped him here several days ago and plotted a course. An Imperial patrol ship was in low orbit, and he gave it a safe but casual berth. That route brought him closer to a few civilian ships, including a lumbering Gazanti passenger liner, a boxy Demorian cargo hauler, and a disc-shaped Corellian frigor but none of them altered their course for the lone TIE fighter. If Tycho had been a loyal Imperial pilot he'd have felt offended by their flagrant lack of fear. As it was, it filled him with a swelling sense of relief. Once he got aboard that freighter, they'd have a clear shot to Brintal, and from there they'd rendezvous with Home One, and this time he'd be the one waiting to surprise Winter in her cabin. It was a thought to warm him the whole ride home. Tycho squinted and tried to make out his ride up ahead. He thought he saw his high glint in the reflected light of Coruscant shine, bright and winking against smaller, fainter stars. He reached for his comm link and turned it on. Before he spoke, he glanced at his scanner one more time just to verify the ship he'd laid eyes on was the one he wanted to call. As he looked, he saw that Corellian freighter coming up on his aft, 
it seemed to have altered his course to follow him. He had just a second to be surprised. Then Blue Iron Blast shot out from the freighter and caught his ship. Lightning danced over his cockpit consoles. He pulled his hands away before the electric shock could hurt him, but his entire ship whimpered and went dark. Suddenly, he was floating helpless over Coruscant, that freighter impossibly far away. His life support systems were attached to his suit so he was still breathing air. But as he pounded and prodded the consoles, it was clear that breathing was all he could do. Desperate, Tycho looked ahead at the freighter's distant gleam. He stared at it, helpless and longing, until he saw his engine glow turn in his direction. That lasted only a second before it winked into hyperspace, leaving him behind. The Corellian ship had to be coming up behind him now. No, it wasn't Corellian, he knew that. It had to have been Imperials at the helm. He swore, wondered if they'd got Shom and Maria too, then knew he couldn't do a thing about that. He grabbed the emergency self-destruct lever under his seat and pulled. Nothing happened. The ion cannon blast had fright even those systems. He was trapped and the imps could come for him and take him down to Iser and make him betray everyone he knew and cared about and there was nothing he could do. He didn't even have a blaster to turn on himself. But there was one thing he could do. He could open the TIE's cockpit manually and cast himself out into the vacuum. He could pull off his helmet and die a horrible death in open space. The only alternative was capture. He unbuckled his crash webbing, stood up over his chair, and wrestled with the two manual release levers overhead. He wrenched one open and heard the pop of decompression as his cockpit's limited air rushed out into space. The other release lever was harder. He grabbed it with both hands and braced his feet against the side of his cockpit until he finally had enough force to pull it all the way and pop his cockpit fully open. He shoved his head out. Stars spun overhead. Stars, and the gleaming jewel of Coruscant. Somehow it had never looked so beautiful. Then he saw another man in another vac suit less than 20 meters away, tethered to an open airlock on that Corellian freighter's port side. He had a blaster rifle gripped in both hands. Tycho reached for his helmet and fumbled to release it. He was too late. A brilliant shot of blue flashed across the vacuum and caught him in the chest. The blast knocked him back inside the TIE's cockpit. His hands fell away and his body went numb. As everything went dark, he saw stars spinning, spinning, spinning through the porthole overhead. Chapter 36 84 In the space beyond Eddie IV, the Star Destroyer Tenacious was being squeezed between the broadsides of the Mon Cal cruisers Mon Remora and Mon Maria, while at the same time to interdict a cruiser constrainer was barely holding back attacks from Mon Delindo as it began its creeping retreat toward the planet. Admiral Burke had just ordered Emancipator to enter the fray and finish the drag ship off for good. All in all, it should have been an encouraging scene, but it felt like they were losing. Grand Admiral Makati had anticipated their coming and sent Constrainer and Tenacious to pull them out of hyperspace before they reached Eddie IV's orbit, while at the same time dropping his own steadfast directly into the planet's atmosphere over the estate where counselors, Philia and Organa were holding their secret meeting. Combined with the fact that Drayson had heard nothing from Alpha Black for days, it pointed to a massive intelligence failure for which he was in some way responsible. He, Burke, and Darylin had gambled that they could outwit Iser and Makati. They'd lost, and now the whole Republic might pay the price. And just to make a terrible situation worse, he'd received a report shortly before leaving Cormia saying that the Superstar Destroyer Vengeance, recovered by Iser after Inquisitor Jarek's death, had left the Bilbringi shipyards for an unknown destination. There was no way to know where it was going, but the simple fact filled Drayson with a gnawing dread. As he and Willem Burke stood on Emancipator's Bridge, watching the glow of Constrainer's engines grow closer bit by bit, Drayson leaned close to the other admiral and asked, Any word from your old friend? Nothing yet. He couldn't hide a scowl. How long ago did you send the signal? As soon as we left hyperspace. Drayson generally wasn't the type to say I told you so, and he certainly didn't feel like doing it now. Instead he said, What about our advanced fighter team? Are they through? Swift and Surprise are almost at the planet, Burke said, 
naming the destroyers to fast A-wing squadrons. What about the Rouges and Banthus? The X-wings are staying with the assault shuttles. They'll catch up when they can. I'm hoping the A-wings can tear a good hole through Makati's fighter wing before we try an extraction. Ties can't maneuver worth a damn in atmosphere, so we'll have an extra advantage. Burke was a former snub fighter pilot, and he knew the capabilities of those little ships. Do you really think they can extract the counselors without more cover? No, Burke scowled. But once we get close enough, I'm taking Emancipator into the atmosphere to fight it out with Makati. Those Mon Cal ships are going to be stuck in space. It was probably why Makati had dropped steadfast into the atmosphere in the first place. That and the fact that a mile-long imp star literally falling on top of you would scare anything witless. The Mon Cal's can fire down from orbit, said Burke. It won't be exact, but they can still give us suppression fire. Constrainer was still tantalizingly outside firing range, and any IV further away than that. Drayson said, it comes down to how long the counselors can hold on the ground, doesn't it? Burke nodded grimly. That, and how long they had before vengeance arrived. Drayson knew it, Burke knew it, but neither of them dared say it. Even admirals of the New Republic could believe in jinxes. From the bridge of Steadfast, the rolling grassy hills, and distant snow-capped mountains of Eddie IV's southern continent stretched placidly outward in all directions. TIE fighters and A-wings weaved through the clouds, dueling with blasts of green and red lasers, but they seemed like tiny flicknets against the landscape and the massive star destroyer that hung immovable directly above Riga Lanchen or his estate. Makati was disappointed but unsurprised to find that Lanchen's or had installed a military-grade energy shield that, when activated, effectively protected her complex from steadfast dorsal turbolaser cannons. Thankfully, he had other resources at his disposal. While the ties kept the A-wings occupied, Steadfast launched a trio of heavy drop ships from its main landing bay. They didn't have far to fall. The drop ships diverged as soon as they left Steadfast and within three standard minutes each had landed at an equidistant target zone outside the shield umbrella. From there, each drop ship began unloading its supply of it at NS street walkers, and for good measure, scout-mounted speeder bikes. Each of the three landing parties formed a separate phalanx and began advancing on the estate complex. Their ground-level attack would slip beneath the shield umbrella, and Makati knew the heavy assault vehicles would make short work of the automated anti-personnel turrets that had risen from the ground to defend Lanchenzor and the rebel leaders. Makati was confident enough of taking the estate. The hard part would be escaping with the rebel prisoners. On Steadfast Bridge, he watched the battle outside Eddie IV's orbit play out on the tactical holo. After they'd effectively dragged the enemy fleet out of hyperspace a safe distance from Eddie IV, Constrainer and Tenacious has found themselves outnumbered and overwhelmed by rebel ships desperate to get past them to the planet. Grant had ordered both his ships to begin a gradual fallback toward Eddie IV, since the enemy would be moving in that direction anyway, but he hadn't anticipated the ferocity of the rebel attack. Their captive star destroyer was closing in on battered constrainer and would soon destroy it. Tenacious was attempting to fall back to the planet but was being trapped by a pair of Mon Cal cruisers. And Grand Admiral Grant had still not arrived. Mouth dry, Makati asked, how much longer until accuser can start firing on constrainer? They'll be within firing range in three minutes. Not enough time? Makati examined the holo again. At their current distance from the planet, a mini-jump through hyperspace would be dangerous for the rebels. Whether that interdictor kept his gravwells up or not, the enemy could only safely approach any IV at sublight speeds. Tell Constrainer to lower her gravity wells and fall back from the battle zone, Makati ordered. There was no point in wasting that ship and its crew. The tactical crew didn't hesitate to relay that order. As the communications officer called up Constrainer's bridge, Makati added, Lieutenant, tell the crew well done. The officer relayed the news, but Makati turned his attention back to the holo. While he wanted that ship and his crew to flee safely, a part of him also knew that the longer the rebels were delayed fighting away from any IV, the longer he would have to retrieve the enemy leaders below. Nonetheless, he breathed a sigh of relief as Constrainer started to run, and the enemy did not pursue. 
Admiral, the Moncals are falling back from Tenacious, Vivon pointed out. Makati nodded as he watched it won the holo. The captured accuser, all three Mon Cal cruisers, and all the rebel support ships were all vectoring straight for Eddie Ivy. They'll be on us now, sir, Vivant breathed. What are your orders? For us, Captain, we hold right where we are. Continue the bombardment of lanterns or shields. We just might get lucky and break through. As for Tenacious, he considered, then said, tell Tenacious to come to Eddie IV. Have Captain Morvinian join us in our current location. You mean an atmospheric insertion? Sir, with the damage Tenacious has taken, the air pressure might create problems with hull integrity. Then make sure Morvinian runs proper checks. But tell him to join us in the atmosphere if he can. He'll stand a better chance of making it through this fight if he puts as much distance between himself and those Mon Cows as he can. Understood, sir. As Vivant turned to relay the order, Makati looked once more at the placid cloudscape hovering over Eddie IV's fields. He hadn't wanted to tell the captain that he thought they might need Tenacious to stay alive. The rebels will surely bring their captured destroyer into the atmosphere as well, and it could very well prove an even match with Steadfast. Their larger fighter wings from the cruisers and orbit might well prove enough top tip the scales in their favor, and he needed Tenacious to tip them back in the Empire's direction for as long as the battered destroyer could hold out. He didn't relish the thought of sacrificing Captain Morvinian's ship, but for the success of this mission, it just might be necessary. He watched on the holo as all the ships in orbit, friends and enemies alike, started plunging toward one point on Eddie IV's surface. The only things left to do now was wait for Grant to come and write the end of this fight. As she peered through the macro binoculars, Leia Organa felt a chill run down her spine. The Star Destroyer overhead had cast the entire Lantern Czar, estate in shadow, but the fields beyond were aglow with afternoon sunlight that slanted in the faces of two giant, at at walkers slipping beneath the rim of the shield umbrella and marching inexorable toward her position. The automated defensive cannons built into the estate grounds had never been designed to take on such mighty enemies and they wouldn't last long once they came within reach of the Adat's laser cannons. And with the defensive towers gone, those trapped on the ground would be slaughtered. It was like Hoth all over again. Princess, a voice called behind her. Princess, over here. Leia dropped the Maca binoculars and looked behind her. Maca Philanthus was waving one hand, coaxing her toward the open door of the building behind them. There was nothing she could do about the Adats. Leia followed the Aktachi diplomat and tried very, very hard not to look at the Star Destroyer's hull that had replaced the sky above them. When she ducked inside the building, she felt grateful to have something else over her head. From the outside, it looked like a squat one-story thing with small windows placed along the ceiling, and the inside looked like a half-empty storage room. Vice Prex Lanchensor, flanked by her twin bodyguards, was leading the rest of the delegation team to the opposite corner of the room. Once Leia was inside, Philanthus pulled the door shut and slammed down his heavy locking bars. Do you really think we can hide in here? Leia asked as she jogged across the room. Those walls aren't bunker thick. They don't have to be, said Vice Prex Malordican as he stood at Lanchin's or shoulder. The human woman finished plugging her coat into the keypad on the wall and a moment later a portion of the permacrete slid away to reveal a set of stairs riding downward into the dark. Can that get us off the estate grounds? Asked Vice Prex Strite. Lanchensor shook her head. I have tunnels connecting major parts of the estate. There's a security station at the center of the network where we can keep track of the Imperial's advance. Lovely, we can watch our imminent deaths, Felia said. What else? We can reach the hangar also. I have ships that are fast and armed and can get us out of here. That doesn't do us any good so long as the shield is in place, Dright pointed out. That shield is the only thing keeping us from being vaporized, Malordican reminded him. I wouldn't be sure about that. Dright glanced at the rebel counselors. Leia didn't need her weak force abilities to know what he was thinking. Makati might want us alive, but what he wants with us isn't going to be pretty. It won't be pretty for any of you either. Dright's reply was cut off by a shuddering explosion. Lanchensor said, 
There goes the first tower. It won't be long now. Then I humbly suggest we all get down the stairs immediately, said Philanthus. Agreed, said Philae as his first stood on end. Vice Brex, please lead the way. Lanchinzor went down the narrow stairwell first, followed by Gothel and Philia. Philanthus, Emnel, and Brilia followed. Then Melordican. Leia and Winter followed, while Drite and Lanchinzor's two bodyguards brought up the rear along with Philia's protocol unit. The shuffling droid was slowing them down and might need to be left behind. It made Leia glad she hadn't brought 3PO. As they started hurrying through the dark tunnels, Leia had to grab hold of her long dress just to keep from tripping over his muttered white edges. When she spotted Winter doing the same, she laughed against herself. If only the imps had let us change clothes first, he said. If only, Winter replied. She clearly didn't see the humor in the situation. I'm used to talking in fancy clothes and fighting in normal ones. I'm not used to mixing it up. Quite, said Winter and Leia doubted she'd get anything else beyond a couple words and an angry frown. The tunnel shook again, and the light flickered. For a second, they were all plunged in utter blackness. Then light came back on again. What happened? Asked Brilia. Have they breached the estate? They just hit another cannon, said Lanchinzor. When they are all the way in, you'll know. They barely made it ten more meters before the tunnel shook again, worse than before. The light shuddered, then went off entirely. Lanchons or called for her bodyguards to bring their lights. One slipped past Leia and went to hold the other state in the rear drite. Now are we fully breached? Asked Brelia testily. We'll know once we get to the security center, the vice prex replied. It's only a few more. The tunnel shook and Dirk retore. Leia heard the rumbling behind her and threw herself forward grabbing Winter around the waist and pulling both of them ahead as the tunnel started collapsing behind them. She heard the awful thunder of more dirt re-cracking, and felt chunks of dirt pound on her head and back. The light from the espo behind her went out. She and Winter stumbled to their feet once the shaking stopped. The guard up front swung his light around. Leia and Winter cast long shadows on the rubble clogging the tunnel behind them. She saw the forearm of that protocol droid laying at her feet, battered and broken off a body that had surely been crushed. What happened to Vice Prexdrite? Asked Philia. He's gone, Philanthus called back. Him and the guard. They're just gone. Winter grasped her friend's arm and whispered, Leia, can you? Leia shook her head, dumbfounded. She felt nothing in the force behind her. She didn't know what that meant. Maybe she was just too panicked. She wasn't a Jedi like her brother, she barely understood her own power at all. All she knew was that she couldn't feel anyone alive in the debris. Winter tugged her arm again, and she realized that everyone else was already moving forward. Leia hurried after them. As she sidled along Winter, she whispered, Do you think we can trust them? The Vice Prexus. Winter whispered back, I am a Lordican's head tails as they bobbed and swayed ahead of her. Makati must have found out we were here somehow. Winter looked away. The only light in the tunnel was at the head of the column, and it was impossible to read her expression. I just don't know who we can trust, Leia whispered. Trust doesn't matter, said Winter. Right now, we have to take what we can get. She was right, as usual. The tunnel shook again but didn't break. They hurried on through the dark. As six X wing fighters dove through the wispy white clouds, Hobby Clivian tried very, very hard to keep his mind off the two men they'd left behind. He couldn't help thinking of it that way, even though by all logic it was Wedge and Fell who's left them behind, for a reason none of them knew but could all guess. Hey Hobby, see that? Called Jansen. There didn't seem a point in sticking to call signs anymore. See what? Hobby glanced at the scanners. At the moment, all he could see with his eyes were clouds whipping past his cockpit. Does not squint? About five clicks ahead. I was kind of hoping Swift and Surprise Squads would have cleared them out, muttered Felis. Let them come, said Zarx. I am in a fighting mood. She sounded more resolved than confused. Hobby tried to follow her lead, even though still really wish Wedge were here, not to mention Fell, 
and Tycho, or Plor, or Luke Skywalker. And while he was at it, Ibtism and DLLR, and Hirian and Elskal, and all the rest. But enough. The clouds cleared away, and a blue white sky filled his vision. Far in the distance, the dark daggers of twelve TIE interceptors were turning to meet them. Far beyond that was a sight that made Hobby suck an anxious breath, one Imperial class star destroyer, almost as pale as the sky, casting a wedge shaped shadow over what looked like a small village as it raining green turbolaser blasts on the shield dome below. Somehow, those things never looked so big in space. Squints are coming to engage, warned Nren. It'll be two to one. Odds sound good to me, Jansen said, unless they're wearing red stripes. We'll find out soon enough, said Hobby. Arm your torps, people. Lock targets and get ready to launch. The ties were wheeling around to come at their flanks, but Hobby was about to lock onto one of them. His targeting lock held firm even as the fighter came around at an angle. He called, All ships, on my mark. Then break. One, two, three, mark. The six X wings launched their torps and scattered. Tangled thrust trails weaved through the atmosphere toward their targets. TIE interceptors were much more agile in atmosphere than standard Imperial fighters, but they still couldn't outmaneuver a set of torpedoes. As he spun around toward the nearest TIE, Hobby spotted firebursts in the corner of his vision and saw broken bodies of TIE fighters trailing black smoke as they fell toward the fields below. He set his laser to quad link shots and sent repeated volleys of red laser blasts at the nearest TIE. He managed to clip it and send it spiraling, but any celebration was cut off by the batter the shields were taken as another tie tore down on him. On it, lead, called Nren. Pull up. Hobby did what he was told, just in time to see Nren's X-wing barreling nose first toward his. He swerved up just in time for Nren's fighter to give his pursuer a face full of laser blasts. As Nren's X-wing tore through the explosion and tumbling shrapnel, Hobby leveled out his X-Wing. It had been a while since he'd flown in atmosphere, and he'd forgotten what strong gravity did to your body when making those kinds of manweavers. Lead, Nren, two from above, called Jansen. Hobby swore and looked at the cloud-streaked sky above his cockpit. He couldn't see anything, but apparently Nren could. The Corrin called, break right, lead. And once more Hobby did as he was told. A torrent of green plasma plunged through the space where he'd just been. The ties that fired it plunged through a second after. As Hobby and Nren formed up on each other's wings, Jansen and Felis took to pursuit. The latter popped off a torpedo that caught one squint in a fireball. The other veered away sharply. That one's mine, Hobby called, and dove right after it. He knew he should be saving his torpedoes, but he didn't want to mess with lasers right now. He got his lock and fired his warhead. The tie tried to spin and evade, and in space it was exactly the kind of maneuver that might have foiled a torpedo lock, but they were in atmosphere, with gravity tugging them down. The explosion sent and tumbling through a low layer of clouds and into the ground below. Are we clear? Hobby called as his scanner showed empty of hostiles. We're clear, Hobby, Jansen said. Anyone spot red stripes? Asked Davin. They were not flying good enough for that, Zarks commented. Agreed. Those squints were naked, boss, said Felis. Naked imps. Just the way I like him, said Jansen. Okay, Hobby, what now? Hobby swung his nose around to the distant, intimidating bulk of Steadfast. Despite the shadow it cast, he could make out the adats approaching the estate with his naked eye. What do you think? Let's crack open some walkers. Lead? We've got company, warned Nren. Hobby scanned the skies for darting dark TIE fighters, and it took him an extra second to see the obvious. A second pale star destroyer was breaking through the scattered clouds on the opposite side of Steadfast. The sight made Hobby's gut fall into his chest. Oh, he said, oh nuts. Hold on, boss, check your scanners, Fila said. That's Emancipator. Looks like she's launching more fighters added Avon. Well, I take back my pessimism, Hobby said. Our Rouges, full ahead for Emancipator. Let's rescue our people. All things considered, 
the auxiliary communications relay in the aft section of J-Deck on the Star Destroyer Steadfast was a pretty good place to keep track of the Battle of Eddie IV. The comm note also allowed Ryan Darylin to slice into the flagship's exterior sensor network as well as its internal hollow cam system. Best of all, there was nobody to bother him. The comm relay was little more than a dark closet tucked away at the confluence of two maintenance shafts, and with the fight steadfast was in the middle of, nobody was bothering to run any maintenance checks. It was, therefore, the perfect place for a couple of Bothan spies to squeeze together in the dark, faces lit up only by the reflected light of the room's three-view screen. Darylin had one feed plugged into a screen, and he couldn't keep himself from patching into the security system to scan for Grand Admiral Makati. After checking his personal quarters and finding only that old protocol droid standing unassuming in a corner, he checked the bridge and found the man in his white uniform, pacing the deck, gesturing and giving soundless orders. It was strangely captivating to watch. You ever wonder if this is what it was like for Sheer? Cask asked in a low whisper. Darylin tore his attention from Makati and glanced at the other Bothan. He didn't have a good answer. He'd been trying very hard not to think about Sheer Valine or Koth Melon or any of the other people he'd known who'd already given their lives to kill the Empire. In the end, all he managed in reply was a grunt. Maybe, maybe not, Cass continued, but I kind of hope it was. For her sake, she'd have gotten a nice view of everything outside Aggressor. She'd have known how it was going to end when the time came. If the end was going to come for them, they'd know it though Darylin didn't expect them to be blown out of the sky anytime soon. In placing himself exactly above the lanterns or estate, Makati had accomplished a lot of things at once. He'd laid siege over the place in the most intimidating way possible, he distanced himself from the Mon Cal cruisers in orbit, and, perhaps most importantly, he'd made it pretty much impossible to destroy his ship without destroying the estate below and the thousands of essent beings trapped there, including Philia and Organa. Now that Emancipator and Tenacious had both joined steadfast in Eddie IV's atmosphere, things were getting a little tight. The ships were launching fighters at one another but seemed loath to exchange actual broadsides. Darylin didn't know what kind of danger it posed to light up a planet's atmosphere with excessive volumes of plasma, but all three massive ships seemed acutely aware that the most valuable prize in this whole fight lay on the vulnerable ground beneath them. Even the Mon Cal cruisers seemed to have mostly restricted themselves to launching fighter support rather than risk firing down at the planet's surface. Makati had found a good defensive strategy, but if he tried to run in any direction he was stuck. The Grand Admiral wasn't stupid enough to box himself in like this with no hope of escape, and it made Darylin nervous. There was something they were all missing. His comlink buzzed and he eagerly plucked it from his pocket. Darylin here. You're still alive. Good, said Jack Carr. Likewise. We found a good place with lots of camera fees to hole up in. Where are you guys? Deck BK aft, section 102. You see us? Give me a sec. Darylin shut off the security cam feed from the bridge and, with some effort, found the one Carr had mentioned. It looked like some long, narrow maintenance hallway, abandoned except for two guys in stormtrooper armor who were making unstormtrooper-like gestures at the camera. You guys are professionals? Cass smirked. Did you run into any trouble? Nope, said Ekrahim. With the battle on everybody's going where they're supposed to go and assuming everybody else is too. So no security checks. What are you doing down there? Asked Darlin. Check your schematics, boss, said Carr. We're right by the main targeting sensor node for the entire dorsal section of the ship. You're trying to knock out the bottom guns? Asked Cask. Right on. We've got charges and everything, but we can't get through the door up ahead. We figure you might help. Give me a few minutes, Darylin said, and started pulling up ship schematics on the other screen. It wouldn't be hard for him to remotely disable the alarms on the door, assuming he could find the one they were looking at. As he worked, Cask said, if you're just knocking out the targeting computer, they'll still be able to aim those guns manually. Sure, said Carr, but it'll be a lot harder for them to hit our snub fighters and a lot easier for our evac shuttles to move in. Fair enough, 
plan to hit anything else after this. I don't know. When are you guys going after Makati? I don't know. We're all a long way from the bridge, and the whole command tower is really fortified. Plus he's got that crazy gunslinger droid we saw at. I think I've got it, Daryl said. Guys, check the serial number on your door panel. Read it to me. The two full stormtroopers disappeared from the camera's view, but a moment later Ekrahin read, EK-768-995. Got it. I've got it. I'm disabling the door now. They let him work in silence, and it took him less than a minute to kill all security protocols for the door. Great work, boss, said Carr. Leave the rest to us. Can't wait for the boom, Daryl said, and flicked off his comlink. He told Cask, finally we're being useful. Finally, agreed the other Bothan. I just hope Tor got off bonded and safe. He knows what he's doing. Don't worry about him. Daryl switched the feed from the security cameras back to Steadfast Bridge and tapped a claw on Makati's pale figure. Now that's what we need to worry about. I guess we should start looking up the sneakiest way up there. I guess so too. Now if you'll give me a minute. Something on this third screen lit up. Daryl glanced at the reports from the outside battle for the first time in minutes and couldn't believe what he was seeing. Cask sensed his surprise. What is it? What happened? Is it Emancipator? Was she hit? Oh no, Daryl said. This is much worse. According to the sensor reports, the three Imperial warships had just jumped into low orbit and begun to engage the Mon Cal cruisers, two Imperial class star destroyers and one massive, 19 kilometer long super star destroyer called Vengeance. Grand Admiral Octavian Grant was proud to be considered an old-school tactician with an appreciation for precise and elegant use of individual units to achieve battlefield supremacy. Nonetheless, as he stood on Vengeance's bridge, he had to admit there was something to be said for getting on a really big star destroyer and pulverizing your enemies with endless waves of emerald destruction. Vin Sisko seemed to be enjoying it as well. Judging from the captain's gleeful expression as he watched Vengeance's turbolaser batteries bombard the three Mon Cal cruisers and their support ships. The rebels, to their credit, weren't stupid enough to try and fight an enemy with overwhelming firepower. They were trying to break formation and scatter, forcing Vengeance to chase one but not the others. Still, they had been stuck deep in Eddie IV's gravity well when Grant had arrived and they had limited places to run as Vengeance's black sword cut down at that. One Mon Cal ship managed to make a cleaner break than the others, and Grant assigned Captain Trigget to chase it down with Implacable. At the same time, he ordered Oriflam to stay close, just in case he needed it. Another Mon Cal ship and its two flanking assault frigates were attempting to sneak beneath Vengeance. Grant chose to ignore their threat for the moment and concentrate fire on the third and last heavy cruiser. The ship was closest to Vengeance's stern and attempted to fire off several volleys of concussion missiles at its engine section. The week-long repairs at Bubringi had been rushed at the end, but the techs had still done a fine job of bringing the ship back up to fighting shape, and Vengeance was able to absorb the impact from every last missile before unleashing wave after wave of turbolaser fire from its aft batteries. The Mon Cal ship withstood the fire few volleys, but then Captain Bremel moved Oriflam, to strike from above, acting at the hammer that pounded the rebel ship against Vengeance's anvil. It was crushed between the two and, after less than ten minutes of non-stop turbolaser fire, it lost all engine shields, suffered a reactor burst, and exploded so brilliantly the flashing light carved shadows on the faces of the bridge crew. The cheers were respectably restrained, but Grant didn't have time to bask in them. The comm officer said he had an incoming transmission from Captain Bremel and the Grand Admiral told him to send it directly to his personal comlink. What is it, Captain? asked Grant. Sir, we're holding a call on your private channel, Bremel said. It's from the same private channel as before. Excellent. Type beam it over to Vengeance, Executive Priority. Very good, sir. Grant turned off his comlink and walked over to Cisco. Captain, he said, I have to take a brief call in my cabin. You have the bridge. Yes, sir, Cisco said. He looked like he was enjoying this. 
Grant hurried back to the Spartan chamber, he couldn't help but think of Ajarix. He fired up the communications console, input as executive code, and brought up the holo image of Leonia to Vera. Ah, Grand Admiral, it's good to see you, she said pleasantly. He was instantly suspicious. Where are you now? He asked. Have you found Starflare? We're on our way. Tell me your location, and I'll meet you. With vengeance on the scene, the battle was all but over. He could leave the fight to Makati, Sisko, and Trigit and still beat to Vera and Thrawn to Starflare. At least, it was worth a try. Tavira tapped her chin thoughtfully. Hmm, and why would I do that? Are you aboard that Star Destroyer you wanted? I am. If you fulfill the rest of your bargain, I'll tell you where Starflare is. Grant snorted. The longer you draw this out, the longer it will take me to get there. Assuming you even know where Starflare is. I do, the girl said defiantly. Give me Invidious and I'll let you have her. No. Here's what we're going to do, girl. You tell me the location. I meet you there. Then I tell you how to take over Invidious because, together, we're going to have to fight off a Grand Admiral to get our prize. She looked confused. A Grand Admiral. Makati. No, you Trollop. Grand Admiral Thrawn. You've heard of him, haven't you? Her eyes narrowed. I've heard. Rumors. They're not rumors. He may be an upstart alien, but he hunted down and killed Grand Admiral Zarn. Do you really think you can fight him off with one star destroyer on a skeleton crew of pirates and riffraff? She scowled. How do I know you're not lying to me? He wasn't lying. He wasn't telling the truth either. For all he knew, Thrawn had claimed Starflare already, though he'd have gotten a call from Icer complaining about it by now. The alien was out there somewhere, he was sure of that. With utter honestly, Grant said, you cannot risk going against Thrawn by yourself. Don't be a fool. For a moment she looked like the confused, torn teenager she was. Then she titled her head back and attempted that Icer impression again. I am currently en route to Oran 3. I expect to meet you there and receive full control over Invidious. Excellent. I'll be there as soon as I can. Grant turned off the link. He stood in front of the console for a long moment, then called up steadfast. Makati's image promptly filled the space where Tavira's had been. Grand Admiral Grant, Makati said, with a rare and relieved smile on his lips. Thank you for your timely arrival. I assure you, it's my pleasure. We've already destroyed one of their Mon Calamari cruisers. Have you retrieved the rebel leaders yet? No, but my ground forces have infiltrated the estate. It's only a matter of time. What about the rebel star destroyer? We have it boxed in, and without support from the cruisers in orbit it can't threaten us. Good. I'll send fighters down from Vengeance to help your air support. I'd very much appreciate that. There was no point in hesitating. Grant said, Grand Admiral Makati, I'm afraid I must leave the rest of the battle in your hands. I'm taking Oriflam on an urgent mission, but Vengeance will remain in orbit. I'll tell Captain Sisko to defer to your commands. I see. Makati tilted his head quizzically. Do you need assistance on this mission? Not at all, Grant said, then decided to reassure him. I have to make rendezvous with a mutual friend of ours. Grand Admiral Thrawn. It wasn't exactly a lie. Makati's eyes lit up. I see. Well, make haste then. And good luck. Likewise. Grant snapped a crisp salute. The other Grand Admiral returned it. Then Grant reached for the console, and Makati's image died. Grant took a deep breath, then marched out of Jarek's cabin for the last time. All in all, he knew he'd feel better being on his old ship. It was the closest thing he had to home. Chapter 37 Oran 3 They were still an hour outbound from Oran 3 when Captain Nerys went to see the Grand Admiral in his quarters. Nerys was slightly surprised he hadn't emerged to oversee final preparations, and when he entered Thrawn's chambers he found the Chiss seated as usual in his command chair, observing holo-projected images. This time he wasn't examining art objects or star maps. The holos that ran before him were publicity images of Wines' star flare. At first it struck Nerys as absurd to find the Grand Admiral examining them, like some love-struck fan. 
Then he noticed that so many of the holos featured Starflare together with her husband. Many of them looked like they'd been snapped by journalists or paparazzi during screening events. She's much better at faking a smile that he is, Thrun observed as he brought on Holo up to four. Starflare in a long sequin dress, holding the arm of Baron fell in full formal uniform. They were posing for that one and smiling at the Holo photographer, but as Thrawn had said, hers looked more honest than his. A strange pairing, sir, Nerys admitted. A hollow actress and a soldier. But both peerless in their respective fields. Both Corellians far from home. I imagine they found some compliment in each other. Thrawn's chair pivoted away from the holo so he could look at Nerys. But I'm sure you didn't come for this. What is it, Captain? We're less than an hour out from Oran 3. I know. Have the Nori been moved to the staging area? Yes, sir, and their shuttle has been readied. There was something else, though. Go on. Sir, we just received a message packet from Grand Admiral Makati. He reports that the situation at Eddie IV is well in hands, and thanks us again for recovering vengeance. I'm glad to hear it. Sir, he also said that Grand Admiral Grant had taken his Star Destroyer, Oriflam, and was coming to meet up. Thrawn's forehead creased in thought. Nearest added, Sir, I wasn't aware we'd been cooperating with Grant in this. Quietly, calmly, Thrawn said, we weren't. Admiral, is this going to be a problem? Without answering, Thrawn shut off the holo and rose from his chair. He began walking for the exit and Nerys hurried after him. I believe we'll have to change our plans, Thrawn said as they turned into the hallway. Captain, I'm going to request that you drop us out of hyperspace on the edge of the Orin system. Interpose us on the vector one would expect to ship outbound from Eddie IV to arrive from and have Corvus bring up her gravity wells to full power. Nerys didn't like the sound of that at all. Sir, does this mean we are going to have to fight Grant? What it means is that I suspect Director Isard of trying to renege on our agreement and take Starflare for herself. I made steps to assure that Baron Fell is also coming to Oron 3, but I'm afraid I didn't anticipate Grant's arrival. It wouldn't be the first time they fought a Grand Admiral, but in chasing Zarin they'd been chasing a renegade and a traitor. Sir, Nearest said cautiously, do you really believe Fell is worth making an enemy of Grant and Isert for? Thrawn halted before they reached he reached the turbolift that led down from the command tower. He fixed his red eyes on Nearest and said, my main priority is still what the Emperor tasked to me, securing the unknown regions from Nuzo Esva and his light. Isert and Grant can't help me with that. Fell will. If we do this, sir, I don't think we'd be welcome in Isert's empire any longer. Does that worry you, Captain? Nearest was surprised to find it didn't, not really. He'd left his old life in the old empire behind, and his return to imperial space had only solidified his allegiance to Thrawn above all others. He wasn't worried about that, only the battle ahead. A fight against Grant may be difficult, sir. That's my concern. As it should be, Captain, but I trust you to hold the line in my stead. Nearest blinked. Me, sir, where will you be? If Grant is after Fell and Starflare, I believe it's all the more imperative that I accompany the Nori to Oron 3 myself. Sir, that's too he was about to say dangerous. Sir, I just want to advise you to take as thorough precautions as you can. Do you doubt the Nori, Captain? No, sir, I nearest noticed the tight curve at the size of Thrawn's mouth and realized the Grand Admiral was playing with him. Nearest shook his head and said, just be careful, sir. We can't afford to lose you. I could say the same. Thrawn walked over to the portal and summoned the turbolift. Hold off Grant for as long as you can. When you get a signal from my shuttle saying we're leaving the planet, feel free to drop gravity wells and run. And if you think the situation had become too dangerous, if Grey Wolf or Corvus are in danger of being outright destroyed, you also have my permission to run. Sir. I won't abandon you on that planet. This ship is not to be thrown away, Captain. Neither are you. Nearest his hands clenched at his side. He never had a compliment make him feel so awful. Sir, I promise I will hold back Grant as long as possible. I don't doubt it. 
The lift door spread open. Theron stepped into the tube, then turned to face Nerys. He gave the captain a tiny nod and said, fight well. Nerys snapped to salute. The door slid shut and took Thrawn away. Nerys listened until the whir of the moving turbolift had faded nothing. Then, slowly, he lowered his hands to his side, turned, and marched for the bridge. Leonia Tavira had been more than half expecting a bluff. What she'd heard about the mysterious 13th Grand Admiral had mostly sounded like incredible rumor, and when Grant had told her that the alien commander was on his way to Oron 3 to pick up Wines and Starflare, she'd suspected it was just a delaying tactic, an excuse to hold off giving her invidious for as long as possible. When the Star Destroyer was wrenched from hyperspace too soon, she knew Grant hadn't been lying and immediately wished he had. What is this? Squawked Captain Morox. Why did we leave hyperspace so soon? It's an interdiction field, sir, said the helmsman, who'd been glancing nervously over his shoulder at Rosk for the past hour. Put all shields up now, Tavira commanded. This is still my ship, Morox glared at her. Belay that order. Sensors, what have we got? I'm picking up two ships, hard to starboard, sir. Looks like an interdictor, immobilizer class, and... One Imperial class Star Destroyer. Morix paled. Hail the Star Destroyer? Ask what they want. And raise shields. Tavira snorted amusement, looked around the bridge. She'd taken advantage of the travel time to reroute her people throughout the ship, putting them at key locations that Grant had advised her, but the still had people on the bridge, including the two Nikto, the four battered Clone Wars battle droids, Rosk and Levron. Captain, said the comm lieutenant. The Star Destroyer is already hailing us. They're warning us to back away from the system at once. Are they identifying themselves? Not explicitly, sir. ID transponders read Corvus and Grey Wolf. Morox shook his head. I've never heard of those ships. Ask them whose flag they fly under. Sir. Isert, Teradoc, Zizinj, Kane, whoever. Ask them. As the lieutenant made the call, Morux turned his glare back on Tavira. What in the devil have you dragged us into? Tavira crossed her arms. You knew other people wanted our quarry. Are you going to fight for your prize, Captain? Or should I tell Truton you turned your tail and ran at the first sign of trouble? Have you heard anything else from your people? He glowered. She shook her head. Not yet. Stall them, Captain. Buy as much time as you can, but don't engage them until we absolutely have to. Captain, called the comm lieutenant. They identify themselves as flying for the Empire. That's all. Morox kept his eyes on Tavira. You know who they are, don't you? No, but I have an idea, she said honestly. The important thing is to hold. Morox gave another one of his deep-throated growls, turned, and stalked over to the tactical station. Our shield's up. Yes, sir, said a lieutenant. Guns are warming too. Should we launch fighters? How much time until they intercept? Looks like 15 minutes to firing range. As Morox deliberated with himself, growling all the while, Tavira stepped to the back of the bridge. She brushed the side of her face and tapped on the comlink in her ear. Bulabango, she said, do you hear me? Loud and clear, Captain. Are you still in position? Yep. I've uploaded all the programs I could into NVIDIA's computer core without triggering alarms. I can't get us control of the Atmo systems, the gravity, the lights, of most of the door locks, and other auxiliary stuff. I can also shut down the sensor arrays and targeting computers if you want that. If anything, they need those systems the most. What about helm and weapons? I can't kill them, but I can't control them. Sorry. It was as she'd expected. Bulabango was one of the best slicers in the corporate sector, and she'd set him on the job of hijacking as many of NVIDIA's computer systems as he could, but even the wily Zexto couldn't commandeer the ship on his own. They'd need Grant's help after all, Tavira just hoped he'd get here in time. What should I do now, Captain? Asked Bulabango. Hold position and wait for my signal. Be ready to start bolting doors and cut in atmosphere in all compartments we don't have people in. Okay. 
You want to kill them or just knock them unconscious? Tavira considered for a moment, then said, just disable them. We can't use prisoners to barter. She heard Morux walking toward her and tapped off the comlink. She spun on a heel and gave the flustered captain one of her girlish smiles. Is everything under control? That destroyer will be here in 15 minutes, Morux said. They still don't identify their loyalties. Who are they? Tavira tilted her head. You can't even talk to the commanding officer. Someone named Neris. I never heard of him. But you know something, don't you? Tell me you know something. His desperation was almost comical. She walked back onto the bridge, down the center aisle, and looked out the viewport. With her naked eyes she could just barely make out the gray wedge of the approaching Star Destroyer. She couldn't see the drag ship at all. Is Corvus holding position? She asked. Moros nodded. That means they're probably expecting someone else. And do you know who that is? I think I might. Morak sighed angrily. And I don't suppose that someone else works for High Admiral Teradoc, does he? I'm afraid not. Then why shouldn't I just shoot you as a traitor where you stand? He put a hand on the butt of his holstered pistol. He got his answer immediately, before the handful of guards he had on the bridge even noticed. The four Clone Wars battle droids whipped up their rifles and aimed at his back. That's one reason, Tavira smiled and tapped a finger playfully on his chest. But since I'm generous, I'll give you three. Second, if you kill me, you lose my team, and without my team, you'll never get to Starflare. Third, the man coming is our best chance against that Star Destroyer, and he won't be pleased if it turns out you killed me. The last part wasn't exactly true. But the captain didn't need to know that. Morix made another one of those growls before taking his hand off his pistol. The droids, slowly, lowered their guns. Tactical, he called over his shoulder, still glaring at Tavira. How long until they're in firing range? Eight minutes, sir. Then launch a squadron of ties but tell them to hold at our bow. Do not engage unless they fire first. Yes, sir. A prudent measure, Tavira said. I believe that we can. Sir, the lieutenant called again. Another ship just dropped out of hyperspace. Morox spun away from Tavira and hurried over to the tactical station. The woman woman was right on his heels as he asked the lieutenant, can we identify it? It looks like another star destroyer, sir. The transponder reads, Orflam. Morox knew that ship clearly. Oh. Grand Admiral Grant. Excellent, Tavira clapped her hands together and said, Communications. Give me a direct line with Oriflam. What do you think you're doing? Asked Morox as she skipped over to the comm station. Captain, our help has arrived. She said cheerily. Help. Grant works for Isert. And you? Captain, listen carefully. Still grinning, Tavira added steel to her voice. If you want to survive the next hour, you should do exactly as I say. Grant was disappointed when they were wrenched out of light speed on the edge of the Oron system, but not surprised. There was only one major hyperspace route leading in and out of the system, and it was just like Thrawn to use interdictors to cover his movements. He took in the scene quickly, one drag ship and two star destroyers. He recognized both big ships immediately. Tavira had already mentioned Invidious as her soon-to-be personal star destroyer, and Grey Wolf had led the hunt for Zarin. Grant took a deep breath. For years he'd longed for a chance to go head-to-head -head with the upstart alien admiral, but he'd never truly imagined a fight would happen, certainly not when the stakes were so high. Come, he said, hail Grey Wolf. Tell them I want to speak to their Grand Admiral. The lieutenant and his staff looked confused. Thrawn's actions and promotion were still little known among Navy officers and crew. Before the lieutenant could make the call, he said, Sir, we're already getting the hail. It's from the other Star Destroyer, Invidious. It was probably time to give her what she wanted. Grant walked over to the comm station and said, All right, put her on. After a second, the hollow image of Leonia Tavira, still wearing her old moth's uniform jacket, appeared in front of him. Without prelude, she said, Grand Admiral, it's time you fulfill your part of this bargain. How do I know you won't just take Invidious and run? 
I can't run any more than you right now, Admiral. And I still want Starfleur. I'm sure you do. What makes you think you can get any closer to her than I can? I still have my personal Corvette, Courtesan. It's a fast ship. I'll send one of my lieutenants to the edge of the gravity well. He'd micro jump around the drag field and get to Orin 3. And claim Starflare for himself. Grant raised an eyebrow. My men are loyal, Admiral. Please, he scoffed. I'm sure your ah, charms are the only thing keeping your bunch of alien rabble from mutiny. Why can't you launch this corvette now? She lowered her voice and said, Teradoc's people are holding her in the hangar and refusing to let her go. Give me control, and we can change that. Grant glanced at the tactical holo. Grey Wolf had been moving toward Invidious, but on Oroflam's arrival it had halted its approach and now sat midway between the two hostile destroyers. Corvus still sat far behind it, but from his position Grant could still attempt a charge that would force Grey Wolf to pull back and intercept him, leaving Invidious clear to launch that corvette. After Tavira hijacked its systems, Invidious wouldn't be able to fight like a fully manned ship, but a Star Destroyer was still a Star Destroyer, and Grant wanted as much firepower on his side before he engaged Thrawn. He still expected Tavira to try and run with Starflare once she had the prize, but he'd deal with that as it came. All right, he said finally, and withdrew a small data stick from his pocket. This contains all the data needed to override the executive codes on that ship. You have to plug these sequences directly into the main computer cortex. I know. I have people who can do it. Are you standing by to receive the data? Tavira touched a hand to her cheek, briefly brushing back her hair. I'm ready, Admiral. All right, let's get this over with. The codes came as Bilibango had predicted they would, as a data packet attached to the transmission stream from Orflan. The Zexto slicer was already monitoring all com signals coming in and out of the Invidious, and once Tavira sent him a warning, she had no doubt he'd take care of the rest. For the first long seconds, nothing seemed to change on Invidious Bridge. Then there was a brief flickering of the lights. Then Billy Bango's voice whispered in her ear, We have control, Captain. The lieutenant at the helm station was the first to frown and call up to Morux, Sir, my controls are no longer responding. We are having problems too, sir, said a gunnery ensign. What do you mean? Morox bent over the crew pit. What kind of problems? I'm getting a message saying I'm not authorized to access, sir. That's impossible. Use my override code. Alpha Sigma 198600 Gamma. Nothing's working, sir. It's like someone hijacked the control systems. Captain. Someone else in the crew pit said, systems all over the ship are going haywire. Atmos be invented into space. Whole decks are losing air. What? The crews are trying to move, but their access codes aren't working. They can't open the doors. As if one cue, the heavy blast doors at the entrance to the bridge came crashing down, sealing the crew on the command deck. Morix's face went red, and it looked like he was going to hyperventilate. Then, finally, the obvious hit him, and he turned to look at Tavira. You, he gasped, what did you do to my ship? She clasped her hands behind her back like a proud Imperial captain and said, This is my ship now. As I said before, follow my orders if you want to live. This is outrageous. Morox snapped. You can't just steal a fully manned Star Destroyer. I think I just did, Tavira said proudly, though she could see the handful of guards on the bridge reaching slowly for their weapons. You should tell your men to stand down. Morix's face was starting to turn from red to an interesting maroon. It had been clear for a while that Teradoc hadn't attracted the best talent to his warlord fleet, and Tavira wasn't surprised when Morix tried to grab his pistol. The other guards raised their weapons too, but none of them got off a shot. She'd instructed her guards organic and mechanical to choose a single target to kill when the time came, and each one carried out his or his orders with timely precision. Rosk was the one who had the honor of dropping Morux, with a single shot to the head. The captain crumpled face down on the middle of the bride, in front of all his shocked and terrified crew. Tavira marched over to the captain's body, picked up his pistol, and stuck it under the waistband of her belt. 
She looked down at all his crew, smiled, and said, Please remain where you are. If you have sidearms, please hand them over to my people without a fight. Happily, she trotted over to the tactical station, where Rosk had just grabbed the lieutenant's weapon. The young man stuttered, What happens to us now? She tapped him playfully on the chest. I haven't decided yet. If you prove useful today, I might just keep you. Can't keep me. Tavira ignored him and looked at the tactical holo. Grant had stared moving. He was doing the obvious thing and angling for Corvus. Grey Wolf would be able to change course and intercept him before he reached the target, but just barely. In chasing Grant, Grey Wolf would have to turn his aft to Invidious. Tavira had to admit it made a very tempting target. She tapped her earpiece and said, Report, Billabango. Everything's under control, Captain. The crew are starting to drop. Keep their atmo low but stable. What about the rest? I've rerouted gunnery and helm control to the auxiliary stations. We've got people in place should be able to control everything from there. Don't think we'll be at peak effectiveness, though. I was prepared for that. Give us forward speed, Billabango. I want to go after Grey Wolf. Understood, Captain. As she tapped off her earpiece, the comm lieutenant interjected, saying, We're, ah, uh, being hailed, um, Captain. It's Oriflam. Excellent, Tavira said, and jauntily stepped back to the comm station. Please, put the Grand Admiral on. The old man's head and shoulders appeared before her. She said, This ship is now mine, Admiral. Thank you for fulfilling your part of the bargain. As you can see, I'm going after the drag ship now, Grant said. I do see, and I just told my, ah, helmsman to come and help. You have clearance to launch your corvette. Why haven't you done it already? Tavira chuckled and leaned a little closer to the holo. There's nothing to do, Admiral. The late Captain Morux was actually glad when I said I wanted to launch Cortison before entering the system. He probably thought it would weaken my hand here. More fool him? What are you saying, girl? I'm saying I had Cortison swing around to the far side of the system and enter from the opposite vector. My people should be arriving at Oron 3 as we speak. The hyperspace ride to the Oron system had given Wedge and Tilly's and Suntir fell the chance to calm down, talk to each other, and come up for a plan for when they arrived at their destination. Both agreed that some kind of trap was likely, so they avoided coming into the system on the direct vector and plotted a series of roundabout micro jumps to bring them close to the planet. When they finally did arrive, they nestled their X wings close to the surface of the planet's second moon, which was currently looking down on the continent where their data indicated Sial was being held. From their hiding place, they performed thorough scans and determined that the only ships in orbit were automated CSA drone barges moving cargo. They were about to move when sensors reported that two big vessels had appeared far out on the system's edge, one Imperial Star Destroyer and one Interdictor, which promptly fired its gravity well projectors to full strength. With the drag field now up over most of the system, it would get a lot harder to escape. Wedge and Fell had spent some 15 minutes verbally deliberating their options when another Star Destroyer was pulled into the interdiction field. As First Destroyer moved slowly to intercept, Fell spotted a JV-7 Imperial Escort Shuttle, a nimbler, more combat-capable version of the standard Tri-Wing Lambda-class shuttle was heading toward Oron-3 from a vector that suggested it had come from the First Destroyer. At the same time, a Third Star Destroyer dropped in system. I think we've run out of time, Fell said. We have to move now. We still don't know what's going on with those empires. They look like friends. Whatever they're up to, it doesn't involve us. We need to get to Sial before that shuttle does. Want to shoot it down? Fell thought for a moment. Detouring to intercept it would take time, but it was close enough that his crew would certainly notice two X-Wings cutting to the target ahead of him. Before he could give a reply, his sensor board lit up. A new ship decanted from hyperspace right in Oron 3's orbit, and it was barely slowing down as it careened toward the planet. What is that ship? Asked Wedge. It doesn't matter. We're out of time. Fell kicked his thrusters to full and made sure his torpedoes were armed. 
Wedge was right behind him and together they soared toward Oron Three's brown gold face. The newcomer's engines were burning dead ahead, and fell sensors made a quick identification. Marauder class Corvette, he said. Standard CSA picket ship type. I'm betting that one's not on official business, said Wedge. Can you get a lock on it? It's not in range yet. Fell dropped his targeting reticule on the thruster glow. I might try a torp anyway. That thing will have shields. It's heading straight for where Sial is. We have to stop it. I know, I just, ah, staying it. Fell saw it too, with his sensors and his eyes. Marauder Corvettes weren't big ships, and their design has swapped carrying capacity for guns and maneuverability, nonetheless. A standard ship of his class was built to hold a squadron of 12 starfighters. A full dozen dropped from the ship's ventral hangar bay, spun around, and raced toward Wedge and Fell. They were a motley assemblage of ships Fell spotted authority irons, T-wing interceptors, Z-95 headhunters, a V-wing from the Clone Wars, and they were all heading his way. Are you ready, Wedge? He called. Do I get a choice? I'm afraid not. He dropped his reticule on the profile of the nearest headhunter. The ship was coming fast and he get a torpedo lock. I'll take a Z-95. I'll get an ired, said Wedge. They let their torpedoes fly and broke formation. The enemy ships broke too and began chasing targets. Two against twelve was awful odds, but they had no choice. Two against twelve? The best starfighter pilots in the galaxy charged into the fray. Chapter 38 84. Laker Dright wasn't going to die today. He kept telling himself that as he pulled himself out of the rubble and hurried out of the tunnel, brushing soot and dirt from his clothes the entire time. He wasn't going to die today, not for the CSA, not for the Empire, and certainly not for the Kokal New Republic. As he crawled out into open he was assaulted by the scents and sounds of war. He smelled the smoke and ash and heard people screaming in the distance. The earth seemed to rhythmically shudder under his feet, and when his eyes found the source his jaw dropped and his legs locked in place. A giant at a walker, towering high above the nearby buildings, was making his way through the estate grounds. The twin laser cannons on his chin sprayed out red destruction and tore smoking gashes in buildings. Dright watched the metal monster lurch along until a pair of speeder bikes pilots by white armored scout troopers whipped past overhead and sent him sprawling to the ground in panic. It was shocking, horrible, impossible. War on any IV, garden world of the corporate sector. Prex Gothel had been an idiot to try and drag the CSA out of his peaceful isolation, and Dreit had been an idiot to agree to help. Dreit pushed himself to his feet and ran. That huge star destroyer that had replaced the sky didn't seem to be firing into the energy shield anymore but he didn't hear fighters howling overhead, which probably meant the umbrella was still up. Dright remembered where the shield generator facility was, at the center of the estate, half buried in a protected structure right next to the main tower where they'd been having their stupid conference. Lanchinzor was a fool for not surrendering the rebel leaders immediately and begging the Empire for mercy. It was the only chance he had of getting through this alive. Dright ducked behind the corner of one intact building, made sure no one was coming for him, then reached into his robes and pulled out his last vial of spice. As the ground quaked under the Adat's feet and explosions sent shudders through air, Dright dropped a gel into his mouth and swallowed. He breathed in, breathed out, and felt the spice take effect. Energy shot through his old body. When he stepped out of cover the whole battle scene seemed to play out in ultra-detailed slow motion. He could see every last speeder bike swoop overhead, every last laser streak through the air. The first kick he got from the spice wouldn't last long. He started running. He sprinted down debris choke lanes and made his way toward the tower. The Imperials were all trying to converge on it but progressing slowly. For some reason Lanchinzor's security team had actually decided to put up a fight. When Dright got to the square facing the shield's power generator, secure and innocuous inside a sunken building, he saw one of those other Imperial walkers the smaller two-legged kind, stalking toward the entrance. As he crouched behind the hood of a parked and abandoned land speeder, Dright watched as a pair of speeder bikes mounted by Espo swooped down from above. 
the walker in S Street, that was a fired off chains of laser fire but missed the fast moving targets. One speeder whipped past his flank, as it passed Dright spotted something small and dark spin through the air. A second later, the grenade exploded, tearing an ugly gash in the walker's head. The machine wobbled pathetically on its two spindly legs before falling to the ground. They were fools to put this kind of fight, but brave ones. Dright gathered his waning spice induced strength and ran across the square, skirting around the wreckage of the S Street. He heard laser fire crackle from somewhere and ducked low. When he reached the entrance to the generator building, he threw himself against the doors, which refused to open. Dright swore at himself for an idiot and pounded on the permacrete panels, yelling at anyone inside to let him in. He heard more laser fire, turned, and saw a half dozen stormtroopers charging from the far side of the square. The door opened behind him. A hand grabbed the back of his robe and pulled himself inside. As the door slid shut behind him, he found himself looking into the mirror black visor of an Espo security man with captain's bars on his shoulder. Vice Prex Dright. The man sounded surprised. Where is Vice Prex Lanchenzor? He had no idea and frankly didn't care. He just wanted to get to the generator control room. He spun the question back on the captain. When was the last time you spoke with her? She just arrived at the security center in the tunnels. Then we took a hit and lost outside communication. That was too perfect. She sent me, Dright lied. She wants you to shut down the shield generator and surrender to the Imperials. The captain's eyes were hidden behind his visor but his mouth twisted in a skeptical frown. Are you certain? Sir, the vice prox's last order was to. She couldn't let the rebels know what she was planning, Dright snapped. Now that she got them held secure in the tunnel, she wants you to surrender. She'll give them up to the Imperials in exchange for our safety. The captain still looked skeptical. Dright waved a hand at the doors. Have you seen what's been going on outside, Captain? Your people are being slaughtered in a fight that isn't even theirs. Reluctantly, the captain nodded. All right, come with me, sir. The captain led Dright deeper inside the generator complex. The vice prex was shocked to see entire rooms crammed with dirty, cowering civilians. But of course, the estate had thousands of staff who had even less business in this mess than Dright in the espos. When they reached the generator room, it was fully staffed by security men. As he made his way for the comp station, Dright called, new orders from Lanchenzor. She sent me to tell you, you're to shut down the defensive shield at once. The Espus just looked at him stupidly. It was like they wanted to die for nothing. Shut it down. Dright repeated. Shut it down now. You have your orders. Come, hail that Star Destroyer. The comm officer, at least, knew what was good for him. He called up the destroyer, and that kicked the others into action. As the hum of the generator began to fade, Dright spoke into the speaker grill, saying, Attention Imperials, this is Vice Prex Lanker Dright of the Corporate Sector Authority. We surrender. I repeat, we surrender. We'll hand over the rebels. Just stop shooting at us. Dright leaned over the console, panting and waited for a reply. For a long, awful moment it seemed like the Imperials had ignored his request. He looked over his shoulder and asked, You did kill the shield, didn't you? That's right, said the Espo captain. Then a voice on the comm said, This is Grand Admiral F. Shimakati. Please state your location, Vice Bricks. I'm at the shield generator station at the base of the tower complex. Unnecessarily, he repeated, We surrender. Do you have the rebel leaders with you? No, but I can show you where they're being kept. After a tiny pause, Makati said, A stormtrooper team will be at your location in three minutes. Please provide them everything they ask for. Of course. I'll be right out. Dright turned off the comm and marched back to the Espo leader. You're coming with me, Captain. The captain called in four more Espos, and they followed Dright back to the main entrance. Dright hoped to drop them as soon as he was sure he'd be safe with the stormtroopers. These espos seemed more devoted than most and they might not act rationally when they learned Dright was selling out their boss. When he stepped out onto the square, Dright nearly stopped in his tracks. 
Apparently, a stormtrooper team actually meant two dozen white armored soldiers plus two at STs standing over the still smoking corpse of their brother. Every weapon on every soldier and walker was pointed straight at Lanker Dright. There was one exception. An Imperial officer in a gray uniform stood at the head of the stormtrooper's column with his service pistol still in his holster. He called out, Drop your weapons. All of you. The Espos didn't hesitate to obey. With his hands in the air, Dright walked carefully to the officer and said, I'm the Vice Brex. I can't give you what you need. The officer looked at him skeptically. Were you part of these negotiations with the rebels? I, well, yes, but a minor part. Prex Gothel insisted I take part. It was his idea, and I knew it was a bad one from the start. It wasn't a very good argument. He knew it and so did the officer. As a pair of TIE fighters held overhead, the Imperial said, Can you tell us how to reach the rebels? Oh, yes. They're hiding in a security center beneath the estate. The Prex is with them. How do we get there? Dright had studied Lanchensor's maps. He pointed to a two-story building on the far side of the square. Go in there. You can access the tunnel system. All the passages connect to the security hub. You can't reach the landing complex, anything. We won't be needing hangar access, the officer said smoothly. Dright wondered what he'd meant. Then, as if on cue, he heard a massive explosion from the direction of the hangar. We just need to go into that tunnel. Ask the officer. Assuming it hasn't collapsed, yes. From there it should be easy to find the rebels and all the collaborators. He paused, then added, the major collaborators. My role was minor, I assure you. Very minor. I understand, the officer said, and threw up a hand signal to his stormtroopers. They immediately turned and began to march across the square. Then, before the vice prex could say anything else, the officer took his pistol from his holster and fired one shot into Lanker Dright's chest. Dright fell back and landed face up on the hard ground, but he didn't feel a thing. The pain spreading outward from his torso overwhelmed everything else. Over the empty roar in his ears he could, just vaguely, hear the retreating officer say, try to capture major targets alive. For all minor ones, shoot to kill. Cask Freller and Ryan Darlin bent close over the screen showing steadfast internal schematic. The russet furred Bothan taped a claw and said, we can take this garbage shoot right up to the command tower. It'll be a tight fit, but we can do it. It's going to smell like a Nexus butt, Darlin said. Cask shrugged. At least we won't have to worry about visitors. Plus, it drops us off on the same level as the bridge. Close to Makati, but so far, we can't just walk right in there. I know. But we can try waiting for a lull. Or we can hide in his quarters. They won't find us there. We just have to take out his droid first. And we already figured out how to do that. Daryl and thought it over. Hiding in Makati's place until the battle was over might be the safest way to get to him. But it didn't do anything for Philia, Organa, and all the other brave diplomats and rescue pilots they'd now only put at risk. Darylin couldn't deny the responsibility, he felt. Even now, good Republic people were dying because he'd messed up, and he didn't want any more of them on his conscience. Let's call up Jack and Shodev, said Kask. See where they are. They might be able to help us make a distraction. Hold on. Darylin's eyes narrowed on the schematic. See this? The command tower has a separate atmosphere control system from the rest of the ship. The whole tower's probably set up to operate as a sealed environment separate from the rest of the ship in case of emergencies. I really wish we'd read a manual on empires before getting on this thing. Consider it a crash course. I bet if we busted those things we could take Makati by surprise. They really might. If they hid in the Grand Admiral's cabin they could wait until the Atmos systems were shut down then rush the short length to the bridge while everybody else was dizzy and gasping for breath. We'll need air masks somewhere, he said, though I doubt they'd be fit for Bothans. We'll rig up something. Just find us a storage locker. Okay, fine. I want to call Jack and show Dev and give them a battle plan. It might take them a while to get to the command tower. I just hope they can get up there. 
After we blew the sensor package, they are on the lookout for saboteurs. They'll be fine as long as nobody's taken off helmets, Darylin said, and brought out his comp. He paused before turning it on. All this time they've been talking about getting to the command deck, getting on the bridge, getting to Makati. They never said a thing about getting out. Darylin knew he was being cowardly and sentimental. He should have given up on his own life the moment he stowed away aboard the troop carrier on Bonaden. Still, he couldn't help but wonder what it had been like for Sheer or Koth Melon, the moment when they really knew it was all over. He wondered if it had helped them accept the inevitable. He wondered if they were as scared deep down as he was now. Then he shoved all that stupid stuff down and turned on his comm. You guys reading me? Loud and clear, boss, said Carr. I've got a plan. It's time to do what we came here for. Avin Barus held his breath as all six Rogue Squadron X-Wings dove beneath the belly of the Star Destroyer steadfast. Makati's flagship had stopped firing with its dorsal turbo lasers even before the shield dropped, but it didn't make the narrow space between the Destroyer and the estate grounds below any safer. The Rogues bobbed and weaved around stray blasts from the ties swarming the same space as them while the Imperial forces on the ground began fire skyward at the passing ships. Avin swore as a stray shot from an Adel Walker broke through his shields and skimmed his bottom port as foil. He gripped his control stick hard to steady his trembling ship as they soared out from beneath steadfast and began wheeling around for another run. Look at that hangar down there, Nrin called. The imps busted it wide open. That means our people have no way off the ground, said Zarx. They will once we clear a space for our shuttles to land, said Hobby, though he didn't sound too confident. Suggest we bust open some of those adats, boss, said Felix. The sound of her voice gave him confidence, even now. Agreed, said Avin. Okay, Rouges, called Hobby, split into two formations, and we'll see if we can't clear the ground. Nrin, Felix on me. Avin swung his X wing around to take West Jansen's port side while Zark settled on his left. As they aligned themselves for another run beneath the Star Destroyer, a voice crackled on their overhead comlinks. Hello, hello? Can anyone hear me? Any Republic ship? Please respond. Avin had known that voice since he was a kid. Despite his current status as fighter jock, his father and aunt had both been old Republic senators and ambitious young Leia Organa had been a frequent visitor to the Barus estate. Leia, this is Rue's squadron, Avin called. What's your location? Avin, is that you? We're burrowed safe for now. We heard the hangar's been hit. It's gone, but we've got evac shuttles on the way, Hobby said. Just let us clear you some ground. Any air support is welcome, Rogue Squadron, said another voice, possibly Borsk Felias. Okay, let's gun for it, Hobby called. Jansen, you take the edit at 3 o'clock. I'll take the one at 12. Copy, said Jansen. Avant Zarks, lock your torps and get ready to blow. The edit was hard to miss, even with all the smoke spiraling up from the estate grounds. They were coming at it from behind, thankfully. Avin dropped his reticule on the walker's bulky body and set his torpedoes for double fire. Ties incoming from port, Nrin warned. Get ready to break once you let loose, Hobby said. On my mark. One, two, three, mark. Proton torpedoes shot through the air, and the rogues immediately scattered. A dozen TIE fighters poured sprays of green laser fire, and Avin spotted two torps burst in midair as he veered away. Two TIEs seemed to have gone straight for Jansen, and as all three ships wove and bobbed beneath Steadfast's oppressive bulk, Avin let loose a spray of red laser blasts that clipped one TIE on his solar panel and sent it falling to the ground. The other attempted to flee, but Zark swooped in and nailed it with a laser blast to the cockpit. Thanks for the help, Jansen called as all three X Wings soared out from beneath the destroyer. Javi, you there? Just got one, the other pilot grunted. We busted one of that. Not sure about the other, said Nren. Felis, you there? asked Davin as he scanned the skies. Felis, got two ties on me, the woman cried. Avin's heart leaped in his stomach, and he tried to find her X-Wing. He spotted her and gunned his engines, nearly colliding with an A-Wing flight as it chased a TIE interceptor. 
Phyllis was doing her best to evade as the ties chased her over Eddie IV's rolling fields, but they were still pummeling her aft shields with laser blasts. Avin didn't bother with quad lasers, he waited for his first torque to lock on, and immediately fired. The targeted type broke off Phyllis to evade, but couldn't outrun the torpedo. Avin barely noticed. He switched to laser and began spraying the air around the last tie, but the ship was surprisingly nimble and stayed close to Phyllis through all her turns. Just hold on, Phyllis, called Hobby. I'm the way. This guy's good, boss, Phyllis grunted. Avin was stifling muttered swears as he tried again and again to nail the damn tie. When Hobby got to her, they could catch it in the pincer, but that would take critical seconds, and Phyllis. Phyllis' upper port engine burst into flames. As her X wing started to dip toward the fields below, Avin shouted, Eject! Eject now! I've got it! Her staticky voice cried, I've got it! The tie landed another shot, and her X wing exploded in a ball of tumbling flame. As Hobby caught the tie on his flank and tore apart its solar panel, Avin dived after what was left of Phyllis. For a second, he saw nothing except fire and smoke and knew his world had ended. Then the dark form of her parachute blossomed as her ejection seat, bobbing and twirling in the wind, fell toward the grass. She went EV. Avin called. Phyllis, can you hear us? Is your com on? He got nothing. He tried to swerve close to her parachute to see if she was okay, but the ground was coming up too fast. He pulled away as her seat hit the grass and her parachute spread like a blanket around it. We need to get a team down there, Avin said as he settled on Hobby's wing. She might need medical. Don't worry, I'll call a shuttle down, said Hobby. Keep your head in the fight, Avin. That was easy for him to say. Avin muttered swears as he flew back to meet Jansen and Zarks. We missed that one at that so we're going back for another pass, Jansen called. Get ready, Avin. I'll be fine, he said, knowing he couldn't be. Not until the rescue team called and said Phyllis was okay. But he followed Jansen and Zarks anyway as they turned back, tore steadfast in the battleground beneath it. They dove low over the estate to charge the Adet head on. On Jansen's order, they locked torps and fired. As Avin let us fly, the Adet lifted his face toward them and unleashed a spray of red lasers to catch the torps coming toward it. Two burst into flames, then more lasers cut through the explosions. Avin's mind or reflexes were too slow, the shots ripped through the nose of his X wing and sent him tumbling. Avin heard Jansen shouting for him to eject, but the ground was coming too fast. As a torp slipped through and blew the head off the at, his X wing screamed past. He tried to aim for a street, a square, some open space. Then his S foil clipped the side of a building and sent him spinning. His head knocked hard against the side of his cockpit, and that was all. Both of that's down. Was Jansen's voice crackled over the comlink in the small subterranean security center Vice Prex Lanchons or had herded them into? Good job, rogues, Leia congratulated. But what happened to Avin? Was he hit? That walker took his nose off. He went down too. Leia had known Avin since their fathers were friends in the old Senate. Did he eject? Is he okay? Not sure. He went down. Still getting a beacon. Looks like he went crashed on the north end of the main promenade. The imps will get to him fast there, muttered Winter at Leia's side. Leia looked over to Lanchinzor, who was talking to two of her espos. We have a pilot down. He needs recovery. We're in no situation to mount rescue missions, the old woman said sternly. Maybe when your people come. We don't have time for that, Leia insisted and picked up one of the blaster rifles on the central table. The security station, thankfully, had been well stocked with arms of all kinds. Princess, Philia snapped. What do you think you're doing? You can't go out there. Avin is down. He's a soldier who knew his duty. You're too important to risk. He's right, Princess, Tresk Emil said firmly. Leia looked to Winter for support. The other woman pursed her lips but said nothing. She didn't know what to say. Before Leia could come up with some response, the door to the north tunnel branch slid open. Leia turned 
expecting more espos. Instead, stormtrooper armor gleamed in the dim light. Surrender, the lead trooper called. Leia raised her rifle and shot off the first reply. As the soldier in the doorway was knocked back more surged to replace him. The cramped chamber was suddenly filled with laser fire as Lanchansor's espas pushed forward to combat the Imperials and cover their boss's escape down the south tunnel. Leia and Winter grabbed blasters and fell in after them. After reaching the security station, both of them had torn the long skirts off their gowns for better movement, figuring the Republic could eat the wardrobe cost if it kept them alive. Philia and the other diplomats followed Lanchansor, and Gothel got to the south door. It took the vice Brex a few long seconds to punch in the code that would open the door. It slid open before her and she took one step into the dark. Then a stray red laser blast took her in the head. Leia gasped and rushed to her side as lanterns were dropped, but when she got there it was clear the woman was dead. A hand grabbed her shoulder and she looked up at Philia. We have to leave her, the Bothan said. Canines bared. Guards, with us. Now. As Philia led the party down the south tunnel, Leia grabbed the nearest espo and said, We have grenades, don't we? Thermal detonators. The man pulled a sphere off his belt and nodded. Wait until we're all out. Then bring this thing down on top of them, Leia said. Then added, But make sure you get out too. That was the plan, the espo said. Then pulled himself away. Leia watched his back as he ran to help the other security guards hold back the stormtroopers for a little longer. She wondered why they did it, if they had anything to gain except death. Then another hand took her winters. Her friend pulled her up the tunnel, toward whatever daylight entrance lay ahead. After less than a minute of running, the whole tunnel shook, and Leia could hear broken rock and muffled cries far behind them. A few espos managed to catch up with them before they made it out. The air reeked of smoke, and ozone and ties roared overhead beneath steadfast suppressive bulk but, at least in this alley they surfaced and there were no walkers bearing down on them. What happens now? One of the espos asked as they crowded into the alley. He was looking at Gothel and Malordican but neither of them seemed to have any idea. Leia checked the charge on her blaster rifle and said, We've got a pilot down. We need to get him. Leia, don't be a fool. His Philia. Stay here if you want, Leia said, but he needs our help. She turned and marched for the alley mouth. Winter was right behind her, of course. She dared look back when she stepped into the street, Winter behind her, and no one else. It didn't matter. Together, they set off into the battlefield. Darylin was so happy to get out of that waste shaft that he didn't bother to make sure the path was clear before he rolled out onto the maintenance hallway. It was, thankfully, very empty, and if the schematics he pounded into his head were right, they should be very close to the command deck and the Grand Admiral's cabin. Cask was right behind him. The two Bothans crouched on the floor and stayed there. This hallway had no security cameras and the adjoining passageway at the far end didn't seem to have any foot traffic. They moved without words. They clutched the small pistols they'd stolen from the storage locker and made their way to the end of the corridor, then made a right. There was a doorway on the far end, and on the other side of that door was the hallway to Grand Admiral Makati's quarters. Unfortunately, there was no way of knowing if anyone was on the other side of the door. They crept up to the frame and placed themselves on either side. Cask punched the controls. The door slid open. No one walked through. Darylin, still crouched low, peeked his head through the gap. His heart skipped a beat when he saw a moving body, but the officer had his back turned and was walking away. He waved Cass through the door. As it slid shut behind him they crept along silently, a safe distance from the officer, and waited until he turned a corner and disappeared. Darylin stood in front of the Grand Admiral's door and began working the lock. Cass stayed down, clutching his pistol with both hands, ears pricked up to listen, but no one else came. Darylin's heart was pounding in his chest but his mind was clear. It took him less than a minute to override the lock security sequence. He kicked Cass gently with the heel of his boot, warning the other Bothan to be ready. 
He watched from the corner of his eyes as Cask pocketed his pistol and took out the magnetic ion charge clamp they'd also taken from the storage room. Then he opened the door. Cask planted one paw on the floor and pushed himself feet first through the threshold. He landed in a crouch, pivoted to his right, and threw the magnetic clamp with the same impossible speed he threw his needles. It hit Makati's droid square in the chest and immediately discharged its stored ion energy, overloading the machine's circuits and freezing it in place. As Darylin closed the door behind them, he noticed with a start that the blaster cannon in the droid's arm had already halfway extended. Nice throw, he whispered. Thanks. Cask popped to his feet. The Grand Admiral's quarters weren't large, and it took them under a minute to search the place and make sure there were no other guests. They went back into the main room and looked at the droid, frozen like a metal statue right before it could fire a killing shot. Darylin asked, how long is he disabled for again? Don't know, but that charge should keep it out for at least an hour. You're sure about that? Pretty sure. Okay. Well, if you don't mind, I'm not going to try walking in front of it anytime soon. Yeah. Me neither. You want to call Jack? Sure thing. Darylin took out his comlink and turned it on. How's it coming, guys? On our way up now, Carr said. Had to do a little smooth talking to a security team, but we're good. Darylin chose to take Carr's word on that. We're up in the Grand Admiral's personal quarters now. Sounds fancy, commented Ekrahim. For the first time, Darylin really looked at the cabin around him. It was, if anything, rather drab and plain, without any shows of luxury. The only personal touch he saw was a series of two-dimensional pictures framed on the far wall. Listen, he said, we'll camp here until you guys get in position. Sound good? Sounds good? Talk to you soon. Say, 20 minutes. Darylin pocketed his link and turned to Cask. Well, all we have to do now is hope the Grand Admiral doesn't take a nap in the next hour. I doubt that'll be a problem. Well, then I hope he doesn't call his droid, Darylin said, then took a wary step away from the thing. You're sure it doesn't wake up for at least an hour? It shouldn't, but I can't say for sure. Somebody's clearly done modifications on that thing. Darylin was tempted to just shoot the machine in the back of the head and fry it for good. Then he had a better idea. We've got 20 minutes, he told Cask. That should be enough time. I want to try something. The arrival of Vengeance had immediately turned the Battle of Eddie IV on his head. Within minutes, the Mon Calamari cruiser Mon Remora had been destroyed. Mon Delindo, Mon Maria, and their support ships were scrambling to escape from the massive Superstar Destroyer, but they refrained from jumping to hyperspace, knowing that if they did, Emancipator and the rebel leaders on the planet were doomed. The remaining two Mon Cal ships split in different directions and tried to run. Vengeance's sole supporting Star Destroyer tried to keep Mon Delindo pent against the planet while Vengeance herself went after Mon Maria. Two assault frigates and a bulk cruiser stayed behind Mon Maria to cover his retreat, but against Vengeance's overwhelming firepower, little could be done. All three died quickly, leaving Mon Maria alone to flee. Vengeance creaked after it, pounding his aft shields with long range turbo laser fire as it climbed away from Eddie IB's orbit and outside his gravity well. That was the situation when Garm Bell Iblis arrived. His reconnaissance ships at the edge of the system had been watching the battle for hours. At the beginning, it looked as though Admiral Burke's forces held a significant advantage and wouldn't even need any help. Then vengeance had come, and the situation suddenly became hopeless. Strangely enough, that was what made Garm Bell Iblis consider jumping his fleet in. He'd made a career in hopeless battles. But that career hadn't lasted 30 years because he'd charged stupidly into every fight. So he watched, and waited, and finally he told his crew to jump. They dropped out of hyperspace right on top of Vengeance. Six Rindy Dreadnoughts and a single Venator class Star Destroyer. They were all vintage warships, from the Clone Wars or earlier, but their weapons had been newly refitted and their crews knew how to fight. On Bell Iblis order, they opened fires one. As he stood on the bridge of his star destroyer Fangzar, Bell Iblis watched the initial missile volleys tear through the super star destroyer's unshielded starboard flank. 
black durasteel ruptures and debris and flame poured out into space. The two foremost dreadnoughts, Harrier and Peregrine, bombarded the closest line of missile launchers before the Imperials could return fire. When the launcher's magazines detonated, the explosion poured so much debris into space that the dreadnoughts had to pull back from getting torn up by shrapnel. General, is working. Cena Leek Vold Medano said excitedly at his side we've taken out their starboard shields. What about Mon Maria? She's holding position, sir. Then calm her and tell her to join the fight if she can. Tell Helm to take us around. All ships hold tight to their starboard side so they can't bring their other turbolacers to bear. When I say tight, I mean as close as possible. Understood. Our next target. Do they have shields up around their bridge? They do, sir. Well, they won't have them for long. Tell all ships to converge on the command station. We've got a super star destroyer to kill. Chapter 39. Oran 3. As he dove into Oran 3's atmosphere, Soon Terfell dropped himself on the rear of two iron fighters. He popped off a torpedo, his second of the fight. Its target peeled off to evade and dropped chaff behind it. The torp flew into the chaff and exploded, filling Fell's view with a fireball. He accelerated, made sure his forward shields were on full, and speared through the debris, firing madly ahead as he did. He caught the iron by surprise. Laser blast punctured his bubble cockpit and the fighter began tumbling to the endless fields below. One more down, he called. Fell couldn't spare a look at his scanner to see where Wedge was or how he was doing, as he dropped on the trail of the last remaining iron. laser blast began to whip past his cockpit and shudder against his shields. A Clone Wars vintage P-38 flying wing had dropped behind him. It was a heavy hitter but sluggish. Fell pulled himself into a steep climb toward the stars shining bright in the twilight sky. The art raced free ahead, but Fell kept climbing, and the P-38 strained to follow. G-forces pinned him to his cockpit chair and made it hard to breathe. Just as his vision stared to fog, Fell killed his engines. His X-wing plunged butt first toward the planet. The P-38 shot ahead. Without waiting for a lock, Fell sent on more torp up like a flare. The P-38 flew straight into it and exploded brilliantly. Fell flipped around with his direction repulsors, nose over tail, and when he leveled out he fired his engines again. For the moment nobody was firing at him and he checked his scanners, which was down below, picking off an old R-41 Star Chaser as he tried to keep close behind the Marauder Corvette that was still diving toward the surface along with the Y-Wing two-seater on each flank. The ire that Fell had been chasing was going after Wedge as was the other Z-95 headhunter. Fell dove after them. As Wedge shot down the Star Chaser, he popped off another torp for good measure, which shot straight toward the Corvette and impacted on his shields. Wedge broke off pursuit before the headhunter and Iyer could fire on him. The two snub fighters followed, and the headhunter edged into Fell's torpedo range. He let another warhead fly, but before he could watch it, his shield shuddered with more laser blasts. He cursed and dropped into an evasive roll. Coming from his aft port were two T-wing interceptors. Lightly shielded and not well armed, they were nonetheless fast and nimble dogfighters. Fell cut his engines again and dropped altitude but they stayed on him. Another round of lasers cut through his shields. His X-wing shuddered and his R2 unit wailed alarm, telling him his upper port thrust engine was on fire. He shut off power to the engine and tried to compensate though he knew his maneuvers would be sluggish. One T-wing popped off a missile and Fell immediately released a chaff plume. The chaff caught the missile, but the concussion force still rippled through the atmosphere, and his R2 unit told him his upper starboard engine was failing too. He couldn't win a dogfight with only two engines. Fell swung his shuddering fighter around in a series of scissor maneuvers, alternately killing and gunning his thrusters in the hopes of dropping behind one of both of the T-wings all the while he fell closer and closer to the surface. Suddenly Wedge called, Soontir, break port. Fell did just that. A streak of laser blast cut right over his head, then caught the lead T-Wing in the port engine nacelles. As the T-Wing struggled, Wedge bore down on it, firing another volley that caught his nose and sent it into a spin. The second T-Wing tried to evade his falling partner. Fell completed a sharp turn, 
and cut in from the side. The Tiwin veered sharply up to avoid his volley and collided with the other fighter. The two T-wings exploded spectacularly, leaving Wedge and fell to soar wing to wing away. There was no time to celebrate. The Corvette was almost at his target and Fell did his best to keep up with Wedge as his second thruster started to fail. Soon, Tear. Can you handle it? Wedge called. I'll be fine. He snapped. We have to shoot it down. Or at least cripple it, Wedge added. See up ahead. Those Y-wings are dropping behind to cover it. Arm your torps and blow them away. Sounds like a plan. It felt strange to be flying against Y-wings again. He hadn't done that since Brintal, when he dropped his guard and the direct gunner and General Sam's backseat had nailed him with an ion blast and ended his imperial career. He wouldn't make the same mistake twice. He and Wedge kept bobbing and weaving best they could, evading the fire the Y-wings were sowing back at them. Fell released one torpedo. The Y-wing released chaff to catch it. As the resultant explosion buffeted the Y-Wings aft, Fell gave his engines one last kick and nailed the Y-Wings port engine pylon with a hail of lasers. The pylon exploded and the Y-Wing tumbled to the fields below. I got mine. Fell called. Do you have yours? We're good. Wedge called, and he dropped directly behind the Corvette. Let's knock this thing out of the sky. Fell cut speed to join Wedge behind the Corvette and his second engine exploded. He shook so violently only his crash weapon kept his helmet from being cracked on the side of his cockpit. Wedge was shouting something, he wasn't sure what. Fell killed all power to his topside engines and tried to level it out. His fighter steadied enough for him to see the Corvette glowing ahead, the fields below, Wedge on his way. Then he heard his brother-in-law shouting, soon tear, evade, evade. One more snub fighter, an old V-wing fell from the sky, weapons blazing. Fell's R2 unit let out a dying wail. Another engine exploded as his fighter fell. Should have kept count, he thought, dumbfounded. Then his hand found the new, familiar feeling of his ejection lever. He didn't have time to think. He pulled, and his cockpit roof exploded away. He shot into the sky, and for a moment it felt just like he was floating in space like at Bandomir. Then the planet below took over, and he fell. Sial and Tilly's fell watched as the Marauder Corvette sailed low over their compound. Together with Larone and his men, she'd been standing outside, watching the fight in the long twilight above. Mark Ross had received a call saying that their pickup team was on the way, but what they saw wasn't what any of them had been expecting. The Corvette was being chased by two snub fighters, and a third fighter had dived down and shot down one of the pursuers. The second pursuer had popped off a torpedo that exploded the Corvette's aft right engine, and instead of setting down in the field near their hilltop at Kareen passed, trail in smoke, while two remaining snub fighters dueled overhead. I'm going to grab that old speeder in the garage, Brightwater said. I want to check that crash site. Do you think the pilot ejected? Asked Quiller. I saw a shoot. Brightwater tapped the built-in macro binoculars of his scout trooper helmet. Grave had his own pair of binoculars and brought them to his eyes as he scanned the dogfight above them. One of those ships looks like an X-Wing. An X-Wing? Asked Sial. The craft immediately made her think of her brother. As Brightwater dashed off for his speeder, Mark Ross asked, What about the Marauder? Grave turned around and tracked the Corvette. Looks like it's setting down. I see smoke from the engines. Sial hugged herself tightly. Are any of these ships your commanders? An awkward silence passed between them. Larone said, Mark Ross, try making a call. See if they can tell us what the cark is going on. Gladly, Mark Ross hobbled eagerly into the communication shed. Just as he disappeared, an explosion boomed high above them. They all looked up to see one starfighter tumbling from the sky while the other, the one with an X-Wing's bottom profile, soared away. For a second it looked like the crashing ship would fall into the nearby fields. Then Sial realized it might fall closer. Oh, fear feck, Quiller barked. Take cover. Lerone jumped into the communications bunker. Grave, the further away, hesitated, 
and ran for the cover of the garage. Quiller went after Lerone and Sial, too, hesitated for a long awful moment before running after Grave as fast as she could. She'd expected the starfighter to fall on the compound like a fiery comet. Instead, it fell in pieces. Chunks of shrapnel tore chunk out of buildings. Durasteel shards clattered like knives around her. She couldn't keep from screaming. Somewhere something big hit the ground and exploded. The entire compound washed over with heat. Sial fled the compound edge, hands over his head and neck. She got to the rim of the hilltop when she dared turn back and look at the damage the crashing fighter had wrought. She saw smoke and fire, but in the dim light they were stuck in, she had a hard time telling anything else. Then she saw something above the compound, three forward lights on the wingtips of yet another approaching ship. Something else exploded in the compound, and she panicked. Cradling her stomach in both hands, she stumbled down the hill and into the grass. There was no obvious place to land, so Wedge shut down his thrust engines, closed his S-foils, and lowered his X-wing into the middle of the field. The tall wheat grass was blown outward by his repulsors and crunched beneath his landing gear. He quickly opened the cockpit, pulled off his helmet, and jumped to the ground. He had no idea where Fell was. He only knew that the V-wing he'd been fighting had crashed into the compound that sat like an island in the middle of the fields, and if Sial was anywhere, it had to be there. If he'd killed her by accident when he downed the V-wing, which cursed himself and his thoughts, there was only one way to find out and there was no point in panicking until he learned the truth. He took out his service pistol, made sure it had a good charge, and began pushing his way through the grass toward the compound smoke signal. He only got a few steps into the grass before he stopped. He held his breath and listened. On a world like this, there was no background noise of speeder traffic or chattering people or distant starship engines. Aside from the low crackling of fire at the compound, there was no sound at all. There wasn't even wind to stir the grass. He heard a cracking sound and the shifting of wheat stalks as a body passed through. He spun to face the direction of the sound and raised his pistol. He paused, listened. There was no sound, and for a second he thought he'd just imagined it. Then he heard the crack of a stem underfoot and called, Halt. Don't move. He heard more rustling, but no footsteps. He lowered his voice, tried not to sound panicked, and said, Step toward my voice. Do it slowly. Come on. He heard footsteps and saw wheat heads shift ahead of him. Suddenly a woman stepped into view right in front of him. She had short-cut dark hair and a tired expression. With both hands, she cradled the pregnant swell of her stomach. She squinted to see him in the gloom. Her voice shook in disbelief as she said, Wedge, is that you? He remembered that voice. After 20 years, he'd barely remembered what she looked like, but the voice was unchanged. He dropped his gun to his side and stepped close. He put a hand on her shoulder, squeezed it tight, assured himself it was really his sister and that he wasn't going mad. Oh, Sial, he breathed, it is you. It's really you. Wedge, she muttered, and let her face fall against his shoulder. He snaked both hands around to touch her back. His body shook with something, laughter or tears, he wasn't sure. Sial clasped him around his waist and muttered, Oh, Wedge, I don't believe this. This has to be a dream. No. No, it's not a dream. He pushed her away and looked into her eyes. He remembered that blue too. I came here with Suntir. Suntir. Her eyes widened. Was he shot down? Yes, but he ejected. We have to find him. I know. We'll get him, sigh all, I promise, and then. He had no idea what happened then. None at all. They couldn't fit three people in one X-wing and he had no idea what was going on with the Marauder Corvette, or that escort shuttle, or the people who'd been holding her captive. It was the stuff he should have thought of before he jumped after fell to Oron 3, but it was too late to change that now. Come on, Wedge, she took his hand. We have to get back to the compound. The compound. I ran after the crash. I was scared. But we have to get back there. They might be. The people who captured you. He gaped. Sial, we have to get away from them. 
No witch, you don't understand. She tugged his hand again. Of course I understand. Sayal, those are Isert's people. For a second she looked confused. Then she shook her head and insisted, I don't know it all myself, Wedge, but it's okay. I don't have to be afraid of them. Before Wedge could respond, he heard the sound of another body moving through the field. No, multiple bodies. He pulled Sayal close to him and raised his weapon. It sounded like they were coming from everywhere at once. Then a voice said behind him, Drop the gun, flyboy. He froze. He didn't do anything until he felt the cold tip of a blaster muzzle on the back of his head. Then, finally, he dropped his pistol. To his amazement, the blaster arrested his fallen midair. Then it jumped up over Wedge's head. Still holding Sile's hand, he turned around, slowly, to see his own gun level straight at him. The man holding it had a second gun in his other hand. A horizontal scar cut below his right eye, and his grin was like a knife slash. Sial, Wedge breathed. I, I don't know him, her voice trembled. I wouldn't expect you to, but I do know you, darling. No offense, but I like the old haircut. The scarred man's dark eyes flitted to Wedge. And you, you look familiar, maybe it's just the flight suit. Wedge waited and said nothing, but it didn't help. The man's grin got even bigger, and he said, Oh, I can't believe this. Wedge Antilles, rebel war hero in the flesh. They pulled out all the stops for this rescue mission, didn't they? He lowered Wedge's gun to his side, but kept his own hefty. This is amazing. She's going to love my present. You're never taking us to Isert, Wedge hissed. Isert. The scarred man laughed. Isert can go suck vacuum. You can look forward to your new master, Captain Leonia Tavira. Fell woke up with a stab of pain and a shout. His limbs spasmed, one hand slapped to the source of pain in his neck. His palms slapped only flesh. His eyes popped open, and he found himself staring upward at a cloudless violet sky rising past the tall heads of moitenless wheat stalks. His limbs dropped to the dirt but kept rattling with tiny trembles. Someone had injected him with raw adrenaline. At least you're awake, a voice said. Fell rolled his head one side and saw a faceless white stormtrooper helmet staring back at him. He jerked upright but a pair of hands pinned his shoulders to the ground. Another head appeared over him, this one hidden by a scout trooper's mask. Where is she? Fell barked. Where is my wife? It really is you, said another voice. This one sounded faintly amused. A man crouched over him, blocking out the sky. This one had no helmet on. Fell recognized his face as that of the man in the recording that had called him here. One arm jumped out for the man's throat. The scout trooper wrestled it down. Listen, we're not your enemy, the maskless man insisted. Fell wheezed, where is? Sayal. Graves looking for her now, said the one in the storm trooper helmet. The scout said, she ran when that V-wing crashed down, but we'll find her. Don't worry. Fell's mind flicked back to the fight over the field. What happened to the Corvette? Where's he almost said Sayal's brother, but the less his captors knew the better. The X-Wing knocked the Corvette down. It had to land, said the one without a helmet. Hopefully it stays down. That ship, not Isers. I don't think so. And we're not Isers either. Who then? Zinch. Teradoc. The man gave a long, long sigh. I was hoping to have this conversation in different circumstances. Hey, said the one with the stormy helmet. Just got a call from Mark Ross. He says the Admiral's got our location and he's on his way. At least we've got a way off this rock, said the scout trooper. Come on, let's get the flyboy on his feet. The scout and the stormtrooper took him by the shoulders and hoisted him up. His legs were still trembling and he had to grab onto their arms to keep from falling. Now that he was upright, he could look above the top of the grass and saw the stout hill not far away. Smoke was rising, and from the flickering light, there were still fires burning there, too. The V-Wing, Fell asked. That's right, said the one without a mask. And the other X-Wing. Think it landed over by the Corvette, I'm not sure. We've got incoming, announced the scout. He stabbed his free hand toward the sky, 
and fell following it to see the three forward-facing one mounted light emplacements of a JV-7 escort shuttle. You should be honored, Baron, the stormtrooper said. He came down here for you personally. He, not Isard, but that didn't make Fell feel better. He rasped. His captors gave no response. The shuttle sat down at the base of the hill and dimmed its forward lights. The troopers have dragged Fell up to the ship. One of their own, a man leaning against a metal crutch, waved, and the one without a helmet waved back. The landing ramp lowered and two more storm troopers walked down. Then, inexplicably, came two beings with their faces hidden by woven brown robes. They were far too short to be human, but Fell could tell nothing else about them. Then, finally, came a human in the white uniform and gold epaulets of an Imperial Grand Admiral. But as he stepped closer, Fell saw that he wasn't human at all. His skin was tinted blue, and his eyes were red and glowing. He took Fell's breath away. He'd seen that man once before, a long time ago, and it had planted the first seeds of doubt about the Empire's noble mission. In time, those doubts had flowered into a complete defection to the Rebel Alliance. He'd never even heard the man speak, but he'd already changed Sunter Fey's life forever. Hello, Baron Fell, the alien said. My name is Grand Admiral Thrawn, and we have much to talk about. Another volley of turbolaser fire collided with Grey Wolf's rear shields. The deck shook under Nerys's feet, but the shields held. Nvidia still hasn't launched any fighters, Lieutenant Vredon reported. I don't understand, sir. We should count ourselves lucky they're having problems, Nerys breathed. Right now that Star Destroyer was doing nothing more than nibble on their heels. The real threat lay dead ahead. Grand Admiral Grant had turned Oriflam, so that one broadside faced Grey Wolf and the other Corvus. The Interdictor, while still keeping his gravity wells, had begun a retreat toward Orin III. Grant, in turn, was given chase while at the same time positioning himself to absorb attacks from Grey Wolf's forward guns. At the same time, he launched his full wing of snub fighters that were tangling with Grey Wolf's own and providing Invidious with the badly needed fighter screen. All in all, Grant's defenses were spread too thin trying to protect two ships. Nearest saw his advantage. He knew what Thrawn would have done with it. He told Vredin, launch the missile boats. Send two squads of Ties as escorts and a squad of Starwings behind them. Vredin had been with them on the hunt for Zarin. He knew Nearest's approach. Very good, sir. I'll handle it. Nearest turned away from the viewport and went over to the tactical station. He settled on the inside shoulder and asked, Any movement on the planet yet? Nothing we can see, she replied. There'd been no comm signals either. Nearest had been hoping Thrawn would be able to swoop down, grab Fell and Starflare, and call a retreat. The moment he'd seen that Marauder Corvette sneak in the landing, he knew things wouldn't be that easy. He watched the tactical holo and saw a dozen missile boats and a dozen XG-1 Starwings drop out of Grey Wolf's hangar. They ignored Invidious and cut a straight line for Grant's Star Destroyer. Nearest was under no illusions. It would be a master stroke of luck to best a true Grand Admiral in battle. The job Thrawn had given him was to hold, and he intended to do that as long as he could, as best as he was able. Grant was sure he'd worked with less competent partners in battle before, but none sprung to mind right now. Tavira's captured Star Destroyer was good enough at harassing Thrawn's rear and keeping him distracted, but without a fighter screen of her own, she was forcing Grant to spread his own ship's too thin. Thrawn was no fool. He saw exactly what the other Grand Admiral's weakness was. Grant watched on the tactical holo as new ships dropped out of Grey Wolf's hangar. Sir, those new ships, the tactical officer began, then trailed off in confusion. Well, Lieutenant. Sir, we're picking up two dozen ships. Half our XU-1 Starwing fighters. The others, they look like they're using Starwing frames, but the computer can't identify them. Grant didn't need to know more. He studied Thrawn's reports on his hunt for Zarin and knew the alien was going to try and use custom-made missile boats loaded with high-yield anti-starfighter projectiles to rip apart Grant's already thin fighter screen. With that gone, the Starwings would swoop in and break his shields open their own warheads. 
Thankfully, Grant had researched these vessels and he knew what to do. Captain Bremel, he called across the bridge, have both TIE interceptor squads form on our starboard flank. Tell them to hold position but get ready to charge the attacking ships. While Bremel carried out the order promptly, Grant walked over to the crew pit and bent low over the sensor control section. He called the lieutenant over and said, I want you to begin running a reverse loop through our electronic tracking system. I want you to connect the sensor feed to our comm transmission systems and use their hardware to broadcast. Can you do that? The lieutenant frowned. We need comm to shut down their own systems, otherwise they might get fried by the feedback. Don't worry, they will. Sir, if we do that, every sensor on on this ship will be useless. We'll muck up the tracers on every ship nearby. The gunnery computers then. We won't need them. Our targets are within visual range. But the starfighters. They can't shoot with their eyes too. How fast can you do it? The lieutenant swallowed. Five minutes. Maybe six. Grant glanced to the viewport. He couldn't see those missile boats with his naked eyes, but they were coming. Do it in four, lieutenant. Hurry. Grant hurried too. He went to the comm station and told them, without explanation, to perform an emergency shutdown on all systems. Then he went to tactical and relayed an order to all fighter pilots, shut off your targeting computers and prepare to shoot manually. To the interceptor pilots, he gave a simple order, fire after the enemy releases payloads. Not 20 seconds after the sensor lieutenant said he was ready to start the loop, Tactical reported that the missile boats had just launched warheads that were tracking the interceptors. Grant snapped his fingers. The tactical crew let out a surprised yelp as their holo dissolved in a blur of static. Grant stalked over to the front viewport, so close he pressed both hands against the cold transparent steel. He watched as the cluster missiles suddenly lost direction, their guidance systems jammed. Exhaust trails became a tangled web and the web lit up with explosions as the missiles collided. The TIE interceptors charged and threw the flame. Some hit debris and exploded themselves, but more charged through and tore the surprised missile boats to pieces. The Starwings behind them attempted to scatter but the interceptors fell on them as well. Another squadron of TIE fighters, seeing the opportunity, rushed in without waiting for orders and helped ravage the Starwings and missile boats before they could make any attack run on Oriflam. Excellent, excellent. Grant called. Sensors, shut down that loop. Come, prepare to start up again. The crew moved quickly and confidently. The tactical holo blazed back to life, and the comms came on again. Grant watched as Thrawn's scattered attack craft retreated to their home vessel to prepare for some other attack. Sir, Captain Brimmel said, we've just got a comm signal. Our team is getting ready to land on Oron 3. It was about time. The moment Tavia had revealed her little sleight of hand, Grant had ordered a transport full of his best stormtroopers to get to Oron 3 as fast as possible, even if it meant trudging through most of the system at sublight speed. He only hoped they weren't too late. Grant acknowledged the news with a nod, then walked back to the crew pit. Helm, he said, bring us closer to Grey Wolf. The lieutenant looked up. What about the interdictor? It won't run far. The main threat right now is that Star Destroyer. He spun around and marched over to the comm station. Someone get me a line to Invidious. Let's see if that tart is willing to pull her weight in this fight. A pair of scowling Nikto were waiting for Wedge and Sial at the base of the Corvette's lowered landing ramp. Their captor, who'd introduced himself as Van Tarek on the way, walked them up the ramp and gunpoint straight into the Corvette's main cargo hold. The Nikto placed a pair of metal chairs in the middle of the half-empty chamber and tied Wedge and Sial to their seats by the wrists and legs. Once they were bound, Tyrick looked down on them with a condescending smile and tapped the flat side of his curved vibro knife against his palm. Thanks to your good shooting, rogue leader, we've got some repairs to make before we take off. But rest assured, friend, it won't be long. What does Tavira want with us? Asked Wedge. Sayal shot him another questioning look. She still had no idea who Leonia Tavira was, and Wedge was in no hurry to cure his sister's ignorance. What wouldn't she want you for? Tarek shrugged. 
My guess is she'll sell you both to the highest bidder. She does love making men compete for her affection, you know. He sighed. If only Baron Fell were here. Then we'd have a complete package. But having Wedge and Tilly's, well, that's still a pleasant surprise. Wedge clamped his jaw shut. So did Sial. Tyrick looked at them both with a curious expression and asked, Tell me, who was in that other X-Wing? They didn't respond. Tyrick bit close and looked Wedge in the eye. Who was it? Another rogue. Wedge put on a sneer. What does it matter? He's dead. Tyrak's eyes passed to Sial. A smile played on his pale lips. He stepped around to the side of her chair and crouched at her side. What are you doing? She asked, voice shaking. I asked a question. You know the answer. I can't feel it. You're wrong. Tyrick extended two fingers and placed them on Sile's forehead. He closed his eyes as though concentrating, and she gave a tiny gasp. What's happening? Wedge asked, Sile, is he hurting you? As soon as he said his sister's name, he regretted it. Tyrak's eyes opened. Hmm. So why is the star flare was a stage name? I should have seen that coming. The real question is how do you know her real name, Rogue Leader? Wedge tried to think of an answer for that. He couldn't come up with anything. Tyrick tapped Sayal's forward again and closed his eyes. Do you know Rogue Leader, Sayal? He hummed. In and no, Sayal stuttered. I haven't seen him in and. Tyrick hummed again. Years. Many years, but you have seen him. What are you, a Jedi? Wedge hissed. Tyrick opened his eyes again. You know, you're the second person to ask me that today. The full answer is long and not actually interesting. So I'll just say no. I do have some tricks, though. Stop it, Sial winced. Whatever you're doing, just stop it. You'd be smart not to fight. The last person who tried it made me fry his brain. Tyrick closed his eyes again. Ah, I get it now, he chuckled and shook his head. Well, that does explain things. Not what I expected, but it does work. Say it for me, Sial. Say your real name, the one you were born with. She squeezed her eyes shut. Her lips trembled. Tyrick said again, say your name. Say it. Antilles, she breathed. Sial, Antilles, fell. And the Baron, was he in that X-Wing? Stop it. Wedge barked. You will hurt her. Baron Fell is out there, isn't he? Isn't he? Yes. Yes. He bailed before he went down. Just let her go. Tyrick pulled his fingers away. Sial slumped in her chair, eyes closed, breathing hard. Tyrick stood up and looked over his shoulder at the two Nikto. Get the rest of your clan in the ready room, he said. I have a very important mission for you. The Nikto ducked down the hallway. Tyrick looked back at Sial and Wedge, smiled again, and said, Hold on. We'll have you all together soon. A nice family reunion. He stuck that curved knife back in his belt and followed the Nikto down the hall. For a moment, it seemed like the whole room was empty. Wedge strained in his chair to look behind him and saw a pair of Grand leaning against the back wall. Both were looking at him with bored expressions, as though the scene they just witnessed wasn't out of the ordinary. Maybe it really hadn't been? Wedge bent as close to his sister as he could and said, Sial, are you okay? Sial. She raised her head with effort. What, what was he doing? He had some kind of force powers. I told him about us, about Sumtir. He made you? You couldn't help it, Wedge said, then amended and I was the one who told him about Soontir. I'm so sorry. It's okay, Wedge. She sniffed and looked at him with sunken, tired eyes. Oh, Wedge, I'm so sorry. This is my fault. I should have seen him coming. I should have. Wedge I shall have never left. I shouldn't have waited so long, too. They both stopped and stared. Then a tired smile slanted on Sile's face, and she started laughing. Oh, Wedge, she sniffed. I can't believe you're here. Somehow, Wedge couldn't believe he'd been anywhere else. He thought of everything that had happened since Sial left Corellia 20 years ago, his parents' death, 
his smuggler days with Booster and Merrix, his first fights with the Rebel Alliance, running the Death Star, forming Rouge Squadron. All of it felt remarkably small as he sat here next to his sister again. Seeing Sayal in the flesh, even as she was now, brought new life to all the old childhood memories, which in turn made the present feel richer. When he looked at Sayal, it was like he was seeing his own beginning and end, the thing that made a circle whole and encompass everything else. He looked at her stomach. Not much longer, is it? She shook her head. Do you have a name? Not yet. I don't even know if it's boy or girl. I was, waiting for Suntir. You should name it after our mom or dad. Suntir already said if it's a girl he wanted to name it for his grandmother. Then if it's a boy, name it after our father. I'd love to teach a jagged fell how to fly. She laughed lightly. I'd be happy to let you, F. We're going to get out of here, he told her. We're going to get fell, and we'll run. We'll go the New Republic. Which, I. We can do it, Sayal. We'll escape, and you can meet everyone Tycho, Hobby, Jansen, all the rogues. And Winter, and Leia, and everyone. I want you to meet them. I want. He trailed off. He wanted to show her his whole life, all she'd missed out on, and even though they were trapped here, he couldn't believe it could end any other way. He found Sayal again after coming this far. Nothing could snuff out the optimism burning deep inside when he looked in his sister's eyes. Oh, Wedge, she smiled a soft, sad smile. We've missed so much. I. There was a clatter of footsteps, and six Nikto with rifles walked across the hold for the loading ramp. Tyrik was right behind them, but instead of leaving he marched to the captives. They'll have the Baron here in a minute, Tyrik said cheerily. But first, I'm going to break up the reunion. What? Sayal gasped. You can't stay here for when they drag your husband in, said Tyrik as he knelt behind Wedge's chair and untied his bonds. Rogue leader is coming with me to the command deck. I'm not going anywhere. Wedge said firmly as the binding fell from his wrists. Yes, you are, said Tyrick as he waved the tip of his knife in front of Sile's face. Otherwise Mrs. Fell is going to look a lot less pretty. Wedge scowled and got up. What do you want with me? We're going to place a little call. I want to see the surprise on lovely Leonia's face when she sees the new prize I brought her. Wedge could think of nothing he wanted less. Tyrick waved the knife blade in his face and said, March, fly boy. I can ruin your looks just like I can ruin hers. He looked down at Sayal and gave her a single nod. Then he turned and let Tarek march him off. It was, frankly, the most incredible story Sunter Fell had ever heard. But as he sat inside the escort shuttle's main cabin, he found no choice but to believe it. Most of the storytelling had been done by the four men in white armor. While the fifth member of their team, Grave, kept looking for Sayal and Wedge, their leader, Larone, had explained the long circuitous route his team had taken to serving Grand Admiral Thrawn in his battle against the savage warlords of the unknown regions. He had to admit that many of the uncertainties and crises these rogue stormtroopers had confessed to had matched his own. So all of this, Fell said, coming in from the unknown regions, hunting Sayal for weeks, this ruse to draw me here, was it all about me? just to get me to fly for you. I'm not sure whether to feel humbled or flattered. I've been watching your career from afar for quite some time, Thrawn said. I'm not alone in that, I'm sure, but it has proven quite interesting. I believe you've shown many talents which will serve us well. I'm a good flyer. I always have been. There's far more to it than that. You are believing in law and order, Baron Fell and you believe peace requires a strong hand to be secured. You also believe that power must be wielded responsibly for the greater good, not the satisfaction of those in power. You know I've been fighting for the rebels. Fell looked down at his hands. He was surprised how quickly he'd gone back to thinking of them like that, rebels instead of a new republic. The manipulation and revelation and Eddie IV had broken a trust that had been gradually cracking for months since his defection. I'm quite aware, Thrawn said coldly. However, I am willing to overlook that error in judgment. 
You're felt betrayed by Icer's actions at Brintal? Correct. And other things. I didn't like seeing my soldiers used as pawns in other people's power plays. Thrawn nodded. There comes an hour for every good soldier when he must judge whether the cause he's been serving is really worth his life. Fell's jaw dropped. It was exactly what he told his brother-in-law just days ago. He clamped it shut, took a deep breath, and said, I won't fly for anyone anymore. Not until I'm sure my wife is out of danger. We won't leave this rock without her, Lerone said. I promise. I've heard promises before. Another stormtrooper, one of the two who come with Fell, stepped out of the shuttle's cockpit. He'd taken his helmet off and Fell couldn't conceal his surprise at the green-scaled alien face. Admiral, the soldier said, we've detected another ship dropping into the atmosphere. It's coming this way. Thrawn was immediately on his feet. Can you identify the type? Vonter. A DX-9 stormtrooper transport. The other troopers jumped up to. Brightwater said, we have to go. Now. Whose ship is it? Asked Fell. Mostly likely, it was sent by Grand Admiral Grant, Thrawn said. He's been working to claim you also, either for Isert or himself. Someone's comment buzzed. Lerone fished his out from his belt and held it to his mouth. I'm here. Report. I'm right outside your door, boss, said a new voice, presumably Graves. There's something you gotta see. There was something strange in his tone. Lerone asked, something like what? It's like that time we fought the SS Siruak on Cantoris. Come on down, you'll miss it. Okay. Sure. Be right down. Lerone shut off his comm and said, he's in trouble. Mark Ross saw the look on Fell's face and explained, we never fought the SS Siruak at Cantoris. The troopers were shoving their helmets on their faces. Thrawn's two small alien bodyguards, who'd been sitting at the back of the cabin so far, jumped to their feet. Long daggers suddenly appeared from the sleeves of their cloaks. Quiller elbow fell in the shoulder and held out a DL-22 sidearm. Fell nodded and took it. Lerone hefted his E-11 and took point. Thrawn's two stormtroopers joined him in taking point. The three of them charged down the ramp. Fell wanted to run right after them but Quiller held him back. Fell could see nothing from the base of the ramp. He heard nothing either. After a long, tense silence, Lerone called up. Send the Baron down. He's got visitors. Quiller tightened his grip on Fell's arm. The pilot shook it off and walked down the ramp to see four stormtroopers with their weapons on he ground and hands in the air. Six wrinkle-faced Nikto stood all around them weapon raised. A part of Fell was surprised and disappointed that the stormtroopers had surrendered so easily. He put his hands on his head and asked, Where did you come from? The Corvette? That right, one Nikto said in garbled basic. We have wife. And brother. You come now? He tried to console himself that Wedge and Sial were together, but he had no idea how he'd help them. One stormtrooper, the alien, said, We have more people in that shuttle. You'll never take all of us. We have all need, said the Nikto, but he didn't sound so confident. He waved two of his compatriots forward. They stepped carefully toward the base of the landing ramp with their rifles pointed upward and ready to fire at whatever showed itself first. Two brown-robed aliens fell on them, bare-clawed feet slamming into their chests. Their rifles went off, fire into the sky, as long knives stabbed deep into their chests. Lerone threw himself at fell and knocked both to the dirt. More rifle shots whipped by over their heads but the fight lasted less than half a minute before everything was still. Lerone got to his feet, the pulled fell up. The pilot looked around in awe. All six Nikto lay dead on the ground, and over each one stood one of those small aliens. Each one held a knife dripping with green blood. Fell gasped, I thought there were only two. They're called the Nori, Thrawn said as he came down the ramp, flanked by Brightwater and Quilla. As you can see, they're excellent fighters. Fell nodded stupidly. Grave said, Sorry about that, guys. They jumped me in the grass. Next time we should send Brightwater for scout jobs, said Quiller. Fine by me, muttered Grave. You must move quickly, said Thron. 
Grant's shuttle will be landing soon, and the Corvette's crew will realize their team is missing soon enough. Fell stuffed his pistol under his belt, bent down over one dead Nikto, and picked up the dead being's long barrel carbine. You know how to use that? Asked Lerone. I can't do more than fly. Good. Come on. Like the Admiral said, we've got to hurry. Brightwater took front that time, grave the rear. Fell joined the other stormtroopers in a single file column as that moved through the grass. As for the Nori, they sheathed their knives, scattered their formation, and slipped away silently into the gathering dark. Chapter 40 Eddie IV Gouts of flame spilled into space as Fang Zar's latest missile volley tore another hole through Vengeance's aft section. The shields around the Super Star Destroyer's recessed command deck shuddered but held as a trio of dreadnoughts continued their own offensive barrages. After the initial shock of Bell Ibla's arrival, the Super Star Destroyer had mustered its defenses. It carried more snub fighters and attack craft than all of Bell Ibla's ships combined, and they'd already forced one of his dreadnoughts into retreating. Thankfully, Mon Maria and Mon Delindo had decided to come to his aid and had launched their own fighter screens. Despite the titanic battle raging in orbit over Eddie IV, Bell Iblis knew that the real fight was taking place down in the atmosphere. Grand Admiral McCarty was down there, and so was Willem Burke. So, too, were counselors Philia and Organa. The latter was a devout Mon Mothma loyalist and the former was far more conniving than Bell Iblis had ever liked. Still, the fight against the Empire would be worse if they were lost. This is a waste, he muttered to himself. Sir, did you say something? Cena appeared swiftly at his side. He sometimes wondered if the woman was force sensitive, the way she read him, though more likely it could be chalked up to decades of experience. We need to get down to the surface, he told her. That's where the real fight's taking place. We have a chance to kill this superstar destroyer. Sir, you said so. He looked out the viewport at Vengeance's sleek black hole. The ship had taken heavy damage, enough that would have torn apart two Imperial class ships, but it was simply so big they could waste every missile and torpedo in the assembled armada and still not destroy it. I was caught in the moment, Bell Ibla said. This isn't our fight, Cena. Our fight's down there with Willem. What's the update on his ship? Emancipator's been fighting it out with another Star Destroyer down there. Not Makati's, but the other one. It seems like it's finally withdrawing now. Those ships weren't meant for atmospheric combat. They were meant to fight in a vacuum. I'd bet Willem has fires all over his ship right now. Then what should we do, sir? Bell Iblis turned from her and marched over to the comm station. He called, Helmon Maria. I want to speak to their captain. One moment, sir, said the comm lieutenant. Bell Iblis didn't have to wait long before the hollow image of a bulbous Idmon Calamari appeared in front of him. This is Captain Varric. And this is General Garm Bell Iblis, he said, then paused to see how the captain reacted. Varric blinked his huge eyes, then simply asked, what can we do to help, General? Bell Iblis smiled against himself. He'd been half expecting some angry rebuttal. I want you to pull off from Vengeance's bow. Come along the starboard flank to join us near the bridge. I can't do that, General, but I won't be able to block Vengeance as she tries to run. I'm counting on that. I want to go down to the planet and help Admiral Burke, but I can't do it with this thing in orbit. Varric nodded in understanding. Very well. We're on our way. The comm line shut off, and Bell Iblis looked out Fangzar's forward viewport. They were hovering over Vengeance's right shoulder and looking down his bow. Far ahead, he saw Mon Maria's organic-looking dip into view and accelerate to join them. There was, he admitted, a deadly elegance to Mon Calamari's ships he'd misfight alongside the main. Vengeance's forward turbolaser batteries began to pound on Mon Maria, but Varric's shields held firm. Fangzar began to fire on the destroyer's bridge shields and Bell Iblis felt a tension in his chest. If Vengeance's captain was going to panic and run, he'd do it now. If he was going to fight to the bitter end, then he wouldn't budge. Bell Iblis hoped, prayed, that the soldiers fighting for him and Mon Mothma were braver than their opposite numbers. 
Vengers began to move. Bell Iblis's right fist clenched to his side as he called. Tactical. Report. That destroyer's trying to pull away, sir. I can't see that. Where is it going? Seems to be heading straight for the edge of the gravity well. No signs of changing course. Excellent. Bell Iblis smacked fist into Paul. Tell all ships to keep up fire, but hold position. Let it run. Sino appeared beside him again. Once it's gone, do you want to go into the atmosphere, sir? I do. The Mon Cal's can fight back that one imp star. Willem needs our help. Adrenaline was pumping through his old body, and his attention darted everywhere at once. Vengeance pulled away, but has noticed the tiny, restrained smile on the woman's lips. What? He asked her. What is it? I'm just glad to be doing this again, sir. He was too, he had to admit. As Vengeance started showing off her thruster glow, he allowed himself to wonder if maybe, just maybe, once they killed Makati and rescued the Councilsers, he should follow Burke back to his headquarters and finally, after all that time, sit down for a talk with Mon Mothman. Maybe it was time to bring his people in from the cold. Maybe it was time to finally rebuild the bridge he'd done his own part in tearing down. But that was getting ahead of himself. They had a lot of fighting left to do. The TIE fighter came screaming in from overhead, spitting green laser blasts that tore up the pavement of the battered debris strew promenade and sent up geysers of charred stone with every impact. For a second Leia's body froze as the TIE bore down on her. Then, just as suddenly as it had came, it veered upward and away. For a second she had no idea why. Then she saw an A-wing dart after it, spitting lasers. We have to hurry. Winter said as she grabbed Leia's arm and pulled her along. They both started running down the open street, sticking close to the north building fronts this time, where they'd be harder to spot. Avan Barris's crashed X-wing lay a hundred meters ahead, at the end of a trail of black scorch marks that had been plowed into the pavement. Adrenaline warred with exhaustion as they made the last sprint. As they clambered onto a twisted S-foil and reached for the X-wing's cockpit, Leia had the stupid, Giddy thought that at least now she'd have a story to impress Han with when he got back from Kashyyyk. If she got back from Eddie IV. The tang of laser fire ripped her thoughts clear and made her duck. She pressed her shoulders against the curve of a dead thrust engine as a half dozen stormtroopers came charging from up ahead. Winter, having taken cover behind the warped S foil, fired over his scorched edge and caught one stormtrooper in the chest. Leia was able to take out another, but there were too many. The cover provided by the thrust engine wasn't enough, and if she tried to dash to Winter's hiding place they'd nail her. She heard another sound, the high-pitched retort of a holdout pistol. She turned her head and saw a series of shots burst out of the cracked open X-wing cockpit, taking out two more stormtroopers. Leia reared forward to start shooting again, and Winter joined in. Three shooters together were enough to drop all the stormtroopers in the middle of the street. Leia clambered over to the cockpit and shoved his hatchback. Avin's face was smeared with sweat and blood, but when he saw her, his expression lit up. Leia, he said, I can't believe you're alive. You stole my line. Can you move, Avin? He looked down at his legs, and Leia followed his eyes. The mangled, bloodied mess of his left limb made her wince. Winter appeared beside Leia, saying over the howl of another overhead TIE fighter. We have to move fast. I'm not sure if I can do that, Avin said apologetically. We didn't come this far just to leave you, Winter said. She stuck her blaster in the waistband of her tattered gown and threw her bare legs over the edge of the cockpit. We'll pull you out and get a tourniquet on your leg. Just be ready. I'll do my best, Avin panted. Leia could see now he was getting woozy from blood loss, and moving his shattered leg would only increase the flow. But as Winter said, they hadn't come all that way for nothing. She was about to reach in and take his shoulders when she heard the familiar mechanical warble of an S street. All three of them froze and saw a scout walker step into the street up ahead. His cockpit tilted forward slightly, like it was looking right at the bodies of the dead stormtroopers ahead. Then it raised its chin mounted cannons to the broken X wing lying helpless in the street. Leia saw the flare of incoming torpedo. She threw an arm around Winter's shoulder and hurled the both of them headfirst into Avin's lap. 
just before the torque caught the NST right in the face. The explosive shockwave popped her ears and washed heat over the promenade. Leia dared pick her head up just in time to see an X-wing with yellow and black checkerboard stripes on his nose pull over their heads. Evan shouted something and raised a fist in the air. Leia couldn't tell what for the ringing in her ears, but it didn't matter. As they disentangled themselves, Leia's eyes met Winter's and both of them knew what to do. Together, as carefully as they could with their ears still ringing and battle raging overhead, they began to move Evan. For so long, the crew of the warship Emancipator had been running up and down its corridors, frantically moving in and out of the forward command room where their war leader held court. The command room was big and broad, with two long pits where the crew worked and windows bright with sunshine. Beyond the windows were a sea of fat white clouds and, floating amidst the clouds, another great warship that had battled their own with lightning and thunder for the past hours. As it fled now the black scorch marks on its pale hull were clearly visible. Drifts of black smoke rose from fiery tears in its skin and mingled with the cloud wisps. Emancipator's war leader had been on his feet the entire time, waving his hands and giving orders to the crew in the pits. It was like he'd been possessed by a demon that granted boundless energy. He wore no fine robes or fetishes to distinguish him from the others, but he was clearly war leader nonetheless. The immediate deference everyone showed him was proof of that. Still, the war leader had been on his feet since before the windows had filled with clouds. The battle they just engaged in, with the other floating white warship, had been taxing, and as it finally began to retreat it looked like the demon inside him promptly fled. The war leader seemed to wilt in the sunlight, all his ardor finally gone. Akron of Clan Bacter had been waiting a long time for this moment. From his hiding place behind the metal grate in the room behind the command deck, he'd watched the warship's crews dash back and forth, listened to the alarms, and felt the shudders every time lightning from the other big ship had struck theirs. He could tell from their postures, their emotions, that the battle for these beings was far from over. It had, however, come to a lull, which meant that some of them were moving off from the bridge to grab food to sustain them for when the battle began to rage again. Akron had been waiting in this place since the fight began amidst the stars. He'd been aboard Emancipator for longer than that. It felt like years since he'd left Honor, and every step of the journey the true new Vader had sent him on had taken him further from everything he'd known. First, he'd sneaked aboard the false new Vader shuttle to a new planet. Then he'd watched the false new Vader die and dissolve to nothing, and then he'd stolen away on the ship of the false new Vader's killers. They'd taken him to another big ship and from there he'd sneaked aboard on this one. All the way, he'd been speaking with the true new Vader on the small talking device he'd been given. The new Vader had explained all the wonders he was seeing calmly and patiently, and instructed him on one task after another. These strange metal labyrinths that moved through the stars still amazed him, but he no longer felt afraid of their cold, clean hallways and their groaning, dirty insides. His confidence had grown step by step as he carried out the new Vader's orders. He found dark hiding places where no one ever went, and he learned how to steal food left behind by careless crew. He learned how to operate the light boards that told him where the ship was traveling amidst the stars. He'd even figured out how to copy messages on tiny pieces of metal, and had left one as requested with the crewman's belongings. Akron had discovered that, in a strange way. Walking among the stars was exciting, even fun. But fun was not why he was here. Fun was not why he'd been hiding outside the command deck, patiently waiting for the chance to fulfill the new Vader's last command. More booted feet walked past his hiding place, and again, no one looked into the low shadows beyond the metal grate to see him. He found himself a fortunate angle from which he could watch the command deck, and he knew the war leader had not left. He did. However, looked to be talking with another warrior, a tall thin man with black hair on his head and above his lip. The war leader patted the other man on the shoulder in what looked like a sign of friendship. Then he turned and began walking toward Akron. The young Nori tensed. He placed one hand on the grate and ready to push. With his other, he grasped his knife. That knife had been forced for him when he was a child, and he'd carried it into every battle since 
always dreaming that he'd take it with him into the stars if he ever got the chance. The war leader was coming close now. He didn't even have guards. Akharan muttered a short, silent prayer, invoking the glory of Clan Bakhtar. Then he shoved the grate aside and sprung. The war leader saw him and turned, but it was too late. Akharan struck out with his knife, catching the war leader in the throat. Blood sprayed in Akharan's face. He flipped the knife into an underhanded grip and stabbed downward, deep into the center of the man's chest to make sure he struck the killing blow. Then Akharan turned and ran. There were shouts behind him, he heard the sharp sound of light weapons firing behind him and ducked low so their shining bolts whipped over his head. He turned a corner and found another swarm of soldiers with light weapons bearing toward him. He knew he could never take them all. He reached for the little metal sphere he stuck into the pouch at his belt. The new Vader had instructed him on how to steal it and how to use it. It was not a noble weapon, not the like knife he'd carried with him since childhood. There was no honor in it, nor being killed by it. But the enemy would not take him if he used it, not even his body. For the Nori, it was a disgrace if a fallen warrior's corpse fell into another clan's hands. With it, they could desecrate his memory. The new Vader understood that. He told Akarin to leave nothing behind for the enemy. Akarin stopped in the middle of the hallway and squeezed the button on the sphere. For one moment, his mind flashed back to the sickly feels of Hanar and the pride he'd felt the first time he'd taken up his knife. He hoped the lands of Clan Bacter would be restored one day. He hoped his life, his blood, and his honor hadn't been wasted. Then he let go of the button, and everything stopped. The explosion in the aft vestibule rattled the entire bridge, nearly throwing Drayson to his feet as he scrambled over to Admiral Burke. Alarms wailed, lights flashed, and anti-inflammatory foam rained from ceiling dispensers. The sharp smell of the spray washed out the reek of smoke, and death. A medic had already gotten into Burke. Drayson dropped to his knees in a pool of blood as the goddle dropped a white cloth around Burke's face and shook his horned head. One strike in the chest, plus one to the throat, the goddle said. It nearly took his neck clean through. Drayson stared at Burke's blood-stained, featureless face mask and tried to understand how things had suddenly gotten so bad. Bell Iblis had appeared like a miracle and chased away a superstar destroyer. After an hour-long slugfest in the sky, Emancipator had driven Tenacious into retreat. Burke had just stepped aside to grab some stems from his quarters while Ben Iblis' star destroyer came down to help with Makati. And then everything suddenly went upside down. Drayson stared helplessly at that white-covered face until someone touched his shoulder, Emancipator's first officer. He rose on wobbly legs and raised his voice above the sound of the alarm still wailing in the explosion-battered hall behind him. What is it? He asked. We're getting a call from Fangzar, the lieutenant said. They wanted to speak to Admiral Burke. Drayson knew if he looked down at the corpse again he might never look up. I'll handle it, he said. When he arrived at the comm station he saw the rest of the bridge crew was as stunned and confused as he was. He turned on the transmission and a holographic head shot appeared in front of him. The long white hair, mustache, and stubborn set to the lips were all trademark Garm Bell Iblis. Thick eyebrows drew together as the old senator asked, Drayson, isn't it? A Chandralin and loyal Mon Mothma Ali who never expected Bell Iblis to come to help. But there wasn't time for that. Admiral Burke is dead. I'm sorry. Dead. But your ship. An assassin. It just happened. And some thing jumped out and killed him with a knife. We tried to pursue, but it blew itself up. It just happened. I'm sorry. I can't explain more. The old Corellian's face went slack with shock. Drayson doubted his own looked any different. I'm sorry, Bell Ibla said finally. Believe me, so am I, but our counselors are still down there, and Grand Admiral Makati is dead ahead. I need to know right now. Will you still fight with us? Bell Iblis seemed to stare into the distance, and Drayson was afraid he was going to cut and run now that his old ally had suddenly, incredibly been struck down. But then he said, We'll stay with you. Thank you, in general, Drayson nodded. 
Let's make sure he didn't die for nothing. What's the status of Tenacious? Bacotti asked as he and Captain Vivant hovered close to the tactical holo. Battered, sir. Since we're fighting an atmosphere he's having a hard time with on board fires. We're going to need him. Have him form up on our starboard flank. As Vivant dashed away to relay the order, Makati glowered at the tactical holo. The sudden appearance of the second rebel fleet had thrown the battle in chaos. Captain Sisko had, without so much as a word of apology, taken his superstar destroyer and fled after sustaining only superficial damage. If Grand Admiral Grant had been here it would never have happened, and Makati found himself hoping that Sisko had fled to somewhere in loyal Imperial space so Icer could give him the appropriate reward for cowardice, though he doubted the man was that foolish. But Makati couldn't let himself think of cowards and traitors, not when that old Venator-class destroyer was descending into the clouds to join them. So far the rebel destroyer had been afraid to attack steadfast, lest the whole ship fall and crush their precious counselors. What now that the rebels held the advantage in orbit, he expected them to risk an offensive. The sole imperial warship up in space, implacable, was hovering indecisively in outer orbit. Even if Captain Trigett did try and bring his ship into the atmosphere, it would surely be blocked by two Mon Cal cruisers. Thanks to the explosion on the ventral sensor package, almost surely sabotage rebel assault shuttles were flying unimpeded beneath Steadfast Hull and attempting to make landings on the estate grounds beneath. They might scoop up their counselor soon and make a run for it. If that happened, the two rebel destroyers would surely unleash hellfire on Steadfast and Tenacious. Makati was no longer sure if they could win this fight. He was tempted to order his dorsal gunners to turn the entire ground beneath them to glass. Not capturing those counselors alive would draw Isard's wrath, to say nothing of losing vengeance so soon after gaining it, but if he didn't, he might not live to fight another day. It was an impossible dilemma. The two rebel star destroyers had joined in the clouds and angled themselves to face tenacious and steadfast, like they were like bull nerfs staring down a Tanab matador before the charge. Even if they stayed to pound the lanterns or escape to lifeless rubble, they might not make it out. Captain. Makati called, and a second later Vivant was at his side. Tell the dorsal gunner crew to prepare a manual firing solution. On what, sir? Everything. We won't leave the rebels anything to recover. Vivant frowned. But, sir, we have troops down there. In his desperation Makati had almost forgotten about them. He'd been willing to casually burn hundreds of his own men and cursed himself for it. Tell them to begin withdrawal. Keep the ties flying and make sure the rebel shuttles don't get in the air. When the bulk of our troops are out, I'll give the order and we'll glass the surface. Vivant didn't have to tell him how unhappy Isard would be to lose the chance to capture such prized enemies, and Makati didn't have to tell him that Isard would be even more angry if they escaped entirely. One more thing, Makati called as Vivant turned to go. Give Shadow Squadron the go-ahead to launch. Tell them to stay cloaked the moment they leave the hangar. Vivant swallowed. Are you certain? Sir. He looked out the viewport at those two rebel destroyers. He was surprised they hadn't charged already. They may be the only thing that keeps us alive, Captain. I'll give them their orders once they're in the air. Launch them now. Jack Carr stared at the faceless mask of the stormtrooper in front of him. Firmly the man repeated. This is a restricted area. I can't let you pass. His mind flashed back 20 years to when he'd been a kid on Generous. He'd been out fishing by the river and come back to see a whole column of stormtroopers had raided his village, saying they were rooting out rebel insurgents. He'd run back to his home and found a Stormy in that same white mask blocking his way, and the Stormy had told him the same thing, I can't let you pass. His father was already dead inside, shot for resisting the search and seizure of a household that hadn't done anything wrong. Carr's father had refused to help the insurgents because he didn't want to bring the empire down on his family. Not that it had mattered in the end. Carr tilted his own helmet slightly. There was one more stormy over the first one's shoulder, and beyond that was the last doorway between them and the command tower's climate control module. Turn around now, the first stormy said. This is direct from the Grand Admiral. Nobody's allowed near critical systems after the sabotage. 
Carr looked over his own shoulder and saw Eckerheen still behind him. The imps had despoiled the Emily Eye's entire homeworld and scattered his people across the galaxy. For the both of them, that faceless white stormtrooper helmet had always meant the same thing, oppression and death. The second Stormy said, Soldier, I want to see your identification. My identification. Ekrahim grunted through his helmet. That's right. What business do you think you have here? You want my identification? Fine, you can have it. Ekrahim reached for his helmet. Carl wanted to shout at him, tell him this was a stupid idea. But he didn't really have a better one. Ekrahim tore off his helmet, exposing his flat, dark blue alien face. It stunned both Stormies for a full second, which was all Carr needed to whip up his rifle and pump laser blasts into both their chests. You've really done it now, Carr said as Ekrahim threw his helmet away and rushed for the door. It got the job done, didn't it? The Emily I said as he punched in the Pasco Darylin had promised would work. Except we're gonna get a whole squad coming our way soon, Carr reminded him. Picky picky, Ekrahim muttered. The doorway slid open, and both of them rushed inside. Carr plucked his comlink from his mouth as he surveyed the circular chamber. Boss, you there? Still camping. Still in Makati's cabin, the Bothan confirmed. Where are you? In the Atmo room? There's a big pylon dealy in the middle with lots of pipes. I'm guessing that what we need to blow up. I'm guessing you're right. Did you get in okay? Um, so, the thing about that, Carr looked back at Ekrahim. Hey, you locked that door. Yeah, but I don't know how long it'll hold, the Emily I said as he started taking out his charges and placing them around the central pylon. We're in, he told Darylin. That's all that matters. Check, do you have a way out? Carr looked around the chamber, hoping there was an auxiliary hatch or a secondary exit. He saw nothing except dense, tangled machinery oppressing him on all sides. Just get ready for a boom, boss. I bet you'll feel it. Jack. Do your job, boss. We'll do ours. Carr shut off the comlink, took one deep breath, and began placing his own charges. He didn't get very far before he heard fists pounding on the other side of the door. That was fast, Eckerheen said. Tends to happen when you shoot a couple stormies. All his buddies wanting on the fun. Think we've laid enough charges for a big boom. Carr stepped back and looked over their handiwork. Don't think we have to worry about that. There was a flash of light and Carr thought that was it. Then smoke poured into the chamber and red laser blast tore through the smoke. Carr and Ekerheen rushed around the central pylon, putting it between them and the door full of stormtroopers. They fired shots back around the pylon's curved edge, but it became clear very quickly that they couldn't hold off the stormies for long. Jet. Ekrahim called, you have the trigger. Carr reached into his pocket and drew it out, a little cylinder no bigger than his comlink. The only difference was the red button under his thumb. Carr felt fear surge inside him, the old fear he'd known since generous. Then he remembered the white mask that had always blocked his path, and the anger came too. Jet, do it. His hand was shaking. He peeked around the curve of the pylon toward the door. The first stormtroopers were daring to break through the haze. He saw the first white mask, and all the childhood anger came on strong, the way it always had. Anger defeated fear. He thumped the trigger. The entire command deck shuddered so hard Makati was nearly thrown off his feet. It made no sense. The enemy destroyers were still sitting inexplicably in the distance and hadn't charged. Then someone reported, Sir, there's been a shipboard explosion. It's the atmosphere center for the control tower. Fire control teams are shutting down the blaze, someone else added. More sabotage, Vivant snarled. Begin recirculating air from the main body of the ship, Makati ordered, and send down more fire teams. As the crew rushed to comply, Vivant lowered his voice and said, it'll take time for the Atmo from the rest of the ship to compensate. Makati knew what they meant. Very soon, the entire bridge would start getting dangerously lightheaded, and depending on the damage done they might even start suffering from serious carbon dioxide poisoning. The oxygen from the rest of the ship would even things out in time, but time wasn't on their side, 
those two Rebel Star Destroyers would be charging any minute. In one swift stroke, the saboteurs had crippled steadfast from within. We will not abandon the bridge, Makati said. Call emergency crews. Get some oxygen tanks up here. Vivant nodded. And what about the ground bombardment? In the frenzy, Makati had almost forgotten. Once he gave the order, the entire main goal of the mission, the capture of the rebel leaders, would be scrubbed. Have our troops withdrawn? Partially, sir. I'll let them have five more minutes. Then I'll give the order. Karp was dead. So was Ekrahi. So were Sheer and Koth Melanan. Get ready to move, Kask said. Daryland jumped at the sound of his slurred voice. He glanced sidelong at the russet furred Bothan, who was checking the power pack on his blaster rifle one more time. Both of them had portable oxygen tanks hooked to their belts and breathing tubes stretching up to their mouths. As expected, they hadn't been able to find anything for Bothans, so in the end they'd just taken the oxygen tubes and stuck them at the corners of their snouts, holding them in place with half-clamped jaws. It was awkward. But as long as they didn't breathe through their nostrils, they'd be in better shape than the imps on the bridge. We stay low and shoot high, Cask reminded him. In his white suit, he'll be hard to miss. My guess is that they'll have drawn off a lot of personal to fight the fire down below. That should help. That in the hypoxia. What if he's not on the bridge? Then we die for nothing. He said as so matter of fact. His voice was steady, but his fur prickled in fear. Darylin looked away. He checked his weapon and made sure it was charged one more time. Then he glanced at the Grand Admiral's old protocol droid. It was standing right where they'd left it, though his arms were at its size now and his laser cannon had been retracted into his arms. It looked like the old antique machine everyone probably assumed it was. Its glowing photoreceptor stared blankly ahead. Darylin had already risked passing in front of it and gotten no reaction. His slicing job on the droid's cortex had done that much right, at least. He hoped the rest had worked too, though he'd never get to test it. He wondered what the story behind that droid was. Makati's quarters didn't leave much hint to the personality of the man they were about to kill, though the droid and the old two dimension pictures on the wall hinted at some private sentimentality. Darylin had examined those while they waited for Carr and Ekerheim. They showed landscapes buildings, people, but they were useless without context. Darylin would never know anything about the man Makati was. He hadn't even wanted to until this moment, when all three of them were about to die. Enough. He cradled his rifle in both hands and asked, think they're gasping for air by now. Or at least getting slow and fuzzy yet. Darylin crept up to the door and rested one paw on the control panel. When he didn't press the button, Kask said, there's no point in waiting, not when you know where you're going to end up. It could have been the story of his life, of all their lives, ever since they chose to fight the kind of fight they did. Okay, Daryl and punched the button. Let's go. The emergency crew had just arrived, three men laden down with ten oxygen masks each. It wasn't enough for even a third of the bridge crew, but before taking his own, Makati directed the handout of the breathing masks to Captain Vivant, Section Lieutenants, and Ensigns with key roles like helm and gunnery control. The hypoxia was already taking hold. Makati felt the world swim around him, almost like he'd gone drunk. The one good thing was that those rebel destroyers still hadn't moved. He had no idea what the problem was there. The crews were just about done handing out breathing masks when Vivant tapped him on the shoulder and held out a mask. Please, sir, he said. Just take it. Just as Makati reached for it, a commotion erupted from the entrance to the bridge. Two figures sprinted through the open blast doors, bodies bent low. Makati spotted the laser rifles in their hands right before they fired. Vivant pushed Makati aside, dizzy from oxygen loss. Makati tumbled to the deck and saw Vivant, above him, take a shot to the shoulder and spin. Makati slammed into the deck. One of the attackers, a Bothan with rust colored fur and an oxygen tube dangling from his snout, ran straight up the center aisle between the crew pits. It was darting toward Makati, but didn't get his shot off fast enough. One of the bridge's scant remaining guards finally popped off a lacerer, catching the Bothan in the side of the head. 
it pitched to the right and tumbled into the crew pit below. There was still another Bothan, one with black fur, but Makati couldn't see it. He flailed his arms helplessly, too weak and disoriented to even stand, and through his day's panic he knew how pathetic it would be, how absolutely humiliating, to die on his back unable to rise, flailing his limbs like a stupid infant. Then the last Bothan appeared over him. The black furred face gazed down at his. The alien's small dark eyes were impenetrable as it raised its rifle to fire. Then a volley of laser blasts cut in from over Makati's head and took the Bothan in the chest. It dropped the gun and fell on his back. Before Makati knew what was happening, someone had grabbed him under the shoulders and was hoisting him to his knees. Someone shoved a breathing mask on his face. The Grand Admiral drew in deep drags of sweet oxygen. The ensign beside him said, Sir, are you all right? Sir? I'm fine, Makati wheezed. He clutched the breathing mask to his face and rose on trembling legs. He looked across the bridge and counted eight officers on the deck, dead or wounded, plus Captain Vivant, who winced and growled as he clutched his scorched shoulder even as he stayed on his feet. Makati staggered over to the black-furred Bothan. His eyes gazed up at Makati, just as Makati's had gazed up at his a moment ago. The Bothan opened his snout and tried to say something as his scorched chest strained to breath. Makati bent a little lower and heard the Bothan rasp. Now, I'll never know if it worked. Then the Bothan gave a death rattle, and his head rolled to one side. For a second Makati lost balance and had to brace himself against the ensign. Then he heard the lieutenant say, Admiral, it's the Rebel Star Destroyers. They're coming this way. Chapter 41 Orin 3 All things considered, Leonia Tavira wished she'd gotten a chance to break in her Star Destroyer before being thrown into a major space battle. The simple fact was that she'd never even been aboard one of T.E.'s ships before, and never even seen a naval battle with her own eyes. Like the rest of her crew, her experience had been limited to pirate raids on civilian haulers and occasionally running escapes from CSA, picket ships. This was far outside any of their purview which was why she reluctantly followed Grand Admiral Grant's instructions to take her ship in close to Grey Wolf. She saw his stratagem clearly enough. He was giving up on fighting the Interdictor and attempting to box in the Star Destroyer between their two ships. It was working. The ship had slowed as accelerated toward Oron 2 as NVIDIA settled behind it and Oroflam swung his broadside to face Grey Wolf's nose. The destroyer was trying to tip his bow downward and pass under Grant's ship which in turn gave Tavira an excellent opportunity to pound its aft shields and maybe blow some of its engines. That wouldn't be enough to kill it, of course. She was still hoping Grant could pull some miracle maneuver like Grand Admirals were supposed to and end this fight. So many of the systems were being operated by Bilibango's computer routines and the battle, though full of light and fire, felt strangely boring. Tavira still fully intended to leave Grant and Grey Wolf and flee the system as soon as she got word from Tyrak. And when the nervous Imperial comm officer announced an incoming transmission, her heart nearly skipped a beat. She rushed over to find the scarred man's holographic face beaming up at her. She asked, What happened? Van, do you have the package? I've got that and more, Tarek chuckled. He reached out and pulled another man into view by a handful of brown hair. The man winced in pain and flinched when Tyrick waved the tip of his knife in his face. How's the transmission, Captain? Tyrick asked. Are you getting this? She couldn't believe what she was seeing. Is that Wedge Antilles? Rogue leader in the flesh. We have Starflare too. It was too good to be true. Tavira laughed in disbelief. Van, you have outdone yourself. And there's more. Baron felt himself is on this planet. He came with Antilles. I sent a team to retrieve him. They should be back soon. Tavira's head swam. She had no idea what she'd do with all three of those prizes. She could sell Fell and Starflare to the highest bidder. But as for Antilles, she rather wanted to keep him for herself. She toyed with telling him about Tycho Selchu but decided against it. She's much rather tell him in person, after the battle, when she could savor the pain it caused him. After all, there was no point in taking revenge if you didn't do it right. Tell me when you take off, Van. I will. 
Just sit tight a little longer, Captain. We're on our way. Dagon Nerys knew he was no Grand Admiral Thrawn. He learned so much from the man over the past four years, but he was still no tactical genius. He was a soldier though, a loyal one, and that would have to do. That trick Grant had used to jam the missile boat's targeting systems had worked all too well. All but two of the craft had been destroyed by Grant's interceptors, and the number of starlings had been cut in half. Now Oriflam and the second, sluggish star destroyer were trying to box him in. Grant probably figured that if he killed Grey Wolf, Corvus would drop her interdiction field and flee. He was probably right. Thrawn had told Nerys to protect Grey Wolf at all costs, to value it even about the Grand Admiral's life. Of course, he told Nerys the same thing at Ruzin. Even if he wanted to, Nerys had no place to run. Grey Wolf dipped his nose low in the hope of cutting beneath Oriflam, but they still take heavy fire from Grant's ventral turbulacers while simultaneously getting torn up from the rear by Invidious. Thrawn would have come up with some brilliant way to get around this, but Nerys was not Thrawn. Still, he did the best he could to hold against his enemies. He ordered the remaining Starwings to regroup with a squadron of TIE bombers, plus a squad of interceptors to provide fighter cover. He wasn't going to try and attack Grand head on again, but Invidious looked a lot more vulnerable. He hoped to catch his captain by surprise. Nerys stood at the tactical station, watching the holo as it showed the attack craft running close along the Grey Wolf's underside. The destroyer's bulk, combined with the glare and heat signature of its engines, would hopefully shield the fighters from Invidious scanners. He felt the ensign seated in front of him tense as the starfighters cut out from Grey Wolf's aft. The bombers fired first, sending a wave of missiles that impacted against Invidious bow shields. The Starwings fired right after. Their missiles punched through the hole the bombers had made and impacted, tearing a black gash in Invidious' nose that would hopefully kill some of their main forward targeting arrays. Invidious still hadn't launched any fighters but the TIE fighter screen it had borrowed from Grey Wolf was spread too thin to respond in time. Grey Wolf's interceptors provided flawless cover and fire as the TIE bombers and Starwings made another attack run, this time on the heavily shielded generator bulge behind the hangar mouth. They repeated the same process, bombers to weaken the shields, then Starwings to punch through. This time the shields held, but NVIDIA's defensive screen, was in such disarray the bombers and Starwings were able to turn around and make one more pass. This one was more successful, breaking through the shields and cracking open the armor dome. More enemy fighters were on their way, so Nerys gave the recall order. The Starwings and bombers headed back to Grey Wolf's protective shadow as the destroyer's nose dipped far enough below Oriflam to dive. Talk to me, Bilibango. Tavira snapped. That last attack had just erased her previous ebullience. In her earpiece, the Zexto said, The reactor's still running but it looks like there's a danger of overload. We're lowering power output now. What does that do the engines? We're going to have to cut speed by 30%, at least. What about shields? I'm not sure if we can fix those. The hit on the generator blew a lot of power relays. Make sure those fighters don't leave us. What about hyperdrive? Can we run if we have to? I think so. Don't think so. Make sure. Get ready to run to light speed on my order. Yes, Captain. She tapped off her earpiece and looked out the forward viewport. The blue-white glow of Grey Wolf's ion engines was so great and so close the captive deck crew squinted or looked away. The big destroyer was cutting downward and could try to slip beneath or a flam at a perpendicular angle. Tavira couldn't do much more in this fight, but frankly she didn't want to either. If Tyrik could slip away with her three prizes while the other two destroyers brawled it out, so much the better. And if Grant really wanted to best Grey Wolf by himself, he was welcome to the fight. When she first heard the clatter of footsteps at the base of the landing ramp, Sile's insides twisted in a mix of dread and anticipation. After so much time, and so much distance she was finally going to see her husband again. She wanted it so badly, but never wanted it like this. The two grand who'd been watching her while Tyrik hauled her brother up to the command deck heard the noise too, and went down the ramp to meet the retrieval team. 
No sooner had they disappeared did Sayal hear a sudden burst of laser blast. Her body tensed in his chair. She saw two white-armored stormtroopers charge up the ramp, rifles ready, and felt relief rush through her. Then six more came up behind them, and she knew something was wrong. The front two troopers kept their weapons up as they ran across the deck to her position. The others moved to cover all other entrances to the storage room. A voice she'd never heard before, gruff and angry, said, Do you think it's her? The admiral said, Nothing about her being pregnant. Who are you? Sayal asked, voice shaky, but they both ignored her. Tavira thought she was worth taking prisoner, the first trooper said. Cut her free, and let's go. As the second trooper ducked behind her to cut through her bonds, she asked, Who are you? Who do you work for? Where's Laron? The trooper ignored her question again. On your feet, lady, now. She rose on shaky legs and cupped her stomach. I can't move fast. You'll move fast enough, the second one said as he grabbed her arm in a painful grip. Before she could cry out, laser fire resounded from somewhere else in the ship. The first stormtrooper grabbed her other arm, and together they started dragging her toward the landing ramp. Wait, she cried. Stop. Shut up and move, woman, the first one said and whipped his pistol across the top of her head. Pain blossomed at the crest of her skull as the troopers pulled her along. Her legs kicked in vain as they dragged her down the ramp and into the dying twilight. They're falling back. The burly yuzum snarled as he peeked through the threshold to the cargo bay. Do they have the package? What? Asked Tarek. They took her. The yuzum darted back into the hallway. We have to go after them. Tarek looked back to the other end of the hall, where a pair of blue-skinned Eddie were holding Wedge by either shoulder. Still looking at Wedge, he told the yuzum, you stay here, Wuck, but keep the engines ready in case we need to take off. I'll lead the sortie. Good. You can't track him in the dark, Wuck grunted. What about the other package? Tarek gave Wedge a considering look. They both knew it would be safer for him to keep Wedge secure on the ship. Let me go, please, Wedge said. He'd do anything to get off the Corvette. She's my sister. I can't talk to her, convince her. Of what? Tyrick snorted. You'll need to convince Grant Stormies. I can't talk to Fell. He's my pilot. Your retrieval team hasn't come back. You know they won't now. Fell might still be running free. I can help you with him. Tyrak's pale lips twisted into a frown. Wedge pressed. What do you think I'll do? Mind my hands, keep guards on me. I can't run, I've got no place to run. Just let me come. All right, Tarek grunted. He took out his long knife and waved it in Wedge's direction. Just keep in mind, Flyboy, you're the bonus prize. Tavira won't shed too many tears if I kill you before she can. I'll keep that in mind, Wedge said, and the two Eddie shoved him forward. They'd left Marcus back at the shuttle to guard the Grand Admiral, but otherwise this was a whole team mission. Brightwater and the two Trowcree had gone ahead to scout while Lerone led Grave, Quiller, and fell through the bush. The Nori had scattered to parts uncertain, but there wasn't much doubt the alien commandos could take care of themselves. This part of Oron III was falling deeper and deeper into night, and while Lerone and his men had helmets to take care of that, Fell had nothing but his own eyes. You sure you'll be okay like that? Lerone asked him. I'll be fine, the pilot said as he held his carbine close. Lerone wasn't really sure what to make of the man, but it was clear he was willing to do anything to get his wife back safe. That was admirable, but there was probably a line between being brave and reckless. Of course, if there really was one, Lerone had crossed it back and forth too many times to count. Brightwater's voice rang in his ear, saying, Boss, something just happened at the Corvette. A bunch of Stormies just ran in and out. Looks like they got the package. You mean Sial? Looks like they're taking her back to the DX-9. Looks like, north-northwest of the Corvette. So straight north of our position. Thanks. We're on our way. Lerone turned his external helmet speakers on and said, Okay, cut due north, fast as you can. Let's go. As they ran through the high grass, Fell had to throw up both arms to keep the stalks from slapping his face red. 
they should have stuck him in Marcus's armor, but it was too late for that. What's going on? Fell asked as they ran. Where's my wife? Grant's boys have her. We'll cut them off at the transport. Fell didn't need an encouragement to run faster. He was way past the wobbly legs he'd had when they first found him buried under his parachute. Lerone switched his helmet visor to IR and spotted the heat signature of the boxy assault transport dead ahead. Four hot figures were standing on the south-facing side, which was probably where the open boarding hatch was. Behind it he saw what looked like three humanoid forms on their knees, possibly hiding in the grass. Lerone switched his helmet calm and said, that you low on the perimeter, Corlo. We're holding to the north of the ship. The retrieval team will be back in a minute. Where are you? Coming up from the south. We'll catch him in a pincer. You seen the nori? No, I don't know where they went. Then we'll do it ourselves. Lerone held up a hand, signaling his troops to stop. He didn't want to risk speaking aloud so close to the enemy troops and once again he really wished they'd put Fell in Marcus's suit or at least given him a helmet so he could hear and talk and see like the rest of them. Lerone pointed at Fell, then his own chest. The pilot understood that. Then Lerone waved Quiller to head east and Grave to go west. He hoped they'd be able to pull off a full encirclement of the transport without being spotted. The fact that nobody had tried shooting at them yet probably meant Grant's troopers were using the night vision scope on their helmets instead of infrared, a stupid mistake Lerone was ready to make them pay for. It occurred to him for a moment that these stormtroopers had probably been trained just like Lerone and the rest of his men, they might have been happy in their work or they might not, but in the end it had really been one's chance encounter with the trigger-happy ISB, agent that had tipped his squad's fortunes one way, Grant's squad another. He shoved those feelings down. It was a lot easier fighting giant soul-sucking lizards than other Imperials, but fighting was what all of them had chosen to do, one way or another. They hit their knees less than a minute before Grant's retrieval squad came back to the transport. Fell was probably having a hard time seeing through the clustered grass stalks, but Lerone's IR scope was doing just fine. He could even make out Sial by the reluctant shuffle of her feet and the red-white swell at her stomach. There was no time to waste. He said, Quiller, do it now. Quiller's shot took them by surprise. He dropped the stormtrooper holding Sial's right shoulder and shifted his aim downward to spray more shots at the base of the entry hatch to keep them from dashing to safety inside. Grave, he called, and more shots came from the opposite direction. The other trooper grabbing Sial was smart. He wrapped one forearm around her neck and pinned her to his chest as a body shield. Then he slammed his back against the transport's armored bulkhead and began spraying one-handed fire into the grass with his blaster. Fell darted forward without Lerone telling him to. Brightwater and the two Traukri charged him from the other side. They came around the cockpit pod with guns blazing and dropped two more of Grant's troopers, but they stopped immediately when they saw Sial, now barricaded behind a wall of four more storm troopers while the original kept her pinned to his chest. Fell emerged from the grass and Lerone was right behind him. He switched his helmet to normal vision and saw the service lights above the transport's open hatch shining bright on Fell's face. The light spilled onto Sial and the stormtroopers too, and Lerone could see their eyes lock over the bobbing white helmets of Sial's restless captors. They didn't say a word. They just stared at each other. Grave and Quiller crawled out of the grass too. All of Lerone's men formed a circle around Sial and Grant's five remaining troops. Everyone froze in place, and nobody said a word. Wedge trudged through the dark as best he could. The Eddie that were grabbing him must have had better night vision, because they didn't seem to have a problem running through a dense field and with only stars for light. Still, Wedge could make out Van Tyrak's black-haired head bobbing at the column's head. He also saw Tyrak throw up a hand, signaling his motley mercenary band to stop. The Eddie locked Wedge's arms tight, holding him in place. His heart quickened at the sound of laser fire not far ahead. It could have been Sial, it could have been Fell, he had no idea, and that was the worst part of all. Then he heard a garbled scream, and the being in front of him fell. Shadows darted out from the grass, 
Wedge saw the flash of knives and the red flare of blaster fire. He wrested himself free from the shocked Eddie and threw himself headlong into the grass. He heard the sound of a body tearing through the stalks just a meter away, followed by a strangled shout from one of the Eddie. Holding his bound hands against his chest, Wedge pressed himself to the ground and tried to see what was going on. Those killers, whoever they were, had struck fast and silently, totally without warning. A series of laser blasts flared in the night and he saw, through the grass stalks, Van Tyrak's snarling face lit up. Then a shadow fell as though from the sky, landing right on his chest. The man stumbled back but stayed upright, firing his blaster again, seemingly right into the chest of his small humanoid attacker. The blast gave the creature pause for only a second, then his knife flashed down, spearing through Tyrak's chest and coming out the other end. The man fell back without a sound, which thought he saw the knife flash a few more times into Tyrak's sternum before his killer scampered off. It was over as quickly as it had started. Wedge lay panting in the dirt, waiting for the silent assassins to come kill him too. Nothing came. He crept forward toward the bodies, halting every few feet to listen for any sign of the alien killers. Nothing. He crawled over to Tyrak's body. His dark eyes stared lifelessly up at the stars and splashes of blood covered his pale face. Wedge grabbed the man's knife, still at his belt. He gripped the pommel awkwardly in his hands and used it to cut his wrist bonds free. He fumbled around and picked up Tyrak's rifle next, though if those killers were still out there he knew it wouldn't do any good. Then he heard the sound of a warming engine. It was coming from the Corvette. Maybe that usum captain knew his boss was dead and was making a break for it. The thought gave Wedge hope. The sound of blaster fire resuming ahead killed it. As he surged to his feet and ran toward the sound of combat, another engine roar pierced the night. This one sounded like a mid-sized craft, already airborne. It was a stalemate that could last forever, but they didn't have that long. The sound of massive thrust engines warming up cut over the field. That was a sure sign that Marauder Corvette was getting ready to fly again. Lerone called up Mark Ross on his helmet comm and said, You there, Sir Baron. I'm in the shuttle with the Admiral. Think you can fly it? I'm no quiller. Seriously. Can you get it over here? We're gonna need a fast evac. Okay. I think I can get you that far. Have the ramp out and get ready to run. What's your status? Lerone hesitated, then said, I'll get right back on that. He switched his helmet to his external speaker and called, I want to talk. Fell looked away from his wife finally. He looked at Lerone like he was crazy. Brywater apparently thought so too. Over the helmet comm he said, What are you doing, boss? Lerone hooked his rifle to his belt. Slowly, with all eyes on him, he reached up and took off his stormtrooper helmet. That seemed to shock the ones holding Sial. Their leader? The one using Sial as a body shield, called, What do you want, soldier? The same thing you do, Lerone took a step forward. I want to do my job, serve the Empire, and get off this rock. Who's your commanding officer? Grand Admiral Thrawn, he said. He could hear the Marauder warming up but not the Grand Admiral shuttle, not yet. Never heard of him, the trooper scoffed. We were told to get this woman, and that's what we're gonna do. You're not going anywhere, Brightwater said as he stepped up to Lerone's right. Blaster still raised. He's right. You can't get out of this, said Fell. He took Lerone's left and let his rifle fall to his side. Do you know who it is you're after? Grant told us to get this woman. We've got her. That's it. Grant doesn't want her. Fell spread arms. He wants me? The troopers stared for a moment. Maybe some of them really did recognize Fell. The one holding Sial asked, Who are you, soldier? I think you know. You're Baron Fell, aren't you? The defector. Take me to Grant and Isert. Just let her go. Sial opened her mouth to cry out but the stormtrooper choked her with his forearm. His faceless mask stared at Fell and stared back, just as resolute. Then the trooper swung his rifle two inches to the side and fired. Lerone moved on instinct. He threw himself left, knocking fell away. Pain exploded in his chest, 
pain like he'd never felt before. He didn't even feel it when it hit the ground. So much happened at once. The trooper holding Sayal swung his rifle and fired. Lerone threw himself against Fell, knocking the pilot off his feet. The rifle shot caught him square in the chest and knocked him to the ground. The stormtroopers standing closest to the gunman reached up, grabbed the hot rifle barrel, and wrestled it from the other trooper's hand. His grip loosened and Sayal tore herself free. Nori appeared from the shadows, knives flashing, and surrounded Grant's soldiers. None of them tried to fire, and none of them tried to stop Sayal as she stumbled forward. Quiller caught her before she could fall, Brightwater dropped to his knees over Larone and shouted the other man's name. Grave charged into the crowd of Grant's troopers, grabbed the gunman by the neck, and threw him to the ground. He pulled out his sidearm and emptied three shots into the man's chest, wailing through his helmet. All of it happened before Fell could scramble to his feet. He stared down at Brightwater, who was cradling Larone's head in his lap. Then he looked up and saw his wife standing before him. He couldn't think of anything to say. That was when Thrawn's shuttle swung down over them. Its repulsors kicked air in their faces as it lowered itself right behind the DX-9. The ramp was already down. The alien stormtroopers and two Nori scrambled up first. They clung to the landing ramp struts and waved clawed hands down at the others, beckoning more to come. Sayal stared in shock at Thrawn's alien commandos. The whine of the Marauder Corvette's engines had become a roar. It would take off at any moment. Fell put a hand on his wife's shoulder and spoke his first words to her in over half a year. He said, go. Quiller took her other shoulder and helped her toward onto the hovering landing ramp. Two more Nori appeared and gave them the final boost as the shuttle swayed unsteadily on his repulsor lifts. Fell looked down at Lerone. His eyes stared lifelessly at the stars. Brightwater was crouched low, breathing hard, like he hadn't even noticed the shuttle that had come for them. Come on, Fell shook him, we have to go. I'm not leaving the boss. Brightwater's voice cracked. We'll take him together, Fell said. It was the least he could do. It would never be enough. One of Grant's troopers, maybe the one who disarmed Lerone's killer, had taken off his helmet. He couldn't have been more than twenty and his face burnished and smooth in the shuttle's floodlights, squinted up at Grave. The Admiral will kill us if we fail. He sounded like he was about to cry. We can't go back to him like this. Then don't, the other trooper grunted. But where will we go? Grave considered a moment before saying, you've got your ship and your men. If they're good men, you can go any place you damn well want to. Then Grave turned and hurried for the shuttle. He helped Fell and Brightwater lift Larone's body and carry him up the landing bay. Another Nori helped them pull him into the cargo hold. Quiller had already scrambled up to the cockpit, and he began to reel in the landing ramp. As it started to rise, one more Nori lurched up to grab his landing strut. His cloak had flown off in the wind, and Fell could see the scorch marks of a blaster shot scarring his side. Fell reached out. The alien took his hand. Grave grabbed him by the shoulders and together they hauled the nori, small but heavy, onto the deck. The nori collapsed, and his comrades rushed to his side. Is he all right? Asked another nori. Will he live? Behind them, Thrawn's voice said, this ship has medical supplies. We can see to his wound. The Grand Admiral was standing, one hand hanging off the grip rail that ran across the ceiling. He looked down at the wounded nori and asked, how was he injured? He attacked the leader of the enemy line himself, a third Nori said. He was wounded but kept fighting until his foe was dead. A brave warrior then? Thrawn said thoughtfully. What is your name? The alien looked up at the Grand Admiral. His face was smoother than the others, younger. Fell realized he must have been a new member of their team. Winston against the pain, the Nori said. I am Rook of Clan Baker. You've done well today, Rook. I'll remember that. The shuttle lurched as Quiller started the thrust engines and plunged them skyward. Fell looked around the deck for Sial. He spotted her, curled against the back wall. Their eyes met over Lerone's body. The Grand Admiral was still on his feet, 
Even as the shuttle began its rocking ascent, staring down at the dead soldier with inscrutable alien eyes. Octavian Grant had known all his life that in the end you could only depend on yourself, on your own competence, and wit and determination. That was doubly true if your allies were like Leonia Tavira, self-satisfied schemers more corrupt and conniving than actually capable. That was why, as Invidious fell back and Grey Wolf dipped beneath Orflam, he didn't panic. Thrawn's destroyer began firing straight upward with his dorsal turbolaser batteries, raking energy across Orflam's reinforced ventral shields. As he watched the tactical holo, Grant noticed the remaining star wings and TIE bombers vectoring for Oriflam's reactor bulge. If Thrawn wanted to try the same ploy he just used on Tavira, the alien was getting desperate. Captain Bremel, he called, are our tractor beam operating ready? Standing by as ordered, sir. Excellent. Helm, lower us down. Get us as close to Grey Wolf as we can without knocking shields. And make sure our interceptors are on those star wings. A sense echoed around the bridge. Grant watched the holo again and saw his ties clash with Thrawn's attack craft. A few of them shot off missiles but not nearly enough. They scattered and dissolved, and the shields over the generator bulge remained intact. Grey Wolf was still pumping a rain of turbolaser fire upward, though without much care of hitting specific targets. Thrawn clearly wanted to keep Grant's shields on the verge of overload and prevent him from mustered a strong counteroffensive. The brunt of Grey Wolf's guns was raking the aft section of Oriflam's hull, but soon the Star Destroyer would pass ahead and bring his main batteries to bear on Grant's main hangar section. It was time to act. Grant called, tell the first four tractors to begin. He wasn't too proud to steal, he'd gotten the idea from Makati's tactics at Bandomir. Like all destroyers of his class, Oriflam had eight tractor beam generators placed around the mouth of his main hangar bay plus two more outside his forward secondary hangar. The tractors were as useful for capturing enemy ships as they were for reeling and damaged TIE fighters. A fine-tuned tractor battery could even grab hold of something as small as a proton mine, and very capable operators could move, release, and effectively throw objects through the vacuum. The tracking systems for a Star Destroyer's guns followed targets by their thrust signature, and the mines were too small for gunners to target manually. Throwing objects via tractor beam could, at best, set them going at one quarter the speed of a missile with independent thrusters, but none of these warheads had far to go. They were likewise extremely difficult to aim, but a mile long star destroyer at near collision range was impossible to miss. When the first four tractor beam operators threw their mines, Grey Wolf didn't see them coming at all. It still had shields to full power over its entire dorsal superstructure with meant the first three mines simply impacted on the energy screens. The last slipped through and exploded in the direct dead center of the Star Destroyer's hull, obliterating its forward launch control tower and central ion cannon array. The concussive shock from the explosions was enough to send Trembles the Oriflam all the way to the command deck. Grant stayed on his feet and ordered, Tractors 5 through 8, go. Thrawn knew what was coming this time, and began firing everything he had at the main hangar complex. One proton mine exploded just after it was thrown, and the explosion overloaded a patch of ore flam shields and caused them to collapse. Another mine exploded against Grey Wolf's shields. The other two got through. One landed just forward of the command tower and gored a flaming hole in the heart of the ship. The second landed on the destroyer's port turbolaser battery row and tore a hole through the ship's side. Admiral, Grey Wolf's engines are failing, Captain Brimmer reported. Her shields are down. She's coasting dead in space. He'd done it. After everything, he'd finally done it. Oriflam still had two more mines ready to throw, and could obliterate his command tower with ease. Even if Tavira somehow slipped away with Starflare, he'd bested the upstart alien who squirmed his way into a Grand Admiral's uniform, and right now that felt immeasurably more important. Grant felt like shouting and throwing his fists in the air. Instead, he took a deep, deep breath and said, Come, hail that ship. I want to talk to Grand Admiral Thrawn. The damage reports were too much to take in, and Dagon Nerys knew it was over. 
flame and debris still poured into space from the massive hole the mine had gouged out of the superstructure ahead of them. Through the field of twisted, floating metal he could look out the forward viewport and see Oriflam's superstructure slipping past overhead, too slowly. Nearest took a deep breath. He was surprised how okay he felt. Not good, not after fighting so hard and failing, but he felt okay. He'd held Grant here for hours, far from Oran three, and given the Grand Admiral the best chance he could. He said, Come, hail Corvus. Nobody seemed to hear him over the alarms and shouted, panic reports, so he walked over to the comp station, grabbed an ensign by the shoulder, and said, Grant will be going for Corvus next. Tell her to wait until Grant gets close to firing range, then drop gravity wells. He should leave her alone then, and it will give Thrawn a little more time. The young Kree looked up at Nerys, blinked, then nodded stupidly. Do it, Ensign. He did. Like so many of them, he was too young to die. One more thing, he said. Tell Corvus to salvage as many people from the ship as she can. He couldn't quite bring himself to say, if there's anyone left. The ensign nodded again and go to work. From another console, the comm lieutenant said, Captain, we have incoming. It's from Oriflam. Nearest took a deep breath. He tugged his uniform straight. Somehow it felt important. He walked over to the lieutenant and said, Put him on. Nearest had never spoken with Grand Admiral Grant before, or any Grand Admiral besides Thrawn. He had gray hair, narrow eyes, and a lined aged face. The broad shoulders and epaulette on his uniform looked a little too big for him. His voice was crisp and precise, but shot through with anger as he said, Who are you? I want to speak with Grand Admiral Thrawn. I am Dagon Nerys, captain of the Star Destroyer Grey Wolf. I don't care who you are. Where's Thrawn? Thrawn is not aboard this vessel. What? But that's his ship. I know it is. Nearest considered, then decided not to tell Grant that Thrawn had gone ahead to Oron 3. The Grand Admiral is absent at this time. He charged me to lead the fight. Grant's face ran through a chain of emotions, first disbelief, then indignation, then scowling anger, and finally sighing resignation. Finally, his holographic eyes locked on Nearest's. He said, You fought well, Captain. Thank you. I hope Thrawn knows how loyal you were in the end. I hope so too, sir. He hoped it more than anything. Grant nodded slightly and said, Goodbye, Captain Nearest. The holo winked off. Nearest turned away. He walked slowly over to the tactical station. Despite all the system failures, the holo was still up. He planted a hand on the ensign's shoulder and asked, What have we got? She jerked slightly at his touch but said, it looks like they have two more mines held at the secondary hangar bay. Can we fire on them? Our guns are down, sir. Without taking his hand off her shoulder, he shifted his stance so he could see Oriflam's underside running over their head. The small forward hangar was nearly right above them. Sir, the ensign started, but said nothing more. Her shoulder was shaking. Nearest squeezed it tighter. He couldn't remember her name. She was young and pretty, he'd never noticed that before. He would have, once, a long time ago. There was so much he'd given up in service of the cause. He saw a flicker of fast motion outside Oriflam's secondary hangar. As the last mines fell to meet them nearest squeezed her shoulder tighter and said, We held, Ensign. We held. As the escort shuttle soared skyward, Soon Tirfell found the strength to climb against strong G-forces and pulled himself into the cockpit. Quiller was at the helm and one of the green-scaled aliens at the co-pilot seat. Thrawn held tight to the latter's seat and Fell placed himself behind Quiller. That Marauder Corvette is gaining fast, Thrawn said, voice cool and steady even now. Somehow his calm made him seem even more alien. I see it, the co-pilot said, trying to hit it with the rear cannon but it has front shields on full power. A few laser blasts streaked ahead of them. They're warning shots, Fell said. Keep going. I don't know if they've got anything to lose by shooting us down at this point, said Quiller. I'll keep shooting at them, said the co-pilot, but oh, that's not good. What is it? 
Phil strained to see his sensor screen. That, Thrawn said, and pointed out the forward viewport. Phil saw it now. They cleared the atmosphere, and the stars shone strong ahead. Dead in the center of the starfield were the off-white diamond shapes of two Imperial Star Destroyers. Vonter, Thrawn said, is Grey Wolf still in the system? Yes, Admiral. But, the co-pilot glanced at his scanners. Sir, Grey Wolf is dead in space. Her entire command tower was been vaporized. Corvus has lowered her gravity wells and has taken as many survivors aboard as she can. More lasers from the corvette speared past them. Thrawn swallowed and asked, what are those ships ahead? Oriflam and Invidious, sir. For a second, Thrawn's body seemed to sag forward. His head bent low, and he looked like an awful weight was crushing him. Then he sucked in breath, stood straight again, and said with a shaking voice, can we jump to hyperspace before they reach us? We'll be okay so long as that corvette doesn't shoot us down, said Quiller, oh, fear feck. The shuttle shook harder than before. Fell was nearly thrown forward onto Quiller's back. The pilot said, that one broke our shields. We can hold for now, but they're definitely not kidding around. What about the hyperdrive? Asked Fell. Holding for now. One more hit and we're dead in space. Hold on, the co-pilot said. I'm getting another ship coming from the planet. One X-wing, coming up fast. When that Imperial escort shuttle soared into the sky, Wedge Antilles stopped in the grass and watched it go for approximately five awful seconds. Then he sprinted for his X-Wing. Over a decade as a combat pilot had honed his senses of space and direction, even in the night, even after the frantic fight after leaving the Corvette, he knew exactly where to find his X-Wing. He crawled into the Stilopin cockpit, fired up the engines, and strapped on his helmet. By the time he got in the air, the Marauder Corvette had already taken off. It was a big ship but a fast one and it was flying in straight pursuit of the escort shuttle as it climbed toward the stars. Wedge checked his scanners and saw, beyond those two ships, a pair of massive Imperial Star Destroyers fly into the planet. He screamed inside his cockpit. If he didn't shoot down that corvette, Tavira would get Sial. If he did kill it, then Isert would claim her instead. There was no way to win. The only battle he could fight was right in front of him. He armed his torpedoes and settled on the corvette's aft. It seemed so intent on shooting at the shuttle that it was paying barely any attention to him. One defensive Tourette swung around to spray lasers back at him but he dodged them easily. He dropped his reticule on the glow of his starboard engine, the one he'd already hit before on the way down, and popped off two torpedoes. The first impacted on the shields, the second broke through. The corvette shuddered under the explosion. The starboard thruster sputtered and died, cutting its speed in half as it tried to climb into orbit. Suddenly, it was falling at first right onto Wedge. He nimbly flipped his fighter over the ship's nose, cut his own speed, and sprayed laser blasts all over his hull. As they breached the atmospheric envelope and entered orbit, Wedge gave his thrust engines one forward kick, then killed them entirely. He used his directional repulsors to spin himself nose over tail to face the dark night side face of Oron 3 and the corvette struggling to surge past it. He targeted the glow of the command deck and fired off all the torps he had left. The first two impacted on the ship's forward shields, the rest tore through the bridge's viewport and exploded the hull from the inside out. The corvette seemed to stall for a moment in low orbit, then its flaming debris tumbled back toward the planet far below. Wedge spun his fighter back around again and chased the shuttle. Wow. Quiller marveled as he looked at his rear scanners. That X-Wing took out the Corvette all but itself. Who's flying that thing? My brother-in-law, Fell said with satisfaction. Then he heard Sile's voice saying, what happened to Wedge? She was holding tight onto the cockpit doorframe, peeking her head between Fell's and Thrawn's shoulders. He's all right, Fell said and drew an arm around her shoulders. It was the second thing he said to her in six months. He'd never been sure what their reunion would be like, but he never expected this. That X-Wing's dead behind us, the co-pilot said, and a bunch of Grant's ties are right on their way. Hell that X-Wing, 
Sayal lurched forward. I have to talk to Wedge. The co-pilot looked back at Thrawn. Admiral, we just cleared the gravity well. Those ties will be on us in minutes. Please, sir, Fell said. Let us try. Grant's destroyer is pumping out a lot of jamming, Quiller said. I don't know if it can get through. Thrawn sucked in breath. One minute. Static burst in Wedge's helmet comlink, making him wince as he got closer and closer to the escort shuttle. It wasn't using his rear cannon to fire at him, but he had no idea what to do when he caught up with it. A part of him knew that, if Isard was going to capture Fell, he had a duty to the New Republic prevent that any way he could, even if it meant shooting down the shuttle. But he'd left the New Republic behind on Eddie IV. He'd left everything behind except the sister who was ahead of him now, about to slip away forever. A voice broke through the static, high and female and familiar from a lifetime ago. Wedge. Can you hear me? Wedge. Sayal. He barked. Sayal, is that you? Wedge. Her voice faded in and out of static. Please, respond. Wedge. Damn it. Wedge pounded his console. Sayal, what's happening? How did you get this calm? There was more static. He could barely make out the words. Go, Wedge. No! Sayal, I'm not letting Icer take you. Sayal, can you hear me? More static. And then the clear words. I'm sorry, Wedge. And then his world ended. Fell held Sayal's shoulders and she leaned in between Quiller and Vanter ceased to speak into the console's audio grill saying, Wedge, can you hear me? Wedge. There was a burst of static, but Fell thought he could hear someone calling her name. Wedge. Sayal repeated, please, as you can hear this, respond, Wedge. Static drowned out any reply. Vanter said nervously, those ties are almost in firing range. We have to go. Hyperdrive's ready, Quiller said. Sayal was crying now. Saying we can't stay here, we have to go, Wedge. You have to go. Through the noise, they could barely hear Wedge's desperate voice say, Sayal, can you hear me? Time's up. Vanta called. I'm sorry, Wedge, she sobbed. I'm so sorry. Jump, said Thrawn. They jumped. The stars and TIE fighters and destroyers ahead of them vanished in an instant. The light blur of hyperspace filled their viewport and Sayal sagged against her husband's arms. She cried against his shoulder, whispering, Not again, not again. Quiller, Vanter, and Thrawn all looked away, though in this cramped cockpit there was little else to see. Fell wrapped his arms around her back and held her for as long as she needed. His X-wing soared through space, but Wedge didn't touch the control stick. TIE fighters were screaming toward him and were almost in firing range, but he barely noticed. He couldn't find a reason to do anything, not even lift his hand. He didn't understand how Sayal had been able to call him, or why that shuttle had jumped to hyperspace instead of flying right to the closest star destroyer. The pilot, probably, had been afraid Wedge would fire a torpedo at his own sister rather than let her fall into enemy hands. It was a ruthless, imperial way of thinking. It may have been right. He couldn't imagine what fate awaited Fell and Sayal. He didn't want to, because whatever it was, it was his fault. The ties were getting close now. The first flecks of green laser blast whipped by, though none came close to hitting. Go, witch. That's what she told him. He didn't even know where to go. He's deserted the New Republic, the rogues, his friends, all to watch his sister sail away from his again. Another laser came closer enough to flash green light over his face. Go, Wedge. It was all he could do. Go. He reached out. He touched his controls and warmed up the hyperdrive. He touched the control stick and, on instinct, shuttered his fighter to one side, nimbly avoiding another laser volley. When his ship was ready, Wedge Antilles did what his sister told him to. He went. Grand Admiral Octavian Grant stood at the fore of Oriflam's bridge. Before him lay the dark face of Oron III, the remains of his fighter wing, and nothing else. Cautiously, Captain Brimmel said, that X-Wing has jumped to hyperspace. Sir, 
just like the shuttle. What about our troops on the ground? They are not responding to our hails, sir. Grant stared at the blackness ahead and said nothing. He felt hollow beyond words. A minute later, Brimmel spoke again. Sir, tactical reports that Invidious is breaking away. It looks like she's moving for an exit vector. Let her run, Grant sighed. Tavira had gotten more out of today than he had, and in her own way, the little trollop had earned it. He stared at the blackness ahead for another minute. Then Brimmel said, Sir, that interdictor is still doing salvage on Grey Wolf. Should we move to engage? Why? He looked over his shoulder at the young man finally. Brimmel thought on that. He couldn't find an answer either. Weakly, he said, I was just asking, sir. Just plot us a course out of here, Captain. Yes, sir. He paused yet again, then asked, Sir, where should we go? Grant looked away without responding. He stared at the stars and the black planet ahead of him, as thought that great void could give him an answer. But it gave him nothing. It gave him nothing at all. Chapter 42 84 The last four X-Wings and Rouge Squadron settled on the flanks of an old void bent class assault shuttle as it soared low over the grassy fields of Eddie IV. All five craft were heading for the smoking ruins of the Lanchensor estate, which was still trapped in the shadow of Grand Admiral Makati's Star Destroyer. At the same time, the other Imperial Destroyer had interposed itself between Steadfast and Emancipator. Though it was lighting up Emancipator's face with broadside volleys, it couldn't do much against the old Clone Wars destroyer that had dropped in out of nowhere and Ren Vakil still didn't know the story behind that and didn't look like it would last that much longer. Ren was a little surprised that Makati hadn't resorted to typical imp brutality and vaporized everything beneath Steadfast now that it looked like was going to lose his prize, but there was no point in asking questions when things were very tentatively going their way again. This Bantham one, a voice said in Ren's headset. We're going to be setting down on the north end of the main promenade. Understood, one, said Hobby. We'll cover for you. Do you think they're still down there? Asked Ren. Only one way to find out, said Jansen. Ren hadn't had to explain that they meant both Princess Leia Organa and their own downed pilot Avon. Jansen had already shot up and an ST that had pinned them both down at Evans crashed X-Wing, and they were gambling that the wounded pilot wouldn't have got far. Losing Evan and Felis one right after the other had jarred the remaining Rouges almost as much as Wedge and Fell's sudden disappearance. It had especially shaken Ren, who'd heard familiar panic in Evan's voice when he thought Felis had gone down without ejecting. He couldn't blame Evan for losing his focus after that. After Ivedism's death it had taken Ren weeks to really focus when he was inside his cockpit, and he seriously considered quitting even active service altogether. His squad mates were luckier. The shuttle Bantha III had already grabbed Felis. He hoped she'd get her chance to be reunited with Avon soon enough. The Imperials seemed to be moving their heavy vehicles outside the estate grounds. Zarks observed a steadfast giant blue ion engine swelled right ahead of them. I don't like that, Ren said. They must be getting ready to pound everything beneath them. Then we make this quick, Hobby said. Bantha 1, tell us when you're ready to drop. Couple squints at 2 o'clock, Jansen warned. Copy. You and Zarks take M. Ren, stay with me. Ren held his position on the shuttle's right flank while Jansen and Zarks peeled away to fight back the ties. The remaining three ships dipped beneath the glare of steadfast engines and dove toward the main street running straight through the center of the estate. The Star Destroyer's ventral turbulacers began taking pot shots at the hefty assault shuttle but they still couldn't nail their target. Getting ready to drop, called Bantha 1. Ren and Hobby kicked their retro burners on to slow their X-wings as the assault shuttle killed its engines and rose as repulsors down to the rubble-strewn street. As he and Hobby began flying tight protective circles directly above the landed shuttle, Nren leaned close to the edge of his cockpit and peered down. He could see Avon's wrecked X-Wing at the end of a long scorched streak, and the still standing legs of the headless at ST that Jansen had killed. Then he saw figures scurrying toward the shuttle, and his heart lifted. Leia waved them on toward the shuttle's open bay doors. 
dozens of civilian estate staff who'd been trapped by Grand Admiral Makati's sudden arrival. A Benthaclass assault shuttle had room for nearly a hundred people, and she intended to get as many to safety as she could. She'd already tasked two espos to make sure Avon got on safe, and they'd been the first ones aboard. As more piled onto the shuttle, she felt her comlink buzz in her gown's tiny pocket. She took one look up the sky, at the two circling X wings, and the destroyer still overhead, then answered. We're at the shuttle now, she called. Main promenade. We saw it and we're coming now, Boris Philia panted on the other end. He sounded like he was sprinting her way as they spoke. Hurry up. The shuttle's filling up fast. Leia stuffed her comlink into her pocket. She looked back to the shuttle. Winter was waving more refugees into his maw. The white-haired woman caught Leia's eye and hurried back down the line back to her friend. Winter looked faintly bizarre as she readjusted the strap of the blaster rifle hanging off the shoulder, while at the same time gusts of air generated by the shuttle's repulsors played chaotically with her long hair and the chopped-off skirt of what had once been a formal gown. Of course, Leia had no doubt she looked just as ridiculous. Are the others coming? Winter asked her. Borsk said they're on their way. How much longer? Winter looked up at the Star Destroyer. I don't know. It sounded like he was running hard. We all got our exercise today, muttered Winter. Before Leia could respond, they heard the sound of blaster fire. Suddenly a mass of people charged around a corner and onto the promenade near Avon's crashed X-Wing. Amazingly enough, Borsk Filaya was leading the charge running for his life with his aides right behind him and a handful of espos at the rear, providing covering fire against a group of stormtroopers. Winter grabbed Leia's arm and pulled her toward the shuttle. The last few refugees had scrambled aboard, and the two women climbed onto the loading dock without ducking inside. The extra elevation gave them the range they needed, and they began firing down at the approaching stormtroopers. Philia and the other two Bothans were first onto the ramp. As Imnel and Brelia ran inside, Philia nearly collapsed against the bay doors. Philanthus and Vice Prex Melordican rushed past him into the shuttle. After that, there were only Espos. Come on! Leia called to them as more stormtroopers appeared in the street. Into the shuttle. Now. What happened to the Prex? asked Winter. Leia hadn't even noticed Regothel was missing. The stormtroopers got him? Captured, Philia wheezed as the first Espas jumped onto the landing ramp. Leia had no idea what would happen to these men, now that their government would officially brand them traitors, but they fought well today. Maybe the New Republic had a place for anyone, even them. When the last Espo was aboard, Leia finally went inside the shuttle. By that point, the craft was already beginning to rise on its repulsors. Leia slipped and shouldered her way through the packed cargo hold to the cockpit. By the time they got there, the estate grounds were falling fast beneath them. Soon they'd rise above the observation tower there they started this very long day. Leia asked the pilot, Are we at capacity? Or can we get more people? The man shook his head. Sorry, counselor. The imps are pulling their troops out. That destroyer could start raining hellfire on us any minute. Leia grimaced, but she knew there was nothing they could do. She saw X-Wings settling on either side of them as they punched toward the sunlit clouds. Stray laser blasts knocked against the shuttle shields, but they kept flying true, and soon enough they escaped from beneath steadfast and sunlight fell from a beautiful cloud-streaked sky. Incoming call, the co-pilot said. It's from Rogue Leader. Put him on, Leia said, leaning awkwardly over his shoulder to get close to the speaker grill. We have Avin. Repeat, we picked him up. He's fine. Great to hear it, came the reply. It was a familiar voice, but it wasn't Wedge. It wasn't Tycho either. Leia could picture the dour face, but for the life of her, she couldn't find a name. This is Rogue Leader? Correct. She said. That's right. Hobby Clivian. There it was. What happened to Wedge? Is he okay? There was an awful too long pause before Clivian said, I'm sorry, I just don't know. I'll explain later. Before Leia could ask any more, the pilot announced that they were beginning their climb out of the atmosphere. 
the force of Accelerate pressed Leia against the cockpit's rear bulkhead. Clouds filled the viewport ahead of them, soothing swirls of fat vaporous white against a pale blue backdrop. It had seemed beautiful just a moment ago. Now, the bright scene felt darkened by uncertainty. But there was nothing Leia could do about it now. She gripped the back of the pilot's seat with both hands as they soared toward freedom. Grand Admiral Makati's heart clenched in his chest as he watched Tenacious fall nose first from the sky. When the two Rebel Star Destroyers had finally moved, they'd attacked with unchecked ferocity. The old Venator-class ship had pounded Tenacious's, after while the former accuser pulled into a steep climb and fired broadsides that tore another massive flaming hole in the ship's port side. Worse was the knowledge that the Rebels would have never fought like this if they'd been worried about protecting their people on the ground. They come charging even before Makati had initiated bombardment of the estate grounds, which meant they managed to successfully evacuate their people. And that meant everything Makati had done since coming to the corporate sector had been for nothing. Now, from his spot on a command deck still littered with blaster scorched bodies, he watched as tenacious his engines died and his bow tipped toward the great sprawling fields below. Starfighters, Rebel and Imperial alike, soared away as fast as they could before the destroyer hit the surface. At first it seemed to crumple both to stern under its own weight and the pull of Eddie Ivy's gravity. Then his atmosphere-fueled fires burst out of the hull, throwing scorched debris in all directions. The shockwave of the explosion buffeted all the ships in the air, and Makati was nearly thrown off his feet. Behind him, he heard Captain Vivant telling Hell to take them out of here as fast as possible. He hurried over to the tactical station and saw what he'd been afraid to see. Accuser was still pulling upward with the intent of cutting off Steadfast ascent, while the old Venator was coming in low to take him from behind. Far in orbit, those Mon Cal cruisers were waiting, but those were the least of his concerns. The two destroyers in the atmosphere were dead set on preventing him from, from getting to orbit at all. A voice in Makati's head told him he couldn't let himself die like this. Not after narrowly surviving an assassination attempt on his own bridge. Not after coming so far and failing. He couldn't die without redeeming himself. He looked back at the fireball Tenacious had left behind as it burned bright on the horizon, and his mind flashed back to the side of the warship seemingly collapsing under its own weight. Some things were so obvious you forget about them. Captain. He called to Vivant. Tell the hangar crews to load every ship they can into the docking clamps. Get ready to drop them. Vivant stared in confusion. Drop, sir. I said drop. Take all our extra shuttles, scout craft, anything that's not in the air. If we have extra warheads, load them aboard. But not people. Do you understand? Sir, I don't. He jabbed a finger to the tactical display. The Venator is coming up beneath us to to force us into accuser. Directly beneath us, Captain. Recognition lit in his eyes. Oh. Oh, sir, do you think that will work? They're shields. We can't overwhelm them. Just do it, Captain. Drop everything. Vivant rushed away to comply. Makati didn't know if it would break the shields, or if it would work at all. But it was the only chance he had. He watched the tactical holo closely. Sure enough, the Clone Wars destroyer had settled right beneath him, and was pumping turbo lasers right into steadfast ventral shields. It was rising steadily up on his repulse orlifts, forcing Makati toward accuser, which was planning to cut in on his starboard flank and probably pulverize his command tower. Captain, he called. Tell me when they're ready. They're hurrying, sir. Accuser would be within firing range very soon. Steadfast hadn't taken too much damage in the battle so far, but it wouldn't last long against that destroyer. Not when the Mon Cal ships above started raining down laser fire, which they'd do soon enough. The one good sign was that the Venator was holding place right beneath them. He considered signaling Shadow Squadron but held off. He needed to save that surprise for last. Finally, Vivant said, Sir, they're ready. Do it now, Captain. Drop everything. He wished he could have seen it with his own eyes, the shock on the faces of the Venator's crew. Instead he had to satisfy himself with the tactical display and a vivid imagination. He pictured hundreds of tons of equipment disabled TIE fighters, spare assault shuttles, 
speeder bikes, cargo crates all tumbling out of the main hangar and falling like oversized bullets onto the Rebel Star Destroyer. For the first few seconds, it looked like the ship's dorsal shields were holding. Then some large object tore through and impacted on its bow. Something else, something with a live warhead inside, plunged through the hull next and detonated inside the superstructure. Admiral, the Venator stopped climbing. The tactical lieutenant sounded as surprised as he was happy. All ventral cannons, fire downward. Kill that ship if you can, Makati commanded. Helm, take us up as fast as you can. Shields, all power to starboard. The ship's artificial gravity systems groaned in protest as they stabbed toward the stars perpendicular to the planet below. At the same time, Accuser peppered their flank with turbolaser blasts but couldn't break through. That left one problem. Makati half walked, half slid across the inclined deck to the comm station. He clung to the back of the lieutenant's chair and said, Hell Shadow Squadron. Tell them to do it. Do it now. The comm officer complied. Still holding his chair, Makati glanced across the room at the tactical holo. The Thai Phantoms had kept their Stygian cloaks on since leaving Steadfast Hangar, and not even friendly scanners would trace their movements. Makati wasn't watching for that, though. The whole ship shuddered as they pierced the atmospheric envelope and soared into space, right toward the waiting Mon Cal cruisers. The first light started winking on the holo, and the tactical crew started reading, off reports of explosions at key shield projectors and weapon emplacements on the Mon Cal ships. Those cruisers had been simply waiting for Makati to come to them without having to engage any Imperial ships in space, and they lowered their weapons without suspecting that cloaked ships had settled near key locations on their hull. Each TIE Phantom could only hit one target at a time, but they could move quickly from one to another, and they knew which to take out first. As steadfast soared into orbit, Leave an accuser to chase his tail. The two cruisers frantically tried to turn their hulls to angle size with operable weapon systems at the approaching Star Destroyer. As the crippled warships appeared through the forward viewport, Makati was very tempted to engage them. He fought down the urge. Even if they did stop to destroy just one more enemy cruiser, it would give time for the fully functional accuser to catch up. Captain Vivant, he said smoothly. Yes, Admiral. Tell Shadow Squadron to return to the barn. Once they're accounted for, fire up the hyperdrive and take us home. With pleasure, sir. It was wiser and safer to forego the kill and get out of here. Judging from the cheers that had already broken out across his normally well-ordered bridge, he didn't think his crew would mind. As they soared past the Mon Cal ships, Makati allowed himself to close his eyes and let go of a long, relieved sigh. He failed in his mission to the corporate sector, and vengeance had disappeared under his watch. This mission was a failure, and he'd have to answer to Isard for that. But still, he kept his eyes closed and listened to the cheers from his soldiers who'd lived to fight another day. Right now, they were all he needed. They were all he could ever want. Before Fangs are impacted on the surface of Eddie IV, his crew took emergency measures to prevent it from exploding as horrifically as tenacious. They managed to level out his nose and fire, all bottom repulsors to cushion the blow, though the impact still threw every standing crewman to the deck. In the end, Fangzar smashed into the surface but did not ignite. His hull tore a long black gash across the rolling fields before coming to a halt. The third scar in the landscape cut a straight line between the rubble of the Lanchinzor estate on one side and tenacious black, still burning crater on the other. Garm Bell Iblis had just barely managed to grab hold of the closest console before the impact. He'd still been knocked forward, and his head had slammed into a bulkhead, dropping him unconscious. When he came to he found himself staring up the ceiling of his bridge. The air smelled like smoke, and maybe the air was smoky too, or maybe he had a concussion. Everything looked blurry. He felt something warm and wet run down his forehead and wondered if it was blood. He twitched his arms and legs, they all moved on command. Somehow, his old body hadn't failed him yet. He struggled to prop himself up on his elbow. Someone knelt down beside him and helped him sit upright. He was unsurprised to find Cena leak Vold Madanil at his side yet again. Cena, he muttered, 
wiping at his forehead. Report. All engines dead, sir. We can't contact anyone forward of Section 11 and below Deck 17. That was over half the ship. He couldn't begin to count those dead. What about Makati? He escaped, sir. He did something to the Mon Cal ships in orbit and sailed free. I'm sorry, sir. No. No, I'm sorry. He looked down at his hand and blinked his eyes into focus. The blood there was like an accusation. We should never have come here. This ship, all our soldiers, we should have left Mon Mothma's people to fight this fight. Sir, please don't apologize. We shouldn't have been fighting her war. Sir, please, Cena said firmly, we still helped save Philia and Organa. And we gave that superstar destroyer a good beating. Now he was starting to wonder if he was hallucinating. Cena, what are you talking about? You counseled me against this mission. Maybe I was wrong. Tell that to everyone under Deck 17. He shook his head. Don't tell me you want to throw in with Mon Mothman now. Well, the comms are still working. Admiral Drayson called and offered assistance. He considered that for a long, long moment. Then he asked, What about Peregrine and Harrier? Are they in orbit? Yes, sir. They've also got rescue crews on the way. Then it's all we'll need. Tell Drayson we politely declined his offer. We're not fighting their wars anymore after this, Cena. Never again. Yes, sir, she said. But he could see the doubt in her eyes. The doubt stayed with him even after she left to relay his orders. Without Fangzar, they'd be down to just six old dreadnoughts, compared to the ever-growing fleet under Mon Mothma. Garmbel Iblis had made a career out of stubborn idealism and hopeless causes, but there was still a practical core in him, deep down, that knew the rift between two old Republic senators could only end one way. But then he looked around the bridge and smelled the smoke and thought of all his dead. It might end, but not today. There was still too much blood on the scales. Once the post-battle checks were complete and Steadfast had sailed well clear of the corporate sector, Grand Admiral Afshimakati finally retreated to his personal quarters. After everything he felt lightheaded and dazed, and he'd repeatedly checked with Captain Vivant to make sure atmosphere levels between all sections of the ship really had equalized. According to Vivant, the air was perfectly breathable all over which meant the only thing that could be affecting Makati was sheet, overwhelming relief at having survived any IV. When he went to his cabin, he entered the key code and slipped through the open portal. The door slid shut behind him. He froze where he was, took a deep, deep breath, and realized, at last, how damn tired he was. He hadn't slept since before getting the call from Icerd on Bonadin, telling him to rush to where he really Corey was. He recalled he'd been awake for almost 10 hours before that, and he had been acting on pure adrenaline since then. A small part of him wanted to call F4GR and get a shot of tea. The rest of him just wanted to surrender to his bed. He'd have to answer to Icer soon enough, and it was sure be an ugly conversation. For now, the escape from Eddie IV still felt like a victory. He wanted to go to sleep with the satisfaction that he'd saved his ship and his crew against terrible odds. He hoped it brought good dreams. He unbuttoned his uniform jacket and stepped into the foyer. F4GR was standing right where Mackett had left him. The droid's glowing photoreceptor stared dead ahead. He didn't seem to have registered his master's arrival at all. Forger, Makati called. Are you all right? The droid's head spun to look at him. The light in his photoreceptors flickered for a moment, like there'd been a small power surge in his main cortex. Forger. Makati repeated. What's wrong? The droid said, I'm very sorry, sir. Sorry about what? Makati frowned. It happened so fast he could barely resist her at all. The droid's arm rising up, the forearm plate sliding away, the blaster snapping into view, and the flash of light that ended everything. Epilogue. Reenlistment. Invidious. After escaping the Oren system and plotting a route out of the corporate sector, Leonia Tavira had decided the first thing she needed was a shower. The one inside Captain Morox's quarters was excellent, with a warm temperature and a steady soothing water stream. Before going in she scoured the rest of his cabin too. Based on his belongings, 
The man had been a Sabic enthusiast, an amateur blitzball player, and, a little surprisingly, a collector of fine wines. Tavira decided the last would make a good start in rebuilding her collection of spirits. As happy as she was to have Invidious, a part of her mourned the loss of courtesan, and not only for the spoil she'd kept aboard. The Corvette had been small but agile, pretty but durable, easily underestimated but considerably dangerous. That was how she liked to think of herself too, which was probably why she'd taken to it. Still, she traded the lesser ship for the greater one, and had no regrets. She was disappointed to have lost Captain Wuck, as well as Van Tyrock. The latter had been ambitious and wouldn't probably have tried to betray her eventually, so in that sense it was good he was gone. Still, his force powers were useful, and she made a mental note to seek out his homeworld. He said it was still under an imperial heel, but she'd find a way to make that work for her. She always did. She set a time to meet with Billy Bango to go over all the repairs and work that needed to be done on the ship, but Captain Morox's shower had been so soothing she'd lost track of time. She scrambled to dry herself off and, realizing nothing in Morox's wardrobe would fit, simply threw on the jacket of her old moth's uniform before dashing barefoot out the door. She found the Zexto Slicer waiting for her on the bridge. Rosk and his enforcers had cleared out all his former crew, and, aside from Tavira and Bulibango, the deck was yawning and empty. Bulibango took her over to one of the operating stations and started showing her schematics of the ship, explaining what kind of damage they'd taken and what they'd need to do to repair it. Finding replacement parts for a stolen Star Destroyer won't be easy, he warned her. I know. I'm willing to take time to patch this ship up, even if it means laying low for a time. It's also designed for a crew of over 30,000 beings. After losing Courtesan, we've got less than 200. We have ourselves a Star Destroyer, Bulibango. Pirates from across the galaxy will flock to this ship. We only need to hold our own until we build up a good crew. How are the automated systems? They can get us from place to place but not much more. We barely made it through that fight, and only because a lot of the Imperial crew realized they had to help us or die. Bulibango turned away from the display and looked straight at her. What do we do with 30,000 captives? Sell them for necessary materials, I imagine. Slaves, then? Yes. I was thinking hut space. They're still in the market and I'm sure they'd have resources to fix Invidious. Bulibango nodded. All right. I'll see who has contacts. Tavira smiled at him. You're quite industrious. How would you like to be my new first officer? He blinked in surprise and looked around the big, empty bridge. Captain, I'd be honored. I thought as much. Now, what else did you have planned? I also wanted to go down to the hangar bay. It's full of TIE fighters and other equipment that need beings who can work them. I understand. We'll have to work on recruited starfighter pilots. She looked around the empty bridge. Go on ahead, Bulibango. I'll catch up with you shortly. The Zexto nodded and walked off the bridge. She watched him until he was gone, then spun in a slow circle and took in everything. She walked down the center aisle of the bridge, savoring every touch of cool deck plating on her bare feet. She continued up to the forward viewport and looked out at the off-white spread of a Star Destroyer stretching out a mile ahead of her. Stars spanned in every direction like infinite possibilities. It was everything she'd ever wanted. Tavira started laughing, alone on the empty bridge. She keeled forward and braced herself against the viewport, palms flat on vacuum cool transparent steel. Everything she'd ever done, from her childhood on Yatu onward, felt like had been leading to this moment. Everything had been means to this end, even the imperial uniform she'd worn. She realized that now, finally, she had no need of it. She surpassed it. She hastily tore open her jacket and cast it off, throwing it into the crew pit. With a wide-eyed and joyous smile, she pressed the naked skin of her back against the transparent steel and felt the cold of space seep through her. She spread bare arms and legs against it and felt all the stars spread out behind her while the heart of this beautiful ship lay before her, quietly waiting to give her anything she wanted. Tavira kept smiling an enraptured smile 
and knew deep down it was the happiest she'd ever be. Reaper. The shuttle from Oriflam sat down in the middle of Reaper's vast hangar bay and was met with more than appropriate splendor. As he walked down the landing ramp and onto the deck, Grant did a quick count, ten rows of stormtroopers on either side of the central aisle and twelve soldiers per row. In comparison to all that pomp, Grand Moff Kane looked positively humble as he stood alone at the base of the ramp. Welcome aboard, Octavian, Kane said warmly. Welcome to the Pentaster alignment. Grant stopped in front of Kane, hesitated for a moment, then decided to salute. Their brief conversation since Oron III hadn't determined the exact nature of their arrangement, but it felt like the right thing to do. Grant might be the alignment's new supreme military commander, but Kane was still its governor. Walk with me, please, Kane said, and they began strolling past the lines of stormtroopers. I just wanted to say again how pleased I am you came to join us. It was the wisest course of action, Grant said simply. His failure to either capture Starflare or kill Thrawn at Oron 3 had been just the first blow. Then had come the news of the rebel leader's escape from Eddie IV and Captain Sisko's desertion. Where he'd taken the battered vengeance, nobody seemed to know, but to lose a superstar destroyer right after gaining it would have left Isard murderously angry. Finally had come the news of Grand Admiral Makati's assassination. Every loss until then had left Grant feeling hollow. That had left him angry. The man had performed brilliantly and battled once again, only be be murdered by rebel sabotage. The news had also left Grant afraid, as the last Grand Admiral the rebels knew about. There was no doubt they'd throw their assassins at him next, and Makati's killing showed they weren't to be underestimated. Given the pact Kane had just made with the so-called New Republic leaders, the Pentaster alignment had suddenly become the safest place in the galaxy, at least for Octavian Grant. So he'd ordered Captain Brimmel to set a course, and held artist Kane requesting asylum and offering his services. Kane had acted very pleased, but Grant still felt like a beggar. That was the worst part about Kane's warm mood and the grandiose reception. Deep down, Grant knew he didn't deserve it. Kane didn't bother to show off his superstar destroyer as before. Instead, they went up to his personal cabin and shared a bottle of that golden Sardinanian brew. I'll keep these quarters furnished for when I visit Reaper, Kane said as he poured, but I intend to conduct most of my business from Sardinanian now. You'll have your own quarters prepared as you like them, of course. Grant sat back in his chair and sipped from his glass. Very well. If I can be blunt, what will I actually use the ship for? Patrol the border. Uphold our territorial integrity. This isn't a warship. It's a deterrent. That's right. But as I mentioned before, so much of our fleet is otherwise lacking. We've taken to refitting lots of indicator-type pickets because we don't have enough star destroyers. You can be very creative, Octavian. I want you to find new ways to get the rest of our fleet in fighting shape. Fighting whom? No one in the near future, I hope. It was a smart, prudent, careful policy, but they both knew that one day someone would come for them. Once Singe, Isert, and the rebels were done fighting each other, the Pentaster alignment would suddenly find itself with the same enemy on all sides. When that day came, Grant would find himself a marked man yet again, and he'd have to make another decision as to where his future lay. Kane tapped a set of controls on his desk and projected a hollow image on the far wall. It showed a massive arena with the Imperial City skyline in the background. Armored stormtroopers, countless more than had just greeted Grant filled the parade ground. Long lines of people were moving slowly along the central aisle, to and from a podium at the far end. The rectangular box of a coffin was so tiny it was barely visible. This is a live feed, Kane explained. They're giving him a full state funeral. I heard they've already started construction for a memorial on Monument Plaza. Grant sighed and settled back in his chair. He was a better man than I. Kane looked at us sharply. You're the one who survived. Survival, Grant said, is what I'm good at. The Grand Admiral took another mouthful of his drink, let warm melancholy fill him, and watched the ceremony go on. Home one? The Empire was determined to give Grand Admiral Makati a hero send-off, and his funeral ceremony was easy to watch, 
even aboard a New Republic warship. Hiram Drayson had been watching the first half hour of the procession, wondering whether to open the bottom drawer of his desk when the buzzer at his door went off. Without checking to see who it was, he unlocked the door and let Borsk feel I inside. He immediately turned off the hollow broadcast and sat straight upright in his chair. Counselor, Drayson nodded. I'm glad to see you're in good health. What can I do for you? You can start by answering a few questions, Felia said. He stepped in front of Drayson's desk but didn't take the seat beside him. I had an aide to my diplomatic team on Eddie IV. I was wondering you could help me find him. Drayson's throat went dry. Somehow, the counselor knew. On instinct, he tried to deny it. I'm not sure if that's my purview. Shouldn't you be contacting Bothan Diplomatic Corps? Don't be coy with me, Admiral. He admitted to me that he worked for you. Drayson couldn't think of anything to say, so he said nothing at all. When he explained to me that he was on a critical mission, I let him go. I offered any help I could. As you should know, I have utmost respect for our intelligence agents. Felia planted his paws on the desktop and leaned closer. Everything looked different after Grand Admiral Makati laid siege to Eddie IV. I can't think of only one explanation to that chain of events, Admiral. Do you want to hear it? No, there wasn't a point in denial, not anymore. Your aide, Ryan Darlin, was part of a plan to kill Grand Admiral Makati. We planned to lure him to Bonadin with false claims you were meeting CSA officials there. How he learned you were on Eddie IV, I don't know. Felias first stood on end. I don't know which is more offensive, Admiral. That you used me as bait for your ploy, or that you screwed up and nearly got me killed. Drayson opened his mouth, but Felia snapped, Don't apologize, Admiral. I don't want to hear it. Tell me, who authorized this scheme? Admiral Akbar. Akbar knew nothing of it. Admiral Burke, Darylin, and I came up with it. The counselor looked honestly disappointed. He probably hoped to use this debacle to force his Mon Cal rival off the Provisional Council. When he spoke next, he was quiet but still harsh. You should know that I won't forget this, Admiral Drayson. I won't forget the kind of work you do. Did, Drayson corrected. Darylin and his entire team died on that mission. Feli is fur flattened. Truly. I wish it were otherwise. The Bothan's gaze went distant. Softer than before, he said, I see. Well, at least they got their man. So it seems. Drayson just wished knew how they'd done it, but he never would, just like he'd never know how that alien assassin had sneaked aboard Emancipator and killed Admiral Burke. Thoughtfully, Felia said, You know we Bothans honor our martyrs. The details of this operation will never be made public. You know that. For a second, it seemed like, Impossibly, Borsk Filia didn't know what to say. Then he whispered, I'll always remember what Darylin did, Admiral. And you? He looked at Drayson darkly for a moment, then turned away. He left without a word. Drayson stared at the closed door without feeling anything. Then he turned the holo back on and kept watching the funeral ceremony. People were still lined up to see Makati's coffin, and the commentators were talking about the memorial they were going to build for the murdered hero. He still didn't feel anything. Not ten minutes later, there was another knock on the door. Drayson checked the security cam this time, saw Admiral Akbar, and let him in. Greetings, the Mon Cal said as he took a seat in front of Drayson's desk. I wanted to speak with you in person now that you're back aboard. Drayson had already given the Admiral a full report on Burke's assassination via comlink, though there hadn't been much to tell. Thank you for coming to see me. I was just watching the procession. He touched the remote control and muted the audio from the broadcast, though it continued to play soundlessly. Akbar swung his bulbous eyes to watch it for a moment, then turned back to Drayson. He asked plainly, Admiral, did you have a hand in that? Drayson considered denying it. He'd known that technically Felia had had no power to punish him for his recent actions but as supreme commander of the entire armed forces, Akbar definitely could. He could and he should, because Drayson had gone behind his back, because they'd use Felia and Organa's bait.
because Drayson himself was the only one left alive that could be punished. Akbar would never trust him again if he knew. If he denied it, Akbar still wouldn't trust him. So he told the truth. He let all of it spill from his first hypothetical discussion with Daryl into his talk with Philia ten minutes ago. When it was all over, Akbar leaned back in his chair and folded his webbed hands in his lap. The first thing he said was, You should have told me. I thought you shoot it down, sir. Yes, I certainly would have. And if I had, then Willem Burke would still be alive, and so would Alpha Black. We might even be starting a new alliance with the corporate sector. Akbar paused, then added, and Makati would still be a threat. I'm not going to argue it was worth it, sir, said Drayson. But I won't say it wasn't either. In a contemplative tone, Akbar said, that is something we aren't able to judge now. Maybe we never will be able to judge. The question is what to do with the future. Drayson nodded wordlessly. He had a hard time meeting the Admiral's eyes. Alpha Black is over. General Kraken just reported that Grand Admiral Grant has fled to the Pinchester alignment. Per our treaty with Kane, the last Grand Admiral is beyond our justice now. Drayson stared at his desk. It felt like such an anticlimax. He didn't know what to say. We still have much work to do, Akbar continued. Without Makati, Grant, or that superstar destroyer, Isert is more weakened than ever. We must act fast to take advantage of that. And we'll need capable intelligence officers. Admiral, I apologize, Drayson blurted. For all of this, Akbar nodded. I know, Hiram. We'll need your services in the days ahead. I want you to promise me something. Yes, Admiral. No matter what scheme you think up, no matter what plan you have, you need to trust me. And you need to keep me informed. Do you understand? It almost sounded like forgiveness. Drayson nodded. I do, sir. I understand. Then we'll speak again. I have another wayward soldier to speak with. Good day. Akbar rose and left the room. Drayson waited, then reached for the controls to turn on the holo projector sound. He froze, then pulled his hand back. He reached into the bottom drawer of his desk and pulled out on glass and a single bottle of Atrevis Ale. The booze had come from Jack Carr, the glass from Cask Freller. Rhea and Darylin had sliced into Drayson's office and left it in his desk shortly before leaving for Eddie IV. It had been a gift and a promise to return. Drayson stared at the hollow broadcast. The camera was zooming in on Makati's open coffin as he lay in state, his beautiful white uniform hiding all signs of violent death. Drayson poured a mouthful of amber liquid into his glass. He thought of Darylin, Cask, Carr, Sheer, Ekrahim, Tor. He raised his cup and toasted the empty air, the silent room. Here's to you, gents, he said quietly, then drank. It was Wedge's third debriefing since flying back to home one. The first had been with some of Kraken's agents, then Kraken himself. That was when he'd been informed that Tycho Selchu had been captured during his spy mission to Coruscant. He'd already been so hollowed by his other losses that he'd barely felt a thing. This last talk was in Akbar's office. The Admiral had explained everything that had happened to the rogue squadron he'd left behind, including Evan and Felis both crash landing and getting retrieved during the battle. Flight Officer Ardle parachuted safely and is in good physical condition, Akbar was saying. Avin Barus is a trickier matter. The doctors on Emancipator had to amputate his leg. Wedge winced, but Akbar went on. He'll be fitted with the prosthetic, but we can't say for certain that his reflexes will be as good as they initially were. He'll have to undergo months of therapy before we know for sure. There are also political implications in this. What did his aunt say? She raised private concerns to me. Hers and those of the boy's father. They were never comfortable with the idea of young Barus flying combat missions. She also questioned the wisdom of letting two combat pilots in the same unit form romantic attachments. Which had had the same doubts when it had first become clear that Avon and Felis were involved but there was no regulation against intra-squad romantic pairings. Furthermore, he'd been happy for them and hadn't wanted to spoil it. Looking back now, it seemed like another failure. 
Evan was a good pilot, which said, but he was never, well, he was never a natural. Never one of your best. Wedge nodded. He didn't want to sound cruel. Akbar sighed and said, Commander Antilles, it should note it that, without Selchu, Barus, or Fell, Rue's squadron is down to half a full roster. If it's going to fly again, it's going to need substantial rebuilding. Wedge heard the stress on that if. He was ready. Then, when Akbar said, I've made the decision to disband Rue's squadron. Rest assured, your pilots will land on their feet. I know Lieutenants Jansen and Clivian already have outstanding offers to lead training units. Wedge blinked. Jansen and Hobby hadn't mentioned anything of the kind. But then, they wouldn't have. Admiral, sir, I'm glad you're taking care of my people. But I have to ask, what about me? Akbar considered him with those large, unreadable eyes. I'm not certain yet, Commander but someone is going to have to rebuild Rogue Squadron one day. Since General Skywalker has already resigned his commission, that leaves you as the most senior Rogue left. Wes stared, dumbfounded. Sir, our conversation, when you asked me to let Tycho fly. I meant what I said. Exactly? I chose my family over the Republic. Sir, I don't deserve my uniform. Akbar took a deep, deep breath. The events at Oran 3, are going to remain highly classified. Kraken is still investigating things you reported, including Leonia Tavria's return. He's also trying to find out what happened to Captain Selchuk. But for now, the actions you took there must also be kept secret. I know that, sir, but I'm a deserter. I know. And I'd be lying if I said it didn't shake my trust in you. Wedge lowered his head. The Admiral went on. That is why, for the foreseeable future, We'll be working closely together. You'll be serving me in a role of strategic advisory while we lay down a battle plan for an invasion of the Corps. But, sir, after what we lost at Eddie IV, Isert had lost more, including her best ship and her best commanders. This war doesn't wait for us to sort out our personal problems. Wedge knew that all too well. He thought over his new assignment and said, It sounds like you're trying to keep me away from a cockpit. Akbar didn't deny it. Until I know I can trust you again, yes. Until then, you stay by my side. It was better than he deserved. Thank you, sir. And when I do decide to trust you again, we will rebuild Rogue Squadron. Together. That one echoed in Wedge's thoughts after he left Akbar's office and walked down to Home One's main hangar bay. He found what was left of Rouge Squadron down there, docked against the far wall. It was down to five X-Wings now, and it would soon be none. Now that he'd been pulled off active flight duty, he wondered what would happen to his personal X-Wing, the one with Death Star Kill Marker. It was something he'd never had to wonder about before. After that he wandered to the squadron's locker room. When he stepped inside he was surprised to find Winter sitting on the bench in front of the open door to Tycho's locker. Leia stood over her shoulder. Both looked up to meet him and he froze in place. He felt ashamed to be seen by either of them. Leia, though, went right to him and put her arms around his shoulders. Hello, Wedge, she said. It's so good to see you. Leia, I'm so sorry. He breathed against her shoulder. Sorry for what? She pulled back to look at him. At Eddie IV, I left. I chased Fell, and he stopped, shook his head. Leia stared at him quizzically. He realized that she hadn't heard a thing. You know that Fell is gone, don't you? She nodded grimly. I heard Iser got him. I think so. What happened? Well, it's a long story. And very classified. I understand, Wedge. She couldn't. She had no idea what he'd been through on Oron 3, what he'd recovered for a few brief minutes and lost all over again. He put both hands on her shoulders and said, Leia, I had to make a choice. The kind of choice we talked about earlier, do you remember? Her eyes went soft, her voice quiet. I do. I made my choice. And it didn't matter. He laughed, dry and bitter. None of it mattered. They're all gone. She cupped his hand with a soft palm and looked into his eyes. Understanding passed without words. She nodded slowly, sadly. They stepped apart. 
Finally, Wedge forced himself to look at Winter. He saw that she had Tycho's dress uniform folded on her lap. In her hand, she held a battered crest with the Empire's circular logo on it. Wedge recognized it as the badge they handed out to pilots after graduating the Imperial Flight Academy. He wanted to remember, said Winter, and Wedge knew she forgot nothing. Not Aldrin, not Tycho, not him. Just like he still remembered Nyestra and his family, it was important to him, remembering. Kraken's doing everything he can to find Tycho, Wedge said weakly. But he probably told her that himself. She looked up at Wedge and their eyes met, both immediately looked away. Wedge wouldn't blame her if she held him responsible for what happened to Tycho. He never know for sure if she did. If he asked, she'd deny it, and if she said no, he wouldn't believe her. He didn't believe it himself. He wondered if they'd ever be able to look each other in the eye again. He remembered, she said as she looked back at the old academy crest. Everything he'd done, good and bad. Everything he'd lost. All the mistakes he'd made. Every time he felt empty and alone inside. He never wanted to forget any of that. The room dropped into grim silence. Softly, Leia asked, why? Because something always comes next. Something always changes. You remember, and you keep moving. That's what Tycho did. It's what we all do, whether you want to or not. Remember? And keep moving. We don't know if he's, Wedge began, but couldn't say the last word. For a moment he was struck dizzy by everything that had happened to him. How close he'd come to gaining what he'd never dared hope for, only to lose more than he could ever imagine. Finally, he croaked, we don't know what happened to him. Winter picked up Tycho's uniform, held it to her face, and breathed deep. Her eyes were low and her voice muffled as she said once more, it's what we all do. Remember? And keep moving. Karuskit. When his captors let go of him, Tycho Selchu was dropped hard onto the tile floor. He broke his fall with his palms but couldn't lift his head. Pain shot up through his kneecaps, but it gave him the focus he needed to break through the numb, drug-induced haze he'd been trapped in since his capture. His eyes focused ahead of him. He saw the edges of two scarlet robes. Then, in front of them, a pair of polished black calf-high boot, topped by scarlet trousers. It couldn't be her. It couldn't be anyone else. With effort. He raised his head and looked up at the scowling face of Issa Isert. As her red and blue glare held his, she asked, Do you feel lucky to be alive? Tycho opened his mouth but no sounds came. He tried to force words through but they came out as a hacking cough. Hands caught his shoulders and pulled him back so he knelt upright before Isert. Do you? She asked again. Not particularly, words felt like knives in his throat. As well as shouldn't. Do you have idea what has happened to your rebel alliance since you've been away? He shook his head. We traced two of your rebel leaders, Borsk Filia and Leia Organa, to a secret meeting with corporate sector officials on Eddy IV. Tycho's heart sank as she continued. Grand Admirals Makati and Grant trapped them there. Your rebel fleet put up a fight, so Grant was forced to open fire on the planet's surface using the full power of our new superstar destroyer Vengeance. After that, the rest of the fleet was annihilated as well. Needless to say, there were no survivors. Her words meant the death of everything he cared about, of Wedge and Hobby and Jansen of the Rouges of Leia and Winter of the New Republic itself. It was awful beyond words. But when he looked up at Isert, she was still scowling. Liar, he said. Her scowl deepened. Excuse me? You're wrong. You're lying. You're trying to trick me. And how do you know that? Because, he tried to smile. Lies are all you do. Her foot snapped up before he could react. Instead of catching him in the face or the chin, her boot tips stabbed into his right shoulder. He cried out, but the unseen guards behind him grabbed his back and kept him from falling. As he went so hard it brought tears to his eyes, Iser continued, What, pray, do you think really happened? Please, I'm curious. Well, he panted, you seem pretty mad. So I'm guessing, we killed a Grand Admiral. Pull him up, Isert ordered, and Tycho's captors hoisted him upright. His legs were still too wobbly to stand so he dangled between them, 
helpless as Isert took a step closer. Well, Tycho asked, struggling to meet her eyes. Who was it? Did we get Makati? She reached out and squeezed his chin between the fingers of her black gloved hand. She squeezed so hard it hurt but Tycho managed to say, we did it, didn't we? We really, I fought him. Makati was not beaten, she said. He was murdered by rebel assassins. The news almost made him giddy. Good enough for me? She released his chin, formed her hand into a fist, and punched him in the stomach. Tycho sagged in his captor's arms and gasped for breath. Do not be too happy with your victory, Isard warned. You should know that the two rebel spies you met with, Maria and Shone, have been captured by my agents. Suddenly Tycho didn't feel giddy at all. He sagged lower and prayed a silent prayer that somehow, one of their packets of information had gotten back to General Kraken, for the sake of the war effort, for the sake of his best friend. I've taken them to a special facility of mine, Isard went on. It's where I put my special cases. They'll soon be joined by a very important person. The Prex I should say former, Prex of the Corporate Sector Authority. I'm eager to see what secrets the rebels told him before his capture. Tycho said nothing. He'd been wondering how long poor Maria and Shone would last in Iser's dungeons. The bit about the Prex he wasn't sure what to make of it. More mind games, probably. Or maybe she really had captured the officials Leia and Winter had gone to meet, and that might mean. Tycho couldn't let himself think it. He had to assume everything Iser said was a lie. He had to trust that the war was still going on, that Wedge and Winter and everyone he cared about were safe. It was the only way he'd die a sane man. Iser grabbed him by the hair, he yelped as she tugged his head upright. She looked down at him with that same scowl and said, you will be joining them too, Commander Selchu. Yes, I think you will make a very fine addition to my Lusankaya. The name meant nothing to him. Everything she said rattled in his drug-addled brain, and one thing stood out, not because she'd said it, but because she hadn't. Through bare teeth, Tycho wheezed, Baron fell, you lost him, didn't you? She punched him hard, pain tore across his right cheek. She brought up a knee, right into his diaphragm. As he sputtered and tried to breathe, she hit him a third time, right in the jaw. Teeth split open his lower lip and blood rolled down his chin. He tried to focus his eyes even as his head felt like it was going to split apart. Take him to Lusankaya, he heard Iser declare. He felt his captors pull him away, felt the floor move beneath his feet. The pain threatened to overwhelm him, but he clung to the pain, held it to his heart. Payne told him that Fell had escaped, that Makati was dead, that Winter and Leia and Wedge and everyone else was safe. As they dragged Tycho into the dark, Payne was the only hope he had. At Monitor. After their escape from Oron 3, it was a long way home. First, their shuttle rendezvoused with the Interdictor Cruiser Corvus, which had already packed itself full with refugees from the destroyer Grey Wolf. Next, they swung around the outer rim to an obscure, polluted planet Suntir Fell had never heard of. The Nori commandos who'd been accompanying Thrawn left there, and though Fell wasn't privy to their levitating, he had the sense it was to be temporary rather than permanent. After that, they began the long journey to the unknown regions. Fell had a lot of time to talk with his wife, with the stormtroopers who'd rescued him, and with the men and women, human and aliens who have been working together to crew Corvus and Grey Wolf. By the time they rendezvoused with the Star Destroyer and Monitor, Fell had a good idea how of his conversation with Thrawn was going to go. He was taken to the Grand Admiral's personal chamber on the Destroyer. The aliens sat in a dark room, lit only by the glowing pinpoints of starlight on a map. Fell couldn't recognize the star systems from their pattern, and knew it had to be somewhere in their destination in what he'd always called the unknown regions. Thrawn began by saying, I want you to know that I allow few people in these chambers. Captain Park, whom you've just met, is one. So was Dagon Nerys. He'd heard that name already. The captain of Grey Wolf. Nerys was a loyal soldier of the Empire. On his first mission under my command, he almost attempted mutiny. Despite his words, his voice sounded wistful. Faintly nostalgic. 
Naturally, his opinions evolved in time. Others, such as Derek Larone and his men, were more like you. They'd already fallen out with the Empire as they knew it and were searching for something else to serve. I see, Fell said, then added, I appreciate your trust. I'm not sure what I've done to earn it. Frankly, Admiral, I'm not sure what I've done to deserve any of this. What your men sacrificed to rescue me and me wife. He closed his eyes and saw the face of Derek Larone as he stood resolute in the landing lights of the troop transport on Oron 3. He could only take it for a second, then opened them again. Admiral, I'm in your debt. I don't want to be in your debt. Do you now the kind of war I've been fighting in the uncharted corners of the galaxy? I've heard, sir. Then you know what kind of a battle is ahead of you. You should want to fight that battle. He allowed himself to imagine his future, flying again, leading fighter wings again, engaging in ugly battles against hideous alien warlords to save alien populations he'd never heard of. He could imagine chaos upon chaos, battle after battle, without interludes of peace. But his wife was by his side, finally, and soon he would have a child. Somehow, that made all the difference. Fell examined his thoughts and chose his words carefully. I think, what I've believed in, what I've wanted to fight for, that's never changed. I'm a soldier, and I've always been willing to fight for a cause. That's never changed either. I've just needed two things. Thrawn raised an eyebrow, expectant. I need Saul by my side. And I need a cause I can really believe in. A cause that doesn't use soldiers like me as pawns and throw them away. You will get that in my service, Baron Fell. I promise. I want to believe you, sir. Then believe. See, listen, and judge for yourself. He'd already seen a man he barely knew throw himself in front of a blaster shot to save his life. He'd heard stories from Grey Wolf's surviving crew about brave Captain Nerys. No one had made them give their lives for the cause. They'd chosen to. That said everything. Fell asked, shouldn't we be going, sir? Thrawn nodded and rose from his chair, and together they walked out of the chamber. The remembrance ceremony on a monitor's broad forward observation deck was crammed with people, many human, some blue-skinned aliens like Thrawn or green-skinned ones like Vonter, plus other races from planets Fell had never heard of. He followed Thrawn to the front of the chamber where Sial stood waiting alongside Brightwater, Markross, Quiller, and Grave. She wore a blue robe that matches her eyes. Her face was clean and her shortcut hair was back to its natural gold. He took her hand as they stood for the ceremony. It was briefer than he'd been expecting. Thrawn was apparently not one for speeches, and he stood to the side to let Captain Park make his own statement. Park spoke of the courage of men who lived their lives in wartime and the value of sacrifice. It was the kind of speech Fell had heard in years serving the Empire, and later the Republic, but somehow it felt different this time. When Park's short words were done, 47 cargo containers were jettisoned toward the nameless sun shining past the viewport. Fell knew many more had died aboard Grey Wolf whose bodies they'd been unable to recover. He also knew that somewhere, hopefully in the front row, was the body of Derek Larone. From Sile's other side he heard Brightwater whisper, very softly, clear sailing, boss. When the ceremony was done, beings began to file out. Park stepped up to Fell and shook his hand, then did the same for Sial and the others. Thrawn remained where he was, back to the viewport, watching everyone else leave. His glowing eyes, alien and unreadable, met Fell's. His hand inclined in a slight nod, and Fell nodded back. Then Sial took his arm and turned him away. Hey, Baron, said Brywater. We were going to do something special, something private for Larone. I see. Fell had never gotten the impression that the four men blamed him for their leader's death, but he still felt uncomfortable around them. Sial squeezed his arm and said, I think we should go, Suntir. Listen to your woman, Baron, said Quiller. She knows the score. Fell shot his wife a question and look, she returned with a tiny smile, one of the few he'd seen from since Oron 3. They talked about finding some way to let Wedge know that they were both alright and not in Icer's clutches, 
But they also knew Thrawn's people would never allow contact with Republic forces, no matter how limited. They'd already sailed past charted space and the galaxy they'd known. Sayal showed regret about Wedge, but not about this new situation she'd ended up in. She lost her old life completely when Fel had defected. Everything they had together now was a miracle, and they both knew it. They were led to a small, simple ready room. Grave reached up to the top shelf of a cupboard and brought down six glasses, while Brightwater went into another bin and pulled out a bottle of some blue ale. I don't suppose that's from a planet I've heard of, fell deadpan. Probably not, agreed Brightwater as he poured out the glasses. You should probably stick with five cups, Mark Ross said, and nodded at Sayal. She cupped her stomach and said, I can manage one sip. A small one, for Lerone. He liked that. This was his favorite, said Mark Ross. They stood around the table, and he lifted his glass for a toast. The other troopers did too, and then Sayal. Fell felt his self-consciousness dissolve as he picked up his own and raised it to match theirs. For a second, nobody spoke. Glasses passed around the table, and Fell realized nobody knew what to say. He barely met Lerone. Even Sayal had known him better. Still, words came to him, and he raised his cup a little higher. I'm standing here today because of other people's sacrifices, people who didn't even know me and were just doing their duty. I can't say how humbling that is. I want to respect them. I need to respect them. He hesitated, but when Sayal squeezed his free hand, he found more words. I want to make a toast to Derek Lerone, Dagon Neris, and many more I'll never hear of. To all the good soldiers. They echoed his last words, even Sayal. They tipped up their glasses and drank. It was like nothing Fell had ever tasted before and whatever his expression was, it made Sayal burst out laughing. She sagged against him as the others all started talking, and soon they were telling jokes and stories from all the missions they'd done together, but Fell barely heard them. He put an arm across Sayal's shoulder, rested his head against hers, and closed his eyes. He felt the warmth of his wife, the warmth of whatever he'd just drunk, the warmth of this boisterous room. And beyond that, he knew, was cold space, and all those scattered stars, and a lifetime of battles upon battles waiting to be fought. But not today, he whispered to his wife, without prelude or explanation. But as always, Sayal understood. She reached up to stroke his face, and whispered in his ear, no, not today.